noche.
Tony second. Sixty plus. That's what they say. Play will resume in 30 seconds. Play will resume in 15 seconds. One game all, Thompson to serve, love all. Not up, hand out, one love. And out, one, two. Down, two all. Stupid. That was stupidly good. Hand out, three, two. Hand out, three all. Hand out, four, three. And out, four all. Five, four. They were moving kind of lethargically for 60 year olds. Six four, right box, please. Seven four. Hand out. Five seven. Mm, yes, let. Mm. Down. Six, seven. And out. Eight, six. Nine, six. Ten. 
10-6, game ball, right side. Hand out. 7-10, game ball. Eleven seven game to Thompson. Thompson leads two games to one. Play will resume in 30 seconds. Play will resume in 15 seconds. Time. Thompson leads two games to one. Love all. One love. Two love. Three love, left side. Hand out. One, three. Down. Hand out. Four, one. Five one. Hand out. Two five. Three five. Down, hand out, six, three. Hand out, four, six. Five, six. Six all. Out. Hand out, seven six.
eight six. Down, nine six. Down, hand out, seven nine. Down. Right side. 10 7, match ball. Down. 11 7, game to Thompson. Thompson wins three games to one. Thank you, gentlemen. 11 7, 6 11, 7 11, 7 11.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2019 US Masters Championships. I'm Chanel Rasmus, and with me in the booth, Richard Nolman. Chanel, great to be here. Richard, we have an exciting day of squash. It's day one for this Masters Championships. It's day three for the pro event. What can we expect to see today? Well, I think what we'll see today is a selection of the great long-term squash players of this amazing country. Um, you can see uh, on the court, when we go to the court, one of the players is wearing the US Masters team uniform from last year's 2018 World Masters Championships. Uh, we had such enthusiasm and such a great turnout from our long-term players. Yeah, so yeah, you're two and a half minutes into people it. People who are storied in their own neighborhoods, and we get to see a little bit of them right now. Well, absolutely. We're going to tune into the match that's happening on glass court number one here. This event is taking place at Squash on Fire in Washington, D.C. And there we see in the Masters uniform, as you'd mentioned, Richard, it's Justin Berlin from New York. He's up against John Collar from Atlanta Squash. So lots of exciting stuff happening here. This is the men's 55 division here at Homestead at Squash on Fire. Richard, talk a little bit about these two players. You know John Collar quite well, so tell us a little bit about him. So John is one of those great local supporters of squash who has committed himself to supporting the game I would say in the region of a quarter of a century down in Atlanta. Um, he's been involved with Tom Rumpler and his wonderful program at the Midtown Athletic Club um, and he's also a keen doubles player these days playing with Ahmed Hamza at the Piedmont Driving Club. Uh, he's been injured a little bit um, and uh, maybe put on a little bit of weight, but I played with him uh, recently uh, in a uh, doubles tournament, and he's just a, a really great guy and one of those people that this country can't do without. So this is the men's 55 division. What are we seeing at this age group? So obviously, you know, once you get past 50, there aren't that many players. I mean, I think of Willie Hosey, perhaps in, in Canada, who is an exception to the rule, but there aren't that many players who are extremely mobile. And so what we tend to see is dominance uh, by getting in front of the opponent and then some shot making. The retrieving is not going to be as good as it is with the lower age groups. So it's really about sleight of hand and getting in front of your opponent. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to that as today's matches continue. Time. This is the men's 55 age group. We move on to the 65 after this match. Then it's men's 50 and following. We also have some of the women playing as well later on today. So after these matches conclude, we then move on to the pro event. And it's the semifinals of that event. Many players Colin, and sir. spectators waiting for that. 2019. To see who will be crowned the US, US national champion. National really exciting Masters. That all the top seeds we have John Collins to serve. So, Justin you know, Berlin to receive. Players really coming Best of five games, love all. Well, here we are. It's the men's 55 division. John Collins to serve. He's up against Justin Berlin. Love. Oh, that's nice use of height, Richard, as we saw the shot selection coming into play and then just that flick over the head. And I think it's interesting with players that are doubles players, they do develop really great hands. And so sometimes, although they haven't got the Two mobility, love. they can place the ball. Absolutely. I've certainly enjoyed getting more doubles experience and playing with few of the older players and they certainly teach you something very quickly you can't play singles on a doubles court down three love although it's interesting the uh, the doubles game <coughs> does lend itself to some singles tactics in that the lob is such an important shot mm -hmm. but we can see here that John already is beginning to put a couple of balls to the back of the court and then using his hands to catch Justin out of position. Down. 
Five love. So interesting there, uh, Justin on his backhand return. I uh, noticed his racket prep was up a little late and that didn't give him as many options. And a lot of these Masters players, Chanel, are as avid students of the game at this age as any child and are still trying to work Six on love. their technical development. So I'm sure Justin will have a look at this afterwards Six and start love, thinking on the right about side. ways in which he can improve. Absolutely. Well, we're seeing Kala take a quick six love lead, really by just countering and making use of the balls, landing short. Right, that shot has been so successful for him throughout this first game. Seven love. He's taking control of the middle of the court. How important that is, right, at this at this age group. Yeah, and he's you can see using his wrist to get extra loft on the ball to take just into yeah. the back of the court, and then his sneaky little round the wall boast at the front of the court is not getting much opposition. So Justin, love. better return of serve Left that box. time and got into a rally, but uh, again, John using his wrist to flick that cross court lob and Justin not volleying it and ending up with a dead ball. Ten love. So game, game ball, ball here. John Collar for an eleven love whitewash victory game there in the Collar, first Collar game. John Collar. One game to love. Well, you can absolutely see that John Collar was a former tennis player just by the way that he holds the racket. Right, it's all the fingers are closed together. I was trying to suss out exactly what it was that he was doing that looked just a little odd, um, but there's that that technique coming through. And something obviously that's very difficult to break going from tennis to squash. So, John uh, Collar manages to win that first game 11 love, a cracking start for that age group. John Collar is feeling a little bit more, probably more comfortable than Justin Berlin on this court at the moment. And I would like to see Berlin just making use of the back of the court, making use of height a little bit better than he has in that first game. Absolutely. I think if he can prep his racket earlier and volley to the back of the court, it would be better. Interesting your comment about, you know, the former tennis player. Of course, former tennis players do transfer very well into double squash. There's a lot of similarities in the way that we volley a doubles ball. And I'd encourage anybody that's been a player tennis player who's 30 seconds. in having a go at squash to get on that double score as soon as they can because they'll surprise More themselves. Sooner. Well, here we are, Kyle start Lee, of the second game. game love, love all. Hoping that Justin Berlin can just settle into this match a little better, but hasn't been given many opportunities by Collette. And it's all yeah. starting by that great serve. He really crushes that into the side out, one love. But there we see John's first error. Standing a little bit upright, and the uh, backhand top spin not quite paying off, taking it into the tin. Oh, a little Too taste love. of his own medicine there. <laughs> and as we said at the beginning, the person that gets the dominant position further up the court has a big advantage. Down, hand out. Just a little bit. One, two. Movement errors, right? Not quite getting Berlin not quite getting his feet behind the ball, so he's having to use a lot of wrist. Yeah. I want to see this early racket prep to see him volley. Mm -hmm. and he did volley, but it's to the middle of the court, and Mr. Collar's Too hands well. are pretty superb. Yeah, that's going to be Three, two. punished every time. That's what allowed Collar to win that first 11 love. I'd like to see Berlin just a little bit more height. It doesn't feel comfortable going straight, so just needs to put it higher. He's playing it right Four into two. the hands of Collar. It's interesting also, he's more interested in hitting the ball than he and is out. in getting into position. Three, four. If he could start pushing up the court a little bit more, some of those shots that Collar plays that might be retrievable. And out. Well, that's the most volley opportunity, right? <laughs> rack it up. Five, get your three. racket up. Racket preparation. You'll be able to take that ball early. Five, take three. time away from your opponent. And these players need to appreciate that the Chanel Erasmus <laughs> volley police. Oh, I'm is on here. it. <laughs> I'm on it. Yeah. On duty. 
Six, well, three. you learn so quickly, Richard, when you don't take the ball early, just how dangerous it can be. But then also once you've played against someone that does volley everything, you're like, oh, so this is what it's supposed to be like and the damage it can do. Well, that's excellent use of height. It's what we've needed him to do right from the get-go. So he's in this game at 4-6 if he can keep getting the deep ball and get in front of the volley. But volleying short too early not to be recommended. Seven, four. Down. Unforced error there, Eight, unfortunately. Four. Done the work of getting the ball back and had John under pressure, but into the tin. Got Mr. Collar at the back of the court again, so he's in charge. And out. Well, he's figured it out now, right? Five, he's found a little bit of that height on the front wall, getting it into the back corners. It's just can he remain consistent and do it more than once or twice? And of course, as we know from having watched these Short matches, players that haven't played on the glass before Six, eight. sometimes take a while to realize that the glass is a little more dead on the side wall and in the back corners and that lob really is a useful choice. And out. Well that too right and the lights as Nine, well are, six. are very bright so you, if you put it in up high you can sort of lose the ball in the light. Nice to see Justin Berlin when he's getting ready to return serve. He's activated. I'd maybe like to see his feet Just move a bit more. He tends to bounce up and down on his feet <laughs> instead okay? of moving his feet. But that's better than being static. 9-6, right box. Let ball called. And more effort to get forwards there by Justin Berlin. And that put him in a much better position out. to retrieve the collar burst. 7-9. Well, you can see Collar's frustration growing. He's now lost the point three times in the uh, right back corner. That's what he needs to do. Just and take out. it early, continue looking for the volley Ten, opportunity. Seven, game ball. And with that, now gets three game balls here in the second. Interesting that when Berlin was at the back of the court with a high ball on the side wall, he didn't volley. But Collar, the doubles player, doesn't even think twice about taking a volley off the side wall. So important to volley these balls. 11, oh, seven, excellent. Game collar, Straight. Collar leads, two games, two I was love. expecting him to go boast there, <laughs> Richard. He's done that a couple of times, but mixed it up with the straight <coughs> drive. So that now gives John Collett two game to love lead here in this men's 55 division round of 32. Player resume in 30 seconds or sooner. Here we are, Richard. Game three. John Collett currently leads two games to love. No what rate. can we expect to see now moving Power on? Power leads this two games game. to love. Love all. John has taken his tracksuit top off, which means to me that he means business now. Uh, I think he's going to try and really stay in front. And uh, no let. Justin, for his part, did a little better in the second One love. game by volleying and getting some high ball. Um, I think the weight of shot that John Collar has, uh, although he's, we've seen him using the lob, he also hits a powerful ball, and I think that might be a bit too, too much love. for Justin. It's very deceptive in the front of the court. Difficult to read where he's going to place the ball, and he now has Berlin on the back of his heels because he's played that boast into the front of the court a number of times. So now when he mixes it up, it's a surprise element. Love. We saw John very quick onto that volley boast, which is a shot he loves to play. 
slightly closed tennis racket face um, style. But it works so well on this glass court because, as we mentioned earlier, Richard, the ball gets sucked into the side walls and just dies. So very effective. Oh, that was a cracking shot. Well, nice to see Justin volleying. Uh, interesting, John's cross court didn't hit the side wall, and so it was an open volley for Justin, which he didn't seem to have a problem with. Down, hand out, 4-1. Again, Justin getting stuck behind. Five one. And uh, we've said so often the person that gets in front has the advantage. Absolutely, and just dominating the tee, right? You're you're right in the middle there. You have access to all four corners, and as and we out. saw there, he boxed and Berlin out. out because of a poor quality shot. So Two he five. really had the option I to play, had that whole right side wall, and Berlin had I to delay his to movement ten. just a little bit. Referee has called that ball down. from John Collar down. Did you think the ball's good? Discussion about it. Let's play a let. Thank you. Left side, 5 1. And I think they're playing a let. Out. The first time we've seen him try and Six go one. straight down the line of the return serves, the only problem with that is that you have to have your body in the right position. And there you saw his body was facing the front the front wall. Yeah, we're seeing some sort of pretty typical Masters interactions here. Um, Seven you know, one. Not enough movement off the ball, and but the other player is not quick enough to get into position. So instead of a stroke ensuing, sometimes the rally continues, even though it looks as though there was impeding. Eight one. Another great length from right. John Collar. Excellent right quality of shot. Well, 8-1, comfortable third game lead here for Collar. He's seemed in charge and comfortable on this court right from the get-go. You can see his mobility is hampered <coughs> when Gotta he has to stretch no and let. turn, but Justin Berlin no, hasn't no, no. been able to Sorry. move him enough. Nope. No you have to hit that, that ball, sir. Well, every time he's tried to Hand twist out, him, wait. it's landed in the middle, right? So that's difficult, difficult to do. Down. 3-8. Rather uncharacteristic from Collar. Yeah, I think seeking the shortest possible rally there. Down. Hand out. Nine, Once again, three. very good length. And... Uh, Justin Berlin just not able to play the ball back straight. And once again, John Collar using his hands to create a little boast movement Ten, in front of the court for Justin Berlin. Left side, and finishing it off ball. by making him run the full diagonal of the court. Not something that we masters like to do a lot, Chanel. <laughs> Well, match ball now for John Collett. Seven match balls. Let's see if he only needs one. Well, he's done it. Collett, John Collett's managed to win his first round match. Three love by playing really quality squash in the front of the court. He used the opportunities that were presented to him in the middle. And we saw in that second game, Berlin trying to use the height on the front wall, getting the ball into the back, but it just wasn't enough against his opponent. Commiserations to Justin Berlin. Um, great to see him wearing the US Masters team shirt and uh, hope we'll see a lot more US Masters in those team shirts as we go along. Well, absolutely, and don't go too far. We have a ton more matches coming your way with the next one starting off at 1.10. For US Squash to fulfill our mission of increasing access, advancing sportsmanship, and achieving excellence, we need a home. A place to reshape what access and participation means in this country. A place to train future world champions. A place to change lives by bringing the entire squash community together. The opportunity for U.S. squash to return to the city of its founding 115 years later has presented itself. And the Arlen Inspector U.S. Squash Center will be this place and will be our home. The largest squash facility in the nation, 
18 singles courts and two doubles courts, ideally located on Drexel University's campus in the heart of Philadelphia's University City, the 65,000 square foot Spectre Center will serve as the host site for dozens of major national and international competitions, showcasing the sport like never before. The high performance fitness and training spaces will allow our national coaches to offer world class year round programming and support to our athletes from across the country as we pursue our Olympic ambitions and drive towards achieving our Team USA goal to be the world's best. Spectre Center will offer unparalleled access to squash by modeling broad based community engagement. In partnering with Squash Smarts, Philadelphia's urban youth and education program, the Learning and Innovation Center will support kids in reaching their full potential academically, athletically, and in life, giving kids their best shot. The Spectre Center will also be home to the U.S. Squash Hall of Fame, a dynamic, state-of-the-art, interactive experience honoring our game's rich history and individual achievements that will inspire future champions. Special exhibits on sportsmanship and character, our national teams, women in squash, urban squash, and squash doubles will all amplify the squash community's inclusiveness, all rooted in tradition and shared values, ones that will be passed from player to player and from one generation to the next. We look forward to hosting you at the Arlen Specter U.S. Squash Center, where experiences, relationships, and values last a lifetime.
Well, hello and welcome to the 2019 US Masters Championships being hosted here at Squash on Fire in Washington, D.C. I'm Chanel Rasmus and with me, Richard Millman. Richard, we just saw the men's 55 age group compete there and John Collar seemed in full control of Justin Berlin. Now we have the men's 65 here on this court. Tell me a little bit about these two players, Richard. Well, David Lott, uh, that you see on the left-hand side of the court in the sort of greeny yellow shirt. He is a, a relatively recent uh, enthusiast of the game. I had the pleasure of chatting with him at the World Masters uh, at, in Charlottesville last summer, and he is really getting excited about learning how to play the game. Um, on the right-hand side in the silvery top there is Thur Serling, who's a professor out in Salt Lake City. Um, and he's been playing with my friend Bert Kernier, our United States World Masters champion from 2016 in South Africa, at the Squash Works Club uh, with the, the Bennett family. Um, John Bennett, sadly no longer with us, many, many people new John uh, he started this wonderful club and his son Craig Bennett has become a very good squash coach and now even his son the grandchild is uh, coaching so that's where these two come from and uh, to be honest I'm not sure what to expect here I suspect that Thur has perhaps got a little more experience uh, but I'm sure that David's a good athlete well, just to give everyone a little bit of contents, context for this weekend, it's a three-day tournament, and the first round happening today, a round of 32, so players that are on either ends of the draw can meet each other in this first round, and then they'll move on to either, if they lose, move into the consolation, if they win, continue on in the main draw. And we also have a professional national tournament running at the same time right it's it's the u.s women's championships and the sl green men's championships being played here where it's the 16 of the best really uh, players competing for that title so exciting stuff happening here at squash on fire which is a fantastic venue richard we have to just talk about how beautiful this club is terrific facility obviously we've got the all glass court here um and then the rest of the court, uh, uh, sorry, the rest of the club has a very fresh, open feel to it. Great bar, and uh, you know, people may laugh when I talk about a bar, but throughout the world of squash for the last <laughs> 50 years, the bar has been the no, heart and yes. soul of a squash club. And it's not just Absolutely. a place to take in alcohol, it's a place where, having tried to beat each other's brains out, <laughs> we sit and learn a little bit about each other and become friends. You know, squash, as I'm sure you have found over the years, both in South Africa, here in the States, is an opportunity at close quarters to find something out about somebody, and great friendships develop from that because you understand that you can trust somebody. Absolutely, and talking about that, I mean, it's one of uh, Squash on Fire is a pay-as-you-go, no membership model, and they have eight courts here and two of which are glass. So you have this one and then there's another one right across and it's a fully automated online booking system on court lighting control linked to the booking and then has a full service restaurant and bar as we mentioned which is just integrating that social aspect of the game as well which I even growing up in South Africa as, as a younger kid even though obviously drinking age you're not allowed to drink but it's still a social atmosphere that you're involved in and and there are not enough clubs that that integrate those two aspects of the game so i love the model that they have here at squash on fire and it seems to be working really well here in washington you're very right chanel and i think you know perhaps the united states historically associated alcohol with um, non-sporting activities but squash is more than just a sport, it's a community activity. And a big part of squash for us is banter. And I can tell you that my wife and I have been running squash clubs for a long, long time. And banter is one of the things that regular squash players at any facility really look forward to. Because when they come from the working day, having maybe had a, a tough day, into an environment where they're loved and teased, they know that they're home and that they can let go. 
Well, here we are talking about sort of the camaraderie about the sport. This is the men's 65 division. These two players competing against each other. We're going to see some great competition and camaraderie between these two players. As we mentioned, it's David Lott in the yellowy green shirt. I believe that's a MacArthur Squash shirt, if I'm not mistaken. MacArthur Squash Center is in Charlottesville, Virginia, home to the UVA squash team and, of course, Boar's Head Sports Club. And then it's Thur Serling in the gray shirt. So these two players getting their match started. It's the men's 65 division. Well, it seems like we have a little bit of an extended warm-up happening here. Richard, talk a little bit about what we see when we start moving up into the 65 age group. Athleticism certainly is at a premium. Especially but what you tend to get is a competition between a few athletic guys and a lot of folks who have got very good hands and maybe they've got some little idiosyncratic, tricky deception or shot that they have had success with. And so we'll see uh, a, a style of squash very different to the pros. Uh, maybe going to the front of the court more often because quite frankly, these guys can't cover the front of the court. Mm -hmm. So that's a sensible option. So tactically, -E a shot that might be a bad choice with a younger age group often becomes a very good choice here. Well, you have to rely on your hands, right? If you, your mob mobility is limited, you might as well make sure that your hand skills are top notch. And we saw a glimpse of that in the previous match that we, we watched earlier with John Collar making really good use of that trickle boast into the front of the core and the double skills, right? A lot of these players are playing doubles and using that deception and that shot making that you need in doubles and translating it onto a singles court. Yeah, uh, again, I think if you have the good Where fortune to have up? a doubles court at your club, who's serving? it's definitely a game that everybody in the older who, age who is gonna serve? should try out. Who's and serving? I think they'll get benefit okay. by playing Are you ready to, start? to their singles games, okay. especially in the you know, 60, 65 <clears> and above program. Hold on, hold on. Program. 2019. Well, we're ready to get started US here National on Masters. this class court. We have David Lott to serve. It's who David Lott to receive. Who's Best of five games, love all. Serving and Serling to receive. Hand out. So immediately we see a little crafty drop volley from first Sterling. And uh, perhaps David Lott had hit the serve faster than his ability to recover. Hand out, one all. But immediately <laughs> <laughs> returned in like for like. Sort of anything you can do, I can do better, right? Exactly Match so. you one way or the other. For both of these players, you know, being that they are not <coughs> spring chickens, are, and I out, can tell one. you, learning squash players. They're not players that have uh, had a history of being on the pro tour or top of the game. And they're as enthusiastic today about developing well, their games as, as out, any 15, 16 year old child would be. Down. Well, just Three, there is a little bit of that technical floor coming down onto the ball instead of following through. Playing with a closed racket face. And out. Oh, works that time. Three all. Deft, deft <laughs> hands, very nice deft hands. You know, there is a tendency, I think, with these players that have less mobility to use single shot mentality Four, three, instead no of rally mentality. And there's I a balance a little bit to far be away had from there. The ball. If you try and do the single shots too much, you're prone to being caught out of position. If you try and rally too much, you know, to a certain extent, you're leaving yourself open to the player that can play the and single out. shot. Mm -hmm. For all. Well, a little bit more fluid movement from Serling, I have to say. He's getting out. into the Thank position, you. just not quite executing the Five, shot. Four. So you I think... His racket preparation, sorry, Chanel, is very yeah. late there. Absolutely. And therefore, he had to push it off his body, Down. and that's why he pushed it out of the court. Six, four. Well, both players just trying to 
a little bit more comfortable on this court as well. We've mentioned it's difficult to play on an all-glass court when you're not used to it, but then also taking Seven, full advantage four. of it exactly like that. So we've seen, Chanel, the trickle boast and the short boast being played to great advantage. And I think as you get older, these attacking boasts are very, very important to the older yeah, age now. group. 5-7. we'll see later on this evening in some of the men's pros matches that the working boast is sometimes Down. Oh, he was there. Used. Six, seven. And often sets up the opponent for an attack, whereas with these guys, frequently the boast Six, is the winning seven. kill. Oh, great pickup. Ooh. Great pickup from both players. Seven all. Good call cool coverage. And Sterling just getting out on top. Eight, Boasting both seven, players tend side. to hit first and move second. I'd like to see them moving simultaneously with their shots so that they don't create gaps between themselves and the ball that the opponent can take advantage of. Not up. Thank you. See, Lott yeah, playing the boast all. there, and Serling didn't get it, but if he had have got it, Lott was still buried in the back of the court. Down. Oh, yeah, just Nine getting eight, too late side. to the ball and then toppling over, right? So you're forcing the ball to go along with you as you're falling into the shot. Down. Hand out. Nine all. So very tight in this first game. Nobody's really found the formula. Oh, that's great. Oh, just missing sight of the ball. Looked like it was going right back to Lot. Almost a and stroke. Out, ten, nine, game I think ball. it would have been a stroke, actually, if he'd called it. If his racket prep had been Yeah. Up. Wow, 11 9, game to lot. Flat leads, one game to lot. the height on the front wall. Beautifully landed in the backcourt. And just eliminating errors a lot is what resulted in him winning that first game 11 9. I thought he made a few unforced errors, played it just that going short, possibly too soon, but at the right time because his opponent was far behind him. And I think we're so used to commentating and saying, don't go short too soon. And here it's so beneficial. Right, you know, it is, it is interesting. Um, and actually, we see that contrast a little bit between the top women and the top men. Because of the relative differences in mobility with the top women and the top men, where the top women are very successfully using the attacking boast and getting results, the top men hitting the same shot at the same moment get punished. And that's simply because the top men are onto that ball maybe a yard or two earlier. Mm -hmm. So these differences between either age groups or to a certain extent the genders um, are very interesting contrasts. And so you have to learn to play the relevant type of squash for the game that you're involved in. Well, I think we're going to see a different approach from Sole. When I was watching them warm up, Richard, my immediate reaction was going to say that Sherling was going to win this three love. I just thought that he looked a little bit more comfortable than his opponent did. But how wrong was I to judge a book by its cover? Well, you weren't very wrong. 11-9 was not very wrong. But as we said at the beginning, both of these chaps, be they 66, 67, leads, one game they're to both love. enthusiastic love students all. of the game. I know that Thur will be working with Craig Bennett, who's a superb squash coach, and I know David Lott is really trying to find out about the game. So there's all kinds of new developments going on with these old players. Down. Oh, and playing out. right one into love. his hands, had the opportunity, full use of the court. And that's what we said earlier. I thought Lot made less unforced errors and just first point. And out, one all. See there, Thur Serling mm -hmm. serving and moving a meter and a half, two meters back from Behind the short the, line, yep, yep. Uh, which just opens him up 
to that drop shot, but of course, people tend to move to where they expect the ball to go, not where it actually Thank you. goes. And Two the one. statistics are most people play deep on the return of serve. If you only cover the deep ball, though, you can't cover the short ball. Let's see where David Locke goes when he hits his serve. Does he stay up on the short line or does he go back? Yeah, and, and he out. went back and look at the result. Two all. Now, if both of them served and moved up in front of the short line, they'd start encouraging the opponent to and play out. along, which would be Three to their two. advantage. Well, I would like to see Sterling just take his time a little bit before he serves. He sort of st steps right into it, doesn't look at where his opponent is is situated, and he, just needs to, he needs to put it into the into the side wall a little bit better. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Chanel. And what you're talking about, of course, is developing a first-class ritual, which is what we try and teach the kids to do. A ritual that you repeat every single time and gets you into a very good and rhythm. Out. Well, that's smart Three, play. Four by Sterling, great <laughs> use of height, just getting it over the head of Lott. They've been going back and forth into the front of the court. We haven't quite seen them utilize the back and Sterling came out on top there. See, at this age group, both players and all players Four actually all. Uh, struggle with change of direction. Mm -hmm. So they tend to use the cross courts more because they feel they can twist people. And out. Ooh, great Five, shot, sort of leaning back. It slots it right in the neck. But again, David Locke, out. when he served, ball. took two yards position behind the short line, couldn't possibly get to the short ball. And the frequency with which both these players play short, it would be advisable for them when they're serving to get up the court and at least encourage the opponent to play along. Six five, left side. Beautiful little tap to the front right corner. You know, playing that on the back of a really very nice lob serve. Well, he's definitely improved the quality of Seven serve. That's five. the first, and we often underestimate the importance of a serve. It's, it's the first shot. It starts off the rally. It has to be played well. There's, you know, it's interesting talking to the pros when you ask them about the importance of accurate serving. And out. They are less inclined Six, to go for very precise serves because they feel it's a big risk. Whereas at this age group, not only is it not and so much of a risk, it's and actually out. a premium. Eight, six. Well, again, a very close second game. Sterling with a two-point lead. The ball just not landing Nine, six. into the side wall. I think he was lucky that Lot didn't take more advantage of that. We'll notice that Lot sometimes hits his shot and stays where he is for quite a time after he's hit it. What I'd like to see them both do is move up into position with okay, their thank shot, you. not after their and shot. Out. Oh, that's Seven, great nine. sportsmanship. So then just calling that on himself. I think he double hit the ball. Right. Didn't quite see what happened there, but I always speak about that camaraderie, right? Eight, Excellent. nine. Also noticeable, Chanel, that uh, neither of them gets particularly upset when they get wrong-footed. Mm -hmm. They accept at this point in time that change of direction is not their strength. Oh. And out. 10-8, nice game ball. Volley there. Well, game ball now for Thur Serling. Looking to tie it up. Not up. Beautiful and hands out. by David Lott, but you Nine, can see ten. again. Game ball. He stands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if so Thur Serling had got anything back at all, he would have won the point. See where he moves on his serve. Is he going to move back? Yes, he's moved back, and the ball went 11 forwards, nine. So unfortunately, those game two don't to go Sterling. together well. <coughs> well, Thor Sterling, excellent work in the second game, just becoming a little bit more accurate, eliminating those unforced errors. And we saw him make use of the change in direction, also height on the front wall. So the combination now of fewer unforced errors, 
and finding height on the front wall is a winning combination okay. for him and he wins that level nine in the second so not much between these two players Richard no good competition uh, both developing their understanding of the game we just want to see both of them a little further up the court with their positioning Time. Door. One game all. Sherling to serve. Love all. Okay, Richard, we've now seen two games. I have to ask, what's your prediction? My prediction is that Thur will win in the fifth. Ooh. One love. Okay. <laughs> and the reason I say that is that I think it's going to be cut and thrust at back and forwards. If he doesn't win in the fifth, I think he'll win in the fourth. But I still hold out some thought that David's going to find his shot making and catch you love. her out. Well, we're certainly seeing examples of that. The first two points, it's been very accurate in the front of the court. And I think... Overall, David's movement is not as good as Thurs. Three love. Mm -hmm. um, not, not the ability to move, but the movement technique. He doesn't move up when he hits the ball, and so he creates gaps between himself so it's, uh, and the ball. Uh, it's something he could definitely improve, I think. Great yeah. reach from Serling. Four love. Leaped across to try and volley that. No need for me to send out the volley police in this match, Richard. Full love, quick lead now for Sterling. He's taking the ball early, making and exposing the movement of Lot. Five love. Well, there's that twist and turn. He's finding the corners. He's finding those angles that he needs to use. It's funny that the older guys don't need to be encouraged to volley. They volley because they understand how much less work they're going to have to do physically. <laughs> we need to teach some of the younger guys uh, to feel old. Excellent Six change of direction by Sterling. Just crushes right it down the line. Six love lead now. He doesn't want to let your prediction down. <laughs> well, David Lott looking just a little fatigued here, so a bit concerned that he might be struggling physically. Seven love. I also, though, think that Sterling's first shot, which is the serve, has improved, right? And that's what caused him a lot of trouble because yeah, Lot has incredible hands in the front of the court. One as we see there, one weak serve, and the ball gets crushed into the front. Improve the quality, and you eliminate more than half of his game. A little change in style of serve there from David Lot. Hit the hammer serve. Two seven, hard, left side. And uh, got a loose ball from as a result so nice little tactical change up and the same result oh, on the second serve shot. the hard Three, seven. serve getting a loose ball that he was able to capitalize on let's see if Serling can come up with a different return if he continues this hard hammer serve And out. Just out of the reach of David Lott. And Thur Serling just managing to get enough depth on that ball on the return and to out. make it more difficult Four, for David Lott.
Hand out. Well, body Nine, shot, four. but just that just shows the racket, the hand speed, the racket speed. Great stuff from Serling. And of course, now Serling has changed his expectation of rhythm and is expecting the hammer serve and was ready for it. 10 4, game ball. Well, game ball now for Thur Serling. Down Again, and out. Serling had a decent Five, serve ten. there, but because of his court position, wasn't able to get to the ball at the front of the court. If he'd stood a yard further forwards, he would have been in great shape. So a tactical change needed for his positioning after he serves. Ooh, tricky Six, shot ten. by Lott. Reverse boast, effective on a doubles court. Very effective, and again, another reason why I suggest older players Down. try and play some doubles to develop their Seven, game ten. Game ball. Well, David Lott not being counted out of this third game just yet. Scraping his way back here, seven, ten. Down, 11-7, game to Serling. Playing the ball Serling behind his body, one. having to use so much wrist, and it's Thur Serling who manages to win the third and goes 2-1 up. So, Chanel, I think uh, the likelihood is more of the same unless David Lott comes up with another tactical change. The serve uh, uh, using the hammer definitely worked for a few, mm -hmm. but maybe he needs to go backwards and forwards between that and the lob serve. Time. Serling leads two games to well, one. Well, Richard, you did say that Thur Serling was either going to win this in four or in five. I think Lot was gaining some momentum towards the end of that third game. Just couldn't quite capitalize on some of the weaker shots <coughs> that came to him. Stroke to Lot. He needs to get off to a good start here in this fourth. Hand out, one love. Now, there we see an example of good sportsmanship. Um, David Lott was not even going to ask for a let there, and the referee gave him a stroke. Um, and neither player were upset by the change in decision. Not up. Oh, Thank nice you. Nice finding the cross court. Too Nick. Floating it in there. So already a little momentum swing in this fourth game. David Lott getting a little further. Around the right court. side. See if it's the hammer or the lob. Oh yeah. Hand out. Oh. <laughs> Beautiful One, two. drop volley by Thur Serling. <laughs> but you saw already David Lock cleverly is thinking about changing the momentum with his serves. Two all. Thur Serling with a backhand lob serve, narrowing the angle. And because David Lock didn't move up with his return, it was fairly easy prey for the Serling trickle boast. Trickle boast, folks, is a short boast played around Three the two. angles of the front corner. There was one from the back of the court from David Lott. And again, Four, two. changing up the serve, right hit the hammer serve into the side wall. Resulting in a loose return. Right box. You serve from the right. Now you're David back Lott on the right. hoping to serve, serve from the right, forehand left, side again. Right, yes. <laughs> I have you on the right. Right box, please. 4-2. Oh, 
not sure what happened there. Pretty sure he was meant to be serving from the other side. Again, Lotz played the drop oh. shot and stood and watched. Oh, great, great recovery. Get. Hand out. Great get, but just one too many Three, shots four. in that rally. So here again, we're seeing what we talked about earlier, Chanel, this business of getting the Ball. advantage by getting up Hand the out. court. Five, three. Oh. It's pretty much the end of the rally when that happens. Either an error or a winner. Not up. He Hand plays out. that serve really well. Four, it comes five. so sharply off the side wall, right into the body of Serling. So Serling's doing a good job of retrieving those. Having to react very quickly. Uh, ball. Now, Serling did not move to the back of the court. He expected the Lot short ball and snuck up to take advantage. I wonder if that'll encourage Lot to play a long ball. Good hands from both players. Oh my goodness, it's a long rally. Oh, that's a great rally. Well, the crowd goes wild, loving the athleticism Six, and five. hands of these two players. You're on the right side, sir. So, Serling, little, little advantage here. That's much better use of the back of the core. And there we see the change of direction. You have to think that that Seven, rally five. had a physical toll on both players. It seems to have a little bit more of a toll on David Lott. There's the trickle boast once again. Eight, five, Such an right effective side. shot at this age group and above. Well, Lot seemed to have had the momentum in his favor at the beginning of this fourth game. But it's been Serling in five. full control of the back and the front of the court. He's extending rallies a little bit and tiring out Lot as much as he can. 6-9. Nice attacking return serve from David Lott. Let's see if he, yes, he's using the lob this time. Got the front position. But great, great. core coverage by Thurs Erling again. Six. Excellent Match get. Ball. He's reading the game incredibly well. So here we are at match ball. 11-6. Oh, that he will be enough. Oh, he's remains, done it. Thurs Erling. Has won his first round match, 3-1. Slow start in the first. Didn't quite feel comfortable on this court and gained momentum moving forward in that third, fourth, and sorry, we were thinking fifth, but it went all the way to the fourth game. So great stuff by both players, great athleticism and hand skills by Lot and Serling, but all in favor of Serling moving forward. Absolutely, and great to see both players here at the national championships. Um, I say this a lot, uh, and I'll keep saying it. You do not need to get good to play in tournaments. You need to play tournaments to get good. And the players that are here understand that and are here not just to win a national title, although that's a wonderful thing, but to cut their teeth against other players who are trying to make their way and in doing so develop the breadth and range of game. Well, don't go too far. We have more exciting squash coming your way at 145. It's the men's 50 age group.
Half time. Time. Fifteen seconds. Time. Two thousand nineteen U.S. Squash Championships Men's Fifty Plus First Round. Dean McCausa well, to serve. Tuning in Rob Duffery C. Welcome. Best of five games. Throughout Love all. the morning, you'll know that I'm Chanel Rasmus, and with me Richard Millman here at the 2019 Masters National Hello. Singles being hosted at Squash on Fire. Richard, I'm really excited One for this love. match. I watched both of these players warm up a little bit earlier in the morning and was impressed by the racket skills and also the speed that these two players are able to generate. Hand so up. here we have Rob One Duff all. in the gray shirt, originally from, originally from South Africa, but lives in Madison, New Jersey. He's up against Dean Bacalzo from Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, well, I know nothing about either of these players, but the first observations are that uh, Rob Duff seems to have some pretty good classic technique and uh, strikes the ball cleanly. Um, but I've noticed that he's a little suspect on his movement to the front. Um, and Dean Picasso, perhaps not such good classic Three, one. strokes, uh, but clearly mobile. 
Well, this is the men's Down. 50 age group. Hand so up. A little change Two, in what three. we saw earlier where we watched the men's 65 plus and the men's 55 plus. So we're expecting to see more agility and flexibility on court between these two players Down. where those front shots worked really well in the previous Hand age out. group. Might Four, be able two. to be retrieved moving down. Yep, so in the 65 plus, you know, the typical rallies are Stroke three to off. five shots, um, you know, often five, two, two to three shots. Uh, and this, uh, I would expect to see occasional 10 to 12 shot rallies uh, and quite a few seven, eight shot rallies. And if we see anything over 15 shots, uh, Six, I think two. that would be the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. um, both of them a little bit susceptible to making errors at this point. You can see Dean Bacalzo on the backhand side because he doesn't set up at 90 degrees to where he wants the ball to go. He's very open-shouldered and a lot of his balls on the backhand are going into the middle of the court. Hand up. upright Three, stance six. from Duff as well plays doesn't quite uh, when we think about getting down low to the ball it's not quite the example we're seeing down. here. He plays with a, a late Hand out. preparation Seven, and three. then also plays upright. So the fact that he's still able to hit the ball so low is pretty impressive. Yeah, I, yes, I, yeah he's very upright. I, Seven, I wonder if three. he's got a little bit of a lower back problem, uh, which is also possibly contributing to his difficulties moving to the front of the court and changing direction. You can see when he reaches, he doesn't push off very easily. And there's a good example there. He really struggled to get Hand down out. low. Four, um, seven. He also has a very full swing which is lovely if it's a loose ball, but it doesn't help him play volleys. And you see now, that's Down. a couple of times that he's refused the volley. Five, seven. Chanel's volley police will be picking that <laughs> up very quickly. Uh, and in favor of playing a traditional ground stroke, but of course that gives the opponent a lot of time. Well, that's good quality Six, from Bacalzo. He's increasing the shot selection and the shot quality. Finding the height on that front wall is so important, and we've seen players wait until the second or the third game to figure it out. I'm going to expect to see these two players figure it out much quicker. Well, great get, hand, hand down out. on the floor. Eight, six. Lunging to get that back. Duff, excellent work. So I'm noticing every time that Duff stretches, he really finds it difficult to push off the stretch. So. I, I, again, I'm not sure if it's lower back or hamstring, but he's definitely got some issues with change of direction. Nine, six. But he's got great weight of shot, and as I said earlier, those classic s swing styles, and uh, he's getting the penetration quite often past Dean Calzo. Down. Which is enough to give him a game ball. Ten, here. six, game ball. Right box. Yep, slight. 10 6, it's game ball. It's a fast paced game. We're not seeing much variation in pace. Ball's being crushed to the back of the court against that front wall, which, as we know, on a glass court, it's not about generating power, it's about generating that height. 11-6, well, game to Duff. Into the front of the court. Duff leads, he just needs one, game one of those low. game balls to secure that first game, 11-6. So I, I feel as though it's looking like a three-love to Rob Duff unless Dean Bacalzo can actually get the penetration to the back of the court, maybe use some height. Um, if he's going to continue to play loose ball, I think the superior technique that Rob Duff has is enough to give opportunities to him to pressurize Dean Bacalzo and Bacalzo is going to break down.
15 seconds. Time. Duff leads one game to love. Well, Richard, you predicted love a three love for Rob Duff. I think if Dean Bacalzo can manage to twist and turn Duff a little bit, he has the opportunity to win a game or two off him. It's just the shots are landing too short. He hasn't quite figured out the height against Duff, who has pretty good hands for someone with late bracket preparation. Yeah. You know, down. Duff tends Hand out. to get the One prep all. up for the loose ball uh, very effectively. I wouldn't criticize that at all. It's, it's really the volley situation. You see, there's a volley that he's mm -hmm. refused. Um, well, there's a volley he's taken. Down. But as he hit that volley, he sort of fell onto his right foot. Hand out. He managed to keep Q1. it up. So, Bacalzo. Unfortunately, I think his technical issues are leading to a lot of loose ball here. Um, that's a better length from him, though. Yeah, much better length. Oh, Down. good cross. Excellent cross from the back of the court. Fairly difficult Three, position. One. He found the width, found the height. And again, another half length there from Macalzo. Refused the volley. Volley police. Good oh, use of the wrist excellent. there. Interesting though, Four, Duff one. played that great wrist cross court, but he was not able to recover from his own position there. If Picalzo had cut it off, it would have been very difficult for Duff. The problem I think is Five, that Picalzo is having trouble reading Duff's shots because he is using late racket preparation, right, which makes him pretty deceptive. And then the use of the wrist adds another element of deception. So he's not able to anticipate movement of the ball. And you can see Bacalzo himself, his backhand Stroke racket prep is very, very delayed. Hand and so out, two, his decision-making process doesn't start until the ball's already arrived at his feet. And that tends to lead to mistakes and poor choices. No racket prep there. There was a half volley available. Anybody watching doesn't know what a half volley is. Sometimes it's called a short hop in other sports. It's taking the ball right Down. as it bounces. A very important shot Three, in squash. Five. It's like a get out of jail card. If you can half volley the ball, not let it go to the back of the court. Down. It's better length from Duff. Hand out. Getting the Six ball to three. die in the back of the court, squeezing out the volley from Bacalzo. Giving himself a great opportunity to attack again. Well, that's exactly it. Where it's so difficult Seven, three. when you are down and out and then you play the, the boast, you have to move so quickly into position because you've just put yourself under so much pressure. That's why we down. always say the defensive boast is, is the worst shot in squash. Deadly shot. 8-3. Learning how to straight drive off of a tight shot from the back of the court is one of the most, probably a very difficult shot, but it's so crucial to learn from the get-go. You're right, Chanel, and that's why when we see a player that can play tight from Nine, tight, three. we're so much in admiration of that kind of player. We know the time and effort that's gone into developing the technique and the practice Down. to be able to do that. Well, Ten, Duff three, generating a ball. lot of pace, and you can see just pace in the way that he hits, but he's also moving a little bit quicker to the service box as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. He's managing the rhythm of the game at the rate that he likes, not the rate that his opponent wants. So his opponent at the moment is Down. on the back end of the rhythm. Oh. Hand out, 4-10, game ball. If I was Bacalzo, I wouldn't be in such a hurry to serve. I would mm -hmm. try and change up the rhythm and, and 
least try and frustrate Duff's desire to move on to yes, the ball let. early. 4-10, game ball. Oh, just landing in the neck. Back of the court, Duff excellent shot from Rob Duff. Now gives himself a two love lead here in this round of 16. Once again, you saw Dean Micalzo not angry. Big <laughs> smiles, pats on the back. That's master squash for you. seconds. Time. Duff leads, two games to love. Love all. Rob Duff <laughs> just went from strength to strength in that second game, winning 11 4, ending it off with a beautiful straight drive. And One love. He is taking charge in this third. A yeah, nice little piece of deception there on that forehand volley. Head up. Um, Hand he has out. the ability to One all. make it look as though he's going to hit cross court and straighten mm -hmm. his arm out. But you saw his movement difficulty come to the fore there with that return from Dean. Oh, I just saw his mind Panda. turning. It had Two so one. many options, didn't quite know what to do with the ball. And then uh, you find yourself in that situation of playing Down. the one that you didn't even want to play. Well, there up. was an Two example all. of what you talked about earlier, how upright mm -hmm. Rob Duff is. And because he was upright, closed his racket face, took it into the bottom of the tin. But a rally here, both players involved for a much Down. longer period there. Well, that's what I Three, would like to two. see from Bacalzo a lot more is continue the quality of squash for five or six Stroke extended rallies. And, you know, he used Hand the reverse out. corner Three, to win the previous rally, and he tried to use it there. He's given an, a stroke against him, but I don't think it's the wrong idea because the change of direction is something that Rob Duff has trouble with. Well, that's much better quality. Using a little height. Unfortunately, again, his technical issues causing him some problems there, opening up as he hits those shots. And it's not just the direction of the shot when you open up, it's also where you end up moving into position. It Down. is affected. Oh, just not expecting that ball to go up. 4-3. But better rally from Bacalzo, yep. tighter, g better quality. Staying engaged for longer. Yeah, forcing Duff to play from behind him is I think the strategy here. Yeah, because he really struggles to push off as he hits that shot. He's very late pushing Out. off. But also Bacalzo a little three. rushed. I'd love to see him just slow things down, move 
into position a little earlier. Down. Hand out. Four, five. Once again, volley's not being taken, which means the players are going to the back of the court. Hand out. But Bacalzo's error rate is a little too high, unfortunately, to be able to support the kind of game he's playing. Well, he's being sucked into the hard-hitting game, which I don't think is his game. No, no. I agree with you. But there again, he's made Duff stretch, and every Hand time out. Duff stretches, Five, he six. really has difficulty holding his balance and controlling the ball. Down. Six all. So that time the wrong footing wrist shot from Duff not paying off. The balance lost and the ball goes in the tin. So six all, a little closer. A little down the middle serve there from Bacalzo as a change up. No volley again. Down. Nice volley there from Rob Duff, though. He looked Hand a little out. reticent about Seven, hitting it, six. but he took it and turned it into a really strong attacking winner. Yes, let. I'm afraid Seven, we see Bacalzo's technique letting him down there again, not getting turned at 90 degrees and catching the sidewall popping out into the middle of the court. Seems a little too close to the ball as yeah. well, not giving himself the racket distance that he needs Eight, between him and the ball. Well, that's better. Straighter for longer. Now, but that's what I've been waiting to see mm -hmm. for a long time because Duff's mobility is a problem, eight. and if you can play that volley boast early, it's going to really capitalize on that. Well, I, I think it was because he was a little bit more yes, patient with the straight, which he played yep. uh, one shot extra down the line, which he hasn't been doing in the previous rallies. So he lured Duff in straight and then had a, a better opportunity with putting in that change in direction. There again, you see Duff really laboring when he's made to stretch and turn. Out. Hand out. 9-7. The ball's called out, I'm afraid. Yeah, great sportsmanship from Bacalzo, though. I think he called that on himself. It's better return of serve, too. Hand out. 8-9. Hand out. Well, he's staying in this third game better than he has in the first two. A little change in tactics, I think. Yeah. He's moved Duff around the court a little bit more, as we both suggested, and it's brought him some fruit. There we see the height coming into play, trying to slow it down just a fraction. Once again, volleys not being taken. You cannot Down. afford to refuse a volley in this sport. Hand I can out. see him kicking his Ten, feet against ball. the wall, knowing that just needs to move out of the way a little quicker. That brings up match ball for Rob Duff. Well, that's a great shot down the line the from Rob Duff, who's been 11, in full six, control 11, of this four, match 11, right from the start, winning that three games to love. So glimmers of hope for Dean Bacalzo in that third, just started to gain momentum a little too late and figured out what he needed to do, but didn't quite execute it correctly. Absolutely. Um, you know, as you said, glimmers of hope, if he can work on that, it would he help his game a lot. So I'm going to disappear and go and see my lovely wife, Pat Millman, playing in the 65 plus, And uh, I'm going to leave you in Chanel's capable hands. Well, enjoy and good luck to Pat. Next up, we have Brian Jack against Tom Maziars.
Players ready? <laughs> 2019 U.S. Squash Championships, men's 45 plus first round. Tim Maziarz to serve, Brian Jack to receive. Best of five games, love all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's the men's 45 plus age group competing here at Squash Down. and Fire in the Men's National Hand Masters out. Singles One Championships. Low. I'm Shana Rasmus, and if you're tuning in for the first time today, welcome, you're in for a real treat. Right now we have Brian Jack, who's in the lighter blue. He's from Scottsdale, Arizona, and finished 25 through 32 in the 2018 World Masters, yeah. which was hosted in Charlottesville, Virginia last year. Too Fantastic low. tournament and superb achievement by Jack. His opponent, Tom Maziars, Out. is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Three love. And uh, he's currently ranked 546 in the US. So. Interesting to see Four sort love. of the difference between these two players and Jack is number 22 in the US. And he's taken quite a comfortable lead, but both players Five are lefties, love. which is always fun to see. It's sort of a different mentality when you're playing against someone that's left-handed and just trying to shift your, your mental side Six of the game to, to adapt and right uh, to switch things up a little bit. But here we have two players who both Out. are left-handed. You don't see this Seven very often. Love. But Brian Jack clearly Down. showing Down. his skills and his talent on court. Eight love. He's got great technique, good accuracy so far. And Mazios just hasn't settled into this first game yet plays with quite a closed racket face as you can down. see so he has trouble with getting the ball up if he doesn't bend Let down much. low both rather tall down. men as well ten love game take ball. up quite a bit of court space and oh, ten love lead for Great use of height by Jack. Well, Brian Jack, love, quick work Jack. of that first game. Jack 11 leads, love. Game just not giving <laughs> Maziarz any room to play or any opportunity to get himself into that first game. And we've often spoken about that first game. And I like to talk to my players when I'm when I'm coaching them and, and saying, use that first game to get yourself comfortable. Figure out the height on the front wall. Right. Figure out the the weaknesses of your opponent, especially if you've never played them before and make them have to work incredibly hard in that first game. Win or lose, you have to make them lunge and stretch for every single ball. And that way, then as a coach, when you're stepping out, out of court after that first game, you have a better sense too of what to do. So Brian Jack just finding the corners and then a few unforced errors from Tim Maziarz that he can eliminate. But I think this is gonna be fairly straightforward, just clean hitting. Great technique, good movement from Brian Jack. Jack leads one game to love. Love all. Well, it does seem like Maziarz is a former tennis player just by the way that he holds his racket. I don't know much about these two players. But you can see he plays with one love. a bit of a closed racket face and that top spin. So he has to work really hard at getting under the ball. Not oh, up. just. Hand out. One all. Getting to the front of the court and gets himself on the board. Big mental advantage here. Wow, that's great. Two Finding one. that back corner. He's trying, Jack, trying to take the ball early. I think just losing sight, really. While well, that ball looked down. He 
can Hand see, out. just notice the difference in control, right, between these two players. Brian Jack seems like his movement is very controlled, somewhat compact as well, and Mazia is a little bit all over the place. But he plays the ball and moves out of the way, which is Three, a two. great skill to have. We've now seen three different uh, age groups the 50 plus the 65 plus 55 sorry and now this is the the fourth age group the 45 and just noticing the differences in obviously Four, mobility three. and agility and then shot selection and working the points a little bit better so expecting to see brian jack move forward here and as he begins to meet someone that's close in his level hopefully see Five, a few more three. extended rallies into the back of the court but is comfortable, he's been given the opportunities right in the middle. Down. Well, there's the importance of racket preparation, right? Have your Six racket up three. at all times, so that if a ball comes directly back to you, you're not wasting time trying to get that preparation. Well, using a lot of power. Oh, that's got to hurt. Well, oh, just... <laughs> 7-3. Shaking it off. Definitely not yeah. done on purpose. Just moved right Eight, into three. the line of Brian Jack. Oh, Jack's hitting the ball so nicely on that front Nine, wall. Three. Ball's box. just dying in the back of the court. He's working the back much better now than he did in the first. I think he was just trying to, and obviously won that 11 love. Made quick work of that, whereas now he's actually playing a few of these points out. Down. He's going to be on back on this Ten, last three. court again throughout the weekend. So he's got to get used to it. He's got to find the height on the front wall. Good change in direction. 11, Excellent. Three, and Jack, Jack leads to Brian game Jack, below. again, full control of that second. Tim Muzier is doing everything he can to get himself on the scoreboard. But it's Brian Jack who's making quick work of this match, who currently leads two games to love. Time. Thank you. Jack leads two games to love. Well, here love we are all. in the third. Brian Jack playing excellent squash and down as. My co-commentator Richard One Nolan love. said earlier, was very impressed by the quality of squash that Brian Jack played at the World Down. Masters last year, and we're certainly seeing why. He's getting himself in great Down. Three opportunities love. where he's he's setting himself up to take control of this match. He's moving his body in the right position. Out. Four He's setting love. himself up for what's to come next, which is such an important skill to have in squash. Oh, cracking post 
lets the bull go right around his body. Hand out. Sets One up for four. that. He sort of prepared that. You could see he prepared that well in advance. Yes, what? That's just going to be One a lap played. But again, a little frantic movement from Maziars. Beautiful up. drop. Would like to see Brian Jack just Hand step out. up. Of course, he's Five been one. very comfortable in this match so far. So just being a little harder on him, trying to prepare him for Down. what might come in that semi-final tomorrow. 6-1. Down. Seven one. Left box. Oh, well, the unforced errors are creeping in because of the closed racket face from Mazuros. Eight one. Down. Yeah, he's setting himself up for what's to come next beautifully. Nine one. Left box. Tim Mazier is really trying and scraping to stay in this match, doing everything he can. Oh, oh there he moves right Ten into one. the line of Jack. Just want him to be a little careful of that movement. Don't want him to get hurt, of course. But match ball now for Brian Jack. 11-1, match to Jack. Three well, games to Brian love. Jack, very impressed love, with the quality three, of squash. And as you can see, just love the camaraderie between these players. And it's, it's such a positive aspect of the game and it makes it so worthwhile. So excellent stuff from Brian Jack, who makes rather quick work of that match. And Tom Mazier is just fighting to stay in it as best he can. But Brian Jack moves on to the semifinal and don't want you to go too far because next up we have the women's 60 plus division between Liz Evitz and Dominic Posse.
halftime. You can spin for serve. The next one. And the next one. Uh, Sorry. It's a women's 60 plus match. Elizabeth Everts to oh, serve. Hello and welcome to the 2019 the five National five Masters singles being hosted here at Squash on Fire in Washington, D.C. I'm Chanel Rasmus. With me, Richard Millman. Richard, let's talk a little bit Hello. about these two players. This is the women's 60 plus division, the first women's match we've seen today. And Liz Everts in the black off. shirt and the, the green and yellow pants up against Dominic Posey. So Liz is athletic, um, plays a lot of doubles, comes from Meadow Mill Athletic Club, the great club uh, run and owned by Nancy Cushman. Um, and uh, she, I suspect, will be a little too strong for Dominic Posey, uh, who's from Seattle. Uh, Dominic's got some nice shots, but I don't think she'll have the mobility and court coverage to cope with Liz. There immediately you saw a little doubles-esque yeah. shot from Liz, and she loves to do this, and she does it very effectively. So I think Liz Everts is going to be a very strong contender in this year's yeah. over-60 competition. Five, one. Well, immediately we're seeing Everts take charge of this first game. 5-1 lead. Six, Plays one. at a pretty high pace in full control. Saw her earlier practicing some of those lobs, but she's full force ahead. Good change of direction. Seven and one. for a lady in her 60s, Left. she's a powerful athlete. Yeah, Great change absolutely. of direction. And as we were saying earlier, as we come up the age groups, change of direction is obvious, often the problem. Uh, and so you've, you've got an athlete who can change direction easily. They have a great advantage. Out, fault. 
And out. Just H2. out. Using good height on that front wall. Oh, oh. it's a beautiful volley drop. Three eight. Took the ball early. If I have any criticism of Liz from my experience of uh, having spent some time with her, it's sometimes she does try and hit the ball a little too fast for her own recovery and sometimes gives her opponent an opening. But her own athleticism often can make up for that. Yeah. So I think in the over 60s, um, it won't be too much of an issue. Well, nice. trying to read it. Just being sent in the wrong direction. Good little hold. From Posey. And out. 10 4, game ball. I believe Dominique uh, Posey has a daughter who is now helping to organize Chicago game squash, four, even though Everts. she's from um, one game Seattle. So the Posey's obviously helping US squash in more ways than one. Well, Liz Everts, 11 4 in that first game. Really fast-paced game. Likes to take the ball early and then use those corners and and angles that she's so good at on the doubles court here in the singles game. Yeah, very hungry player, all business. game to love love all well Richard would like I would like to see Dominic Posey just taking away the front corners of Liz Everts and she's executing those beautifully really just taking the pace off the ball getting them to die in the front but it's because she's been given those opportunities by Posey really and out. One yeah all. and Posey does tend to stand in the same place after she's hit her shot as she was before she'd hit the shot, which means that the court opens up big spaces. And out, 2-1. Technically, both of these players set up pretty well, strike the ball quite nicely. It's the movement that is at issue. Well, again, ball landing in the middle of the court, taking full advantage. I like the use of the lob serve. Oh, that's going to be a stroke. Four, one. Really like the use of the lob serve on this court, especially where yeah. you lose Four, the ball. As yes. if you're able to see, you can see the lights coming down on the side. So if the ball is going to hug the side wall, you're going to be oh. delayed in your reaction and time. Two, four. We, there we saw Liz Everts play a good lob serve, but the position mm -hmm. she took up in defense was a good three, four feet behind the short line, which left her open to the drop volley. It's a lot of that happening here. And out, five Let's see where happening. she goes. In the back of the court as yep. well, right? We just saw there, you play the ball, but then you open up your body and getting yourself in the right position after you've opened Six up two. the stance is a difficult thing to do. Again, and Liz Everts three, backing six. off towards the back wall as the drop volley went in and the separation of her movement from the ball making it impossible to retrieve. I think one of the things players need to work on when they're practicing is this continual connection between themselves and the ball and not moving to where they think it's likely to go but staying connected continuously. Oh, I thought that was an excellent shot in the back of the court. Beautiful use of height, just dying in the back left corner. It's great stuff. Just a little closed Eight racket four. face there from Dominique Posey. Um, again, Liz Everett's a little rewarded there for a situation she wasn't in control of. Good change in direction, both players. 9 4 from the right. Oh, that 
That's out. brutal. I hate I to know. see it, Richard. You see what happened there it was that as Liz Everts went in, she didn't stabilize her feet, and so she okay. fell into the shot. Ten ball hit the top of the ball. tin. I need to take a, b a lesson out of game. her lob serve book. That's excellent games. stuff. Well, two games there to Liz Everts, who's marching on pretty um, summarily. And, uh, you know, the only thing that I can see for Dominique to do is to try and slow it down, hit straight returns. But most importantly, as she does that, get up the court. Because until she gets in front of Liz Everts, I think it's a good night nurse, I'm afraid. Well, two love now for Liz Everts. I'd like to see to Dominic Posey hit a little higher on the front wall to get the ball all the way into the back of the court. Haven't seen her utilize the back corners as much in this match. Well, she did the job there, yeah. Chanel, but unfortunately <laughs> the drop shot from the back of the court by Liz Everts was just a little unexpected and too strong. Two love. So uh, Liz Everts continues her lob serve clinic. And a half length there from Dominic Posey, really bringing Liz Everts back into the rally when she was out of it. Mm -hmm. So a little resignation on the face of Dominic Posey, who hasn't found an answer to the Liz Everett serve and control of the court. Ah, oh, that's nice. That's really good Five stuff from, from Everett's. A very nice cross-court volley nick Down from Dominic Posey, taking advantage of Everts moving backwards. Great serve. Oh, uh, excellent. I was just about to say, I wonder what five. she's going to do when she has another opportunity, right? It's like, when you have options, what do you choose? And that was the right Down. shot selection. Unfortunately, yeah. followed up there by Six no two. footwork and setup and dropped wrist into the top of the tin. Stroke to Posey. Hand out three That's six. That's going to be a stroke. And Dominic Posey has quite a way to go to get herself Four, back six. into th this third game. Her own serve there, getting a good width onto the side wall, confusing Liz Everts a little bit there. The serve looked low. I wasn't sure about I'm not the sure serve if Liz Everts yes, perhaps thought the ball yeah, was down and was didn't close. concentrate on her return. Six. Four, six. I think they're going to play let ball because of uncertainty. Interesting return of surf position Seven, from Everts. Stands facing the front wall, right? Instead of turning your body to face the side wall. Well, I must say I do teach my players to face the ball in the opponent's hand huh. because when people face the side wall, I tend to hit them on the back of the head or on the back of the backside <laughs> or on the leg. I, I want the connection uh, between the person four. and the ball right from word go. And out, five eight. So Dominic Posey making an effort here 
to follow your advice and get a little bit of the height, but her speed five. to cover the next shot, unfortunately, just putting her under pressure all the time. Another beautiful oh, observe beautiful from Liz Ebbets. Well, that match gives ball. her match five match balls now. Looking to close it out in three straight games. Oh, again, that's Eleven beautiful. Five, well, she match, only needs one average, of those match games, balls and an Eleven excellent four, lob five, serve. Five. But it's. Liz yes, Evitz, who moves on to her next done. round match. Excellent stuff by that player. Very good. And uh, Chanel and I are going to go and get hold of Liz Evitz and pay her 20 bucks for a uh, lob serve clinic lesson. right now. <laughs> well, well done, Liz Evitz. Don't go too far. We have more matches coming up. About three more matches left before we head into the pro event later this evening. So don't go too far.
Just two. I do a serve with two, you do a serve with three.
Well, hello and welcome to the 2019 Masters National Singles being hosted here at Squash on Fire in Washington, D.C. I'm Chanel Rasmus, with me, Richard Millman. Good afternoon, folks. Well, here, Chanel, we have one of those lovely occasions where we have a Canadian national playing against an American national. And as folks may not know, the U.S. National Masters Championship is an open event that's available to anybody from anywhere in the world to play. The two players we have here, Paul Lexier from Toronto, originally from Vancouver, BC, in Canada, in the white shirt, and Bruce Gordon from New York, New York, in the uh, gray and light blue shorts. I have had the pleasure of playing both of these players. Um, Bruce has improved quite a lot over the last few years and is more of an incisive player than he used to be um, and perhaps builds rallies better than he used to. Um, he probably has the greater range of shots. Paul is a very steady up and down the wall kind of guy. Um, pretty good technique, uh, but not quite as explosive. So I think it'll be a question of Lexier's patience and uh, all court movement against Bruce Gordon's eclectic range of shots. Well, we haven't down. seen a rally go past two shots just yet, Richard. So is that a prediction of what we're going to see moving forward? I think they'll settle down and we'll have a couple of longer rallies. But I do oh. think that Bruce, there you Five go, two. is a good example <laughs> of his range of shots. <laughs> that is so good. It was a very nice little reverse corner. And he does have the ability to do this off a loose ball. So I think you know Paul's issue will be, can he get the length? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's Touche, but a little reverse corner from Lexier. Three, five. But can Lexier's length stop Gordon's shot making? That's my question. Out. Well, a good serve like that certainly four, helps. So, five forward now, Bruce Gordon. Just one point lead and won most of his points of those really effective. It was contact with the ball. Lexier asking for let though, but if we look back at that, we'd and see that his serve was four. very loose, very fast, yeah. and Gordon smashed it down the sidewall as he should have done, and Lexier was late. So Lexier created his own issue there. I don't know what you think, Chanel, but I think they could both do Seven with four. a lesson from Liz Everts on the lob serve. Oh, absolutely. That was pure class. I walked over to her earlier and I said, that was an amazing game. And she was sort of shocked by that response. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm serious. That was so good. I've had the privilege of coaching Liz a little bit and she is a very modest lady. So it doesn't surprise me that she was shocked. Well, there's the use of height, Richard. That's what we've been missing so far. They, they're trying to hit too hard on a glass court that A4. doesn't allow for right. that. Yeah. I think generally you need to hit those hard shots at least two to three feet higher than you would on a regular traditional court. Nine four. But at the moment, Bruce Gordon's range of shots and his sudden eclectic variety and is too much for Paul Exier, who isn't yet finding quality width and length to stop him. Our ball just getting sucked into that side wall. Ten five, game ball. And Gordon doing a nice job of taking the pace off the ball and it just dying into the side. Shortens his swing, sort of plays around the ball. Down. Oh, just. And out. Six, missing ten, the front ball. wall. I think all his eggs were in the basket yep. of the trickle boast there and didn't have much to offer after that. And there's well, the reverse corner. This time being read though, effectively ah. by Seven, ten, Lexia. And I would, I would caution Gordon into playing that shot too much. No, you're right, he does like to play these sort of strange little unusual yeah, shots but yeah, if you do it too much it warns the opponent mm -hmm. that it's coming and they are on the outlook for it your shot was affected not prevented uh, 7 10 game ball well Lexia saving a couple of game balls in the first 
And the unforced Eight errors ten, are just creeping in, desperately seeing the light too soon. Well, not, qu not quite sure what happened there, Richard. I, I don't think Lexia expected Gordon. the ball to be back and then was caught off guard by the response. Not a great quality shot, but good flexibility by Gordon to be able to pick that up. Yep, so I think what we saw there was Gordon's unusual eclectic range of shots catching the steadier, more traditional Lexia out. Lexia trying to hit with pace and on this court, as you rightly said, uh, unless you get some height on it, it just isn't going to pay dividends. Well, it's Bruce Gordon who manages to get himself on the scoreboard first and currently leads one game to love. Video on court one is, is messed up again. Yeah, court one. Yeah. Everywhere I go, in other words. It's, it's a little thing. It's an, uh, you think it's me? It could be, because I just changed the battery, so. You can undo what I did. Fifteen seconds. <laughs> Gordon leads. We're trying to fix the um, screen, but I'll just announce the score loudly. Gordon leads one game till you can start. You can start now. Well, the, the screen will show better when they fix it, but we can still play because I, I'll tell you the score. Gordon leads one love, love all. Well, here we are, game two, Bruce Gordon. I yes, think left. Alexia was caught off guard a couple of times there by the, the skill of the shot selection, I guess, by Bruce Gordon. He's, he's a tricky player, Richard. Down. Yeah, and uh, I think Gordon has a shorter, more compact swing, much. which he transfers his weight into very effectively. Lexia, effectively, sorry. Lexia tends to have a longer swing, which goes well if he can play tight. But if he's going to leave the ball loose, mm -hmm. then that short, punchy swing with the variety of shots from Gordon is going to be a real problem for him. Well, you read that really well. Played the beautiful and shot the into the back of the court, forced the boast from Lexia and then already moved himself into the position to counter what's That's to come okay. next. Yes, right. All right. All right. And Bruce Gordon has worked very hard in this game over the last few years and uh, I think justly can Without feel ball. more confident uh, than ever before, especially one. coming into this 60 plus age group. Oh, he's taking the ball early, jumping right on it. And Lexia trying to force the pace of the game, which I think actually is not playing into his hands because it's putting the ball onto Gordon's racket with him still out of position. Oh, he's Four trying one. to take a book, a lesson out of Gordon's book by playing the reverse. But uh, in this uh, second game, I I'm detecting a, a steadier approach from Gordon. Mm -hmm. um, not quite Two so four. many of the sort of eclectic reverse corners and such. Well, I think he needs, he knows that he needs to back it up with good quality length. The problem is that he's delaying the attack, which was a strong suit of him in that yeah, first you're game. Right. And now Lexia has hit a great width and length there and uh, beginning to get into the game a little bit himself. There we see that short and saying it doesn't do much with bending down to the ball. No. But pretty good on the reverse corner, very sudden. Not much interference. I, did, I, saw hard, I saw minimal interference and you couldn't get to the ball. It, it, didn't, it didn't slow you down at all, no let, no let. Hand out, 4-5. And the point given out, to Paul Lexier there, um, I think the view was that 
Bruce Gordon on his reverse corner had not cleared the space for Lexia to swing, so stroke awarded. So there we saw oh. uh, that Lexia's My movement ball. flows a little bit better than Gordon's. Gordon's a little stiff, especially when he's wrong-footed. Yeah, you know, he hasn't got those long levers in the same way as Lexia. That's nice change of direction, giving himself some time. Oh, brutal. Uh, it's a great lesson for anybody <laughs> out there watching. When Six your five. opponent plays a back wall boast, just because the ball's slow doesn't mean you've got time. You've got to get there really early and play early. And uh, Bruce scored made the mistake of expecting to have time and the ball died. Wow, that's just inches above the tin. Seven five. So that's good stuff from Lexius. Taking control, he's now the one that's attacking first in the right position. Yeah, and because his balls are bouncing a little bit deeper now, it's giving him an opportunity mm -hmm. to get in front and uh, taking advantage. Oh, good get. And you well, can see Gordon's movement definitely hobbled when he has to change direction. But he's doing enough six, to get seven. there. And out, 8-6. And I think Lexia may have recognized uh -huh. that there's some problems with the change of direction and the lunging to the front with Gordon. He's going to take advantage of that. Down. Just falling short. And out. Needs seven, to eight. be careful not to play the burst. You can see the way that he's prepping his racket. He knows that he needs to get out straight from the back of the court. Don't open it up for. Yeah, you're so right. He knows that because what he didn't that? prep I mean, early enough, he ended up playing a really ball, weak defensive a winner, boast. You're afraid. Seven, eight. Early racket prep triggers the mind seven, into understanding many more selections. When you prep late, you're limited on your selections and you're forced into making bad choices. Again, late preparation there and he's ended up playing a boast when a volley would have got him out of trouble. So That's still a dangerous shot to play though, Richard. And I know Gordon won the point, but he played it and stood. And I think that if Lexia just reacted somewhat sooner, he would have been rewarded the stroke immediately. I agree with you. I agree out! With you. And out. Nine, eight. Well, this is really tight and close here in the second game. Nine, eight to Lexia. Nobody really has found a pattern that dominates in this game. Some half lengths oh, there. that's beautiful. Ten, eight from the left. So a uh, game ball for Paul Lexia to even things up. Gordon's movement and his overuse of the reverse corner has uh, not paid dividends for him. his reach and out, nine, ten. Not quite Game getting ball. himself in a, in a standard position to be able to execute that shot you're right sort of the stability over. wasn't there with yeah. his legs and perhaps that type of volley was the wrong choice there I'd love to have seen him just run the volley deep down the wall Ten all player must win by two so points. all tied up player must win by two clear points kind of feel as though uh, if Gordon wins this game, it'll, you know, give him a, a new legs in the third game. So I think for Lexier, it's pretty important that he wins this game. Beautiful little cross that's court really nice. with touch there. And that's the difference I'd like to see from Gordon is working the back of the court a little bit longer than he has in those first in that first game and first half of the second game. And then that that becomes that short game becomes so effective. Yeah, right. And let's see if Lexia gets his prep up and volleys this deep. But he's volleyed to half length. 
and is up against it right away. That's a stroke. Oh. That's a stroke. And, and that time we saw off. Gordon not prepping early mm -hmm. enough, and that's why he had that ball catch the side wall and pop out, or pop out as I call it. And uh, so dangerous when you don't prep early, it's so easy to give strokes away. Close to a stroke if you're not ready. <laughs> yeah. Down. Oh. Just sort of, that's just Trouble 11. breakdown of technique, ah. right, and, and movement. And when you're 11 or that's fatigue setting into leaning backwards, desperately trying to go for a short shot. I think that uh, Gordon was hoping that God would put that yeah. ball up for him. <laughs> no, thank you. I'd like and to see both players so better. Richard, and yep. I think I'm I'm basing this off now after seeing Liz Everts play that how important that serve is and we can see that being played into account here 13, with the, 12, the return of ball. serve playing such a big role as well. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think neither of these players are putting enough time into the targeting of either their serve or their return of serve and it does tend to lead to scrappy play. 14, 12, so there we are, Gordon, Bruce Gordon, Gordon two, two love up, and as I said to you, Chanel, I think uh, you know that re-encouragement, having been in danger of losing the second game, might prove too much for Paul Lexier now. Now that Bruce Gordon's two love up. Fifteen seconds. Yeah. Time. Time. Mr. Lexer, time. Do you see your opponent? Bruce? Bruce, do you see your opponent? He's there. Tell him to come on court, please. He may not hear me. So Lex here, Paul. Well, you gotta you gotta tell me about it because you're like a, win a minute late. Okay, you gotta tell me then, okay? So I know. All right. Don't do that again. Gordon leads two games to love. Number three, a very close game between Bruce Gordon and Paul Alexia in the second 14-12. I thought Alexia got off to a much better start in that game, just couldn't hold on to the momentum. And Bruce Gordon worked at the back of the court much better, which I think is the game plan here. Play the ball in the back a couple of times and then go short. 
Richard, not quite sure what the argument is here. Not, not sure what's going on. It, it, maybe he needs a headband because he's got ah. sweat coming into his glasses. But going yeah. back to uh, the way this game is shaping up, I feel, Chanel, that for Lexia to have been able to stop Gordon using that one good length and then a quick attacking shot, his own length would have had to have been tighter, higher, more effective. And uh, at the moment, he just hasn't been able to get any kind of rhythm to limit Gordon. Gordon's had too much freedom. So we'll see if he can do better here. It's 1-1. One, one. There's the pop out. Hand out. 2-1. So he had the opportunity, but Certainly. just tried for too much. Down. And again, maybe trying for a little bit too much. He needs to settle. He needs to get himself an advantage in this game if he has any chance of coming into this match. Well, this is a certainly a mental aspect of the game too, right? You've now hit two shots in the tin of the first return. It's also one of those situations where if you've got a friend helping you who understands a game plan and you can execute a game plan, you can do very well, but if you're not sure what to do, it's a bit of a lottery out there. Ah, that's Down. excellent use of height. Well, really I well thought calculated. particularly intelligent by Gordon, who you could see as he hit that lob, was falling over, not balanced. He doesn't feel comfortable in the front of the court, so really bright of him to make sure that he wasn't going to be exposed. Like he was there. Correct. <laughs> Two five. Well, Lexia is going to have to work hard and work smart. He hopes to come back here. He certainly has the skill. Not quite sure if it's enough against Bruce Gordon. He would have to play a very two. disciplined regime mm -hmm. of quality up and down the wall. He doesn't have the range of shots that Gordon has or the suddenness that Gordon has but he does have mobility that yep. Gordon doesn't and have. So three, to six. take advantage of that mobility, he needs the rallies to be tighter and longer. There's quite a lot of poor length squash going on here. Four, six. Well, there's the boast that has ended up in the 10 towards the beginning of this third game. Oh, poor serve, Richard. But the thing is, it was a poor serve, but most importantly, he didn't stay attached mm -hmm. to the ball afterwards. And so the drop volley wasn't fantastic from Gordon. Ah. Well, that's a dangerous play. But, you know, any appeal, drop please. shot on the front wall is going to win if you're running in the appeal. opposite direction when it hits the front wall. Well, my reaction there, Before. just uh, cringing for Bruce Gordon, hoping that he doesn't get smacked. Yeah, Paul Lexier trying a tweener and not really <laughs> knowing where the ball was going to go. 9-4. But Bruce Gordon really taking control of this match now. And uh, as we said at the beginning, his short, punchy style, more than enough to uh, overcome the more traditional um, style of Paul Lexier. Well, it's become tighter as well. The quali as the match has continued, the quality has improved, which is impressive. Oh, wow. What a, what a <laughs> winner. What a way to win it. That was an excellent shot, almost behind the back. Uh, very nice execution by Bruce Gordon, who manages to win that match. Three, love. But great display of athleticism from both players and quality of shot just improving from Bruce Gordon throughout that match. Yeah, many congrats to Bruce Gordon. I, I know him quite well, and he has worked very hard on his game in the last few years, and it's nice to see him getting those rewards. Well, we have one more match coming up for you at 4.05 p.m. It's the men's 65 plus already. singles, so don't go too far. And then, of course, at five o'clock, we start up the pro women's and men's draw, so stay tuned.
Half time. Time. Wait, wait, please, wait. This is a men's 65 plus match, 60 plus match, 65 plus match. The Ray. Serling to, re to serve, Thomas Bedore to receive. Best of five games. Love all. Okay. Ready to go. And out, 2-1. Two, two bounces. Your shot was not, I called your shot not up. Hand out, 2-1. Here we are, it's the last match of today between these two players, Tom Bedder in the yellow shirt and the blue on the Three back. Two. quite like that shirt, Richard. He's up against her Serling in the all gray. This is the men's 60 plus division and it's our last match of the Masters for today before they move on tomorrow and into out. the semi-finals. Well, Chanel, uh, Tom Bedore, is one of those great evergreen class players. He's from uh, these days British Columbia, uh, but he's been one of the great Canadians. He's currently uh, ranked third amongst the over 60 year old Canadians, um, but he's ranked, uh, he's seeded number one here in our tournament. Um, his son, Patrick, is the uh, director of squash at St. Paul's School for Five Boys three. in Baltimore. Ah, it's a fantastic school. 
and um, he has been such a wonderful supporter of both this event and the Canadian Masters over the years. He has, I believe, won this event and the Canadian. Six three. Um, and it'll be a tough match here for Tour, who I'm also delighted is here from Salt Lake City um, and uh, representing the great Bennett Club Squash Works in Salt Lake Seven City. Three. Right now, Tom, as expected, a little too strong for Tour, although Tour is giving a very good account of himself. Well, we saw Tour play Eight, earlier, three. Richard, as we mentioned, and great hand skills. Ability to hit the ball and really nicely. He was up against Four, David eight. Lott, who he beat. And so this is his second match of the day already. Tom Bador has always been a, a, a pretty traditional squash player, you know, up and down the walls. Um, not and a great range of shots, four. but uh, very physically tough and. Uh, has a tendency to be prepared to rally for pretty much as long as it takes. Obviously at this age group, rallies decrease in four, their duration, um, but I would say he's one of the fittest and strongest in this age Mr. group. Mr. Bedore, Mr. Bedore, hey, well, was your serve out? 10 was four your serve now, out, it was very close. Four, Do you want to play a lead on that because it's been? No, no, no. Okay. As you mentioned, he's okay. the number one question, seed here this weekend in the 60 plus okay. age group game ball. I just want to make sure he would have played earlier on a regular court not on this last court so it's great to see that he he's comfortable in this first game, game. and I'm sure not only oh, will his did. son Patrick be checking this Ten match four. out but uh, there's a great community in British Columbia that will be really excited to see how Tom gets on in this US Masters Ten. Championships Eleven. Well, first 11, game four. goes to Thomas Bedour, 11-4. Making rather quick work of that first, finding the corners, finding the angles, and then punishing any ball that comes loose in this first game. Great so. to see Tom Bedour here because he has had some serious knee injuries, but I was talking to him before the match, and he tells me that uh, some physical therapy and good physical training has really helped him so I look forward to seeing some really tough matches if he gets past Thur Serling later in the tournament. Fifteen seconds. The door leads one game to love. Love all. Richard, what can we expect to see from Serling moving on love into all. this second game? If I'm not mistaken, he lost the first against David Lott too, and then came back to fight it out. So, any advice here? Well, I, I think Serling has got a nice range of shots, and I think and you know Tom Bedore's mobility um, is a little hampered. Um, you know, as I said, he's come back from some knee injury problems. So I think we might see sort of a little bit of a scrappy um, sort of lack of rhythm to the match. Too for large. a few points, but I have to believe that um, Bedour will gradually uh, strengthen the game against Thur and overcome him just with his experience and mobility. And out, one, two. Uh, 
Oh, that's a <laughs> great angle. Straight down the line. Tight against the wall. Good quality squash. Well, he's working the back of the court well. You're right there. Tom Bador almost Three, getting caught out yeah. by a back wall boast similar to Three, what two. we saw earlier. You really have to get onto those back wall boasts early. And if you hang around, you can get caught out by a dying ball. 4-2. But I think just a, a little bit too much experience here. You know, Thur is done very well, um, but perhaps not quite streetwise enough to cope with a player of Bador's Five pedigree. Two. Well, he certainly knows that he has to get height on the ball, get it past the sk racket skills of Badur. Let's get it into the back of the court, Richard. Uh, two. We say that over and over again, but it's it's such an important part and fundamental part of the game. And I've noticed that uh, Tom Badur is taking a little bit more time to target his serve now and really catching Seven the side two. wall just in front of Serling, which is giving Serling some problems because Serling's not moving his feet to adjust accordingly and volley that ball. Better length there from Serling. But now we see... Oh, great reach! I was, <laughs> was going to say, now we see Bedour playing down to Serling a little bit, but that's a little risky strategy, as we saw there. Wow. Oh, great lob wow. serve. A skill seven. that we can all learn and takes a lot of time to learn, that's for sure. Well, you know, Thur Serling is hanging around there. He's not being overcome completely. And obviously that lob service <laughs> pays some dividends. But good length and there from the duel. Wow. That was a beautiful volley lob dead into the bank, Nick. And obviously, as Thur Serling didn't move at all after he hit that, he was expecting the Nick. 6 8. So coming back into it a little bit, 6 8. And there I think we saw Seven, the uh, knee right. injury of. Tom Bador coming into play there. He wasn't willing to really push himself to pick up that boast from Serling. I'll talk about it, the discipline it takes, right, to stick with that physical now. therapy. Continue working through and getting yourself five, healthy. Seven. Definitely not something that everyone does. You're absolutely right. So I think, uh, you know, perhaps Bador. Down. Oh! Bador may be guilty uh, of just eight, trying nine. to do enough um, to get by, and that can really come back in your face sometimes. Down. And that's a nine 10 all. there from Bador, and he finds himself at 9 all in a game that perhaps he thought he should comfortably mm -hmm. wrap up. This is a time when you can get very nervy. Ball in the middle of the court. But unfortunately, Thur Serling also playing in the middle of the court. I like the change of pace that Serling is doing here on this court. He's mixing it up, throwing in those lobs. Very effective work, but not enough Bedore, against Bedore Thomas Badura. And he manages to just creep through in that second game, 11-9. Well, a little, uh, little cheeky by Tom Bador there, sort of um, freewheeling a little bit, nearly getting caught out, but in the end doing enough to get through.
leads two games to love. Well, I think we're going to see a little change in intensity here from Thomas Spadura. He realized in the second half of that second game that he yeah. got a little bit lackadaisical, right? Just Bubble. settled into the match Bubble. and Bubble. didn't quite continue with that forceful attacking squash that he had in the first game as well as the first half. So, But I think Thur Serling can be encouraged, you mm -hmm. know, against a, a player of some repute. He's re more than holding his own. I can't quite tell if he lost sight of the ball or just sent in the wrong direction, but a little chuckle there from Thur Serling. Well, I think maybe it was, as you have said earlier, the lights. Yep, absolutely. Ball gets lost in the lights here. Not an easy court to play on. Well, the reward's there for a Two good one. serve from Thur Serling. Took time and really placed that ball high on the side wall. Got a loose r return from Bador for his trouble. Get out to all. So Serling playing the drop volley that paid so Three great two. dividends earlier against David Lott, but not counting on Bador's enthusiasm to go and pick it up and he wasn't ready for the counter drop. See how often Sterling, uh, Sterling actually stands still and watches yeah. his shots. Absolutely. Um, you know, fundamental two. movement technique in squash requires you to move up with your shot, not after your shot. And you can see the gaps that are opening up on the court because he's playing and standing. I'd like to see Thur Serling hit that ball straight off the return of serve. The only problem is when he does that, he doesn't quite get his feet in the right position. Six, right, yeah, exactly, Chanel. You're talking about not getting that perpendicular uh, approach to the line you want the ball to travel on and trying to push the ball where you want it to go always results in miss hits and Seven, poor two. direction. And as you rightly said earlier on, oh. a little change in attitude yeah, and, and intensity from Tom Bador. Perhaps absolutely. not, you know, absolutely going for it 100%, but he certainly raised the temperature on the court. Oh, beautiful bow snick by Thur Serling. Ah, oh, that's going to be punished. Poor serve. Nice oh. hand skills from mm -hmm. Tom Bador. I don't often see him going for the sort of artistry type of shot, and that was very nice. A little delay Boys. in reaction there. Don't think he expected the ball to go straight. It's gone cross court most of the time. And there it is again, that Down. lovely backhand faded drop volley. Uh, not trying to hit the nick particularly, just trying to put it in the front corner with no pace. Ten and four. good court Ten coverage. Ball. And And Chanel, I think that speaks volumes about experienced players reading the play. Absolutely. Well, that gives uh, Thomas Dur six match balls now. Up, and, out, and a five, little delay ten, in that reaction time ball. again, just not quite moving into position after the serve. Oh, just not managing five, to get a racket on Bedour, it. And it's Thomas Bedour who closes it out. Four, three five, games five, to love. Five here in this men's 65 plus round of 16. Commiserations to Tour Serling. So nice to see him here representing Salt Lake. We'd love to see more Salt Lake players coming. Uh, Craig Bennett does such a great job at Squash Works. And uh, I encourage anybody who's going to go to Salt Lake for any reason, get in touch with Craig. He, you will find a great welcome. Meanwhile, you know, the British Columbia community has seen their champion go through and uh, we're excited to see Tom Bador later in the tournament. Well, that concludes our Masters matches of today and some very exciting stuff coming up next. It's the pro women's and men's semi-final here of the national championships. And there we see on court about to have a hit, Marina Stefanoni. So don't go too far. We've got lots more squash coming your way starting at five o'clock.
whether that's on right now. So it doesn't matter that it's on right now. Okay, so I can keep it on one mic. Okay. Hey, could you make sure that that is, I think it's supposed to be plugged in there, the microphone. Oh, there's like a little, one of these, one of these things, I'm not sure which. For U.S. Squash to fulfill our mission of increasing access, advancing sportsmanship, and achieving excellence, we need a home. A place to reshape what access and participation means in this country. A place to train future world champions. A place to change lives by bringing the entire squash community together. 
the opportunity for U.S. squash to return to the city of its founding 115 years later has presented itself and the Oral Inspector U.S. Squash Center will be this place and it will be our home. The largest squash facility in the nation, 18 singles courts and two doubles courts, ideally located on Drexel University's campus in the heart of Philadelphia's University City, the 65,000 square foot Specter Center will serve as the host site for dozens of major national and international competitions, showcasing the sport like never before. The high performance fitness and training spaces will allow our national coaches to offer world class year round programming support to our athletes from across the country as we pursue our Olympic ambitions and drive towards achieving our Team USA goal to be the world's best. Spectre Center will offer unparalleled access to squash by modeling broad-based community engagement. In partnering with Squash Smarts, Philadelphia's urban youth and education program, the Learning and Innovation Center will support kids in reaching their full potential academically, athletically, and in life, giving kids their best shot. The Specter Center will also be home to the U.S. Squash Hall of Fame, a dynamic, state-of-the-art, interactive experience honoring our game's rich history and individual achievements that will inspire future champions. Special exhibits on sportsmanship and character, our national teams, women in squash, urban squash, and squash doubles will all amplify the squash community's inclusiveness, all rooted in tradition and shared values ones that will be passed from player to player and from one generation to the next. We look forward to hosting you at the Arlen Specter U.S. Squash Center, where experiences, relationships, and values last a lifetime. Hello and welcome to the 2019 U.S. Women's Championships and SL Green U.S. Men's Championships hosted here at Squash and Fire in Washington, D.C. I'm Chanel Rasmus and with me, Richard Millman. Chanel, it's great to be here. We have a slew of world-class players to watch today. What can we expect? We absolutely do. Well, our first matchup is between Marina Stefanoni and Olivia blatchford Klein. Marina had a tough match yesterday against Leila Sedki, winning 3-2, and Olivia Blatchford beat the other Stefanoni, Lucy Stefanoni, 3-love. What can we expect to see? Well, you know, Marina recently lost in the National Junior Championships, but when you step down, sometimes it's hard to keep your focus. Today, I think we'll see her really step up, but her opponent, Olivia Blatchford Klein, has really become one of the world's great squash players and she isn't breaking down against even the top players in the world. So it'll be tough for Marina. Absolutely. Next up, we kick off the men's semi-final match between Christopher Gordon and Todd Harrity. Both players beat their opponents through love in that quarter-final match. What can we expect to see from them? Well, this is an interesting matchup. Chris Gordon, you could say, is the elder statesman now of US professional squash. And Todd Harrity, you could well say, is the class of the field, the way he's been playing just recently. What I think we'll see is Chris Gordon managing his very, very patient, fitness-oriented game against Todd Harrity, who's now shot-making at the front of the court with the best players in the world. I would say I would favor Todd, but don't count Chris out. Well, both players, former champions, with Christopher Gordon winning in 2013 and Todd Harrity in 15 and 16. Well, next up, it's my prediction for match of the day between Sabrina Sobi and Reham Sedki, both world-class players having beaten their opponents 3-love in the quarterfinal. Well, I think what we'll see here is the elegant gliding movement of Sabrina Sobi against the frightening raw power of Reham Sedki. I have to favour Sedki. She just has really come to the fore recently. Uh, and our last matchup of today, the semi-final between Andrew Douglas and Chris Hansen. The number three and number two seeds competing here. Chris Hansen, a former champion in 2017 and 2018. Well, I'm very excited about this match. I'm a little biased. I recruited Chris Hansen to St. Luke's School when he was 12. But you know, Andrew Douglas really has been one of our great class players from the junior game. Come through as a pro now. I think it's going to be very tight, but I have to favour Chris Hansen and his movement. 
Well, there you have the semi-final matchups of the 2019 national singles. We're going to hand it over to our MC of the night, Bill Buckingham. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first semi-final at the 2019 U.S. Women's Squash Championships. The first semi-final features an all-Connecticut matchup. Please welcome to the court from Darien, Connecticut, Marina Stefanoni. Her opponent is from Wilton, Connecticut. A warm welcome for Olivia Blatchford Klein. She won her first PSA tournament at the Bermuda Open. Her current world ranking is 88. Her highest world ranking was 69. Marina is one of the top juniors in the world and has been a six-time U.S. Junior National Champion and has won five U.S. Junior Opens. Three years ago, she became the youngest player in the history of the United States to win the under-19 title at just 13 years of age. Her opponent, Olivia Blackford, Klein, is one of the most distinguished U.S. women's players in history. Just 26 years old, she was born in Brooklyn, New York, and currently resides in Porchester. Her current world ranking is 19. She has five PSA titles. Olivia won this tournament back in 2017 and was also one of the highest decorated U.S. junior players in history. And she, as she was a, also a six-time junior champ and a two-time U.S. Open junior champion. Welcome to the 2019 U.S. Women's Championships and SL Green Men's Championships being hosted here at Squash on Fire in Washington, D.C. As we mentioned earlier, I'm Chanel Rasmus and with me, Richard Milman. Chanel, what an exciting evening in store. First matchup, we have these two world-class, and I really mean world-class Americans, Olivia Blatchford Klein and Marina Stefanoni. Absolutely, we are in for a real treat tonight. We just concluded the Masters event of day one, and here we are in the semi-finals between these two players. The first, it's Marina Stefanoni in the, the white and the red, USA from Darien, Connecticut. She's a three-time, as we heard earlier from Bill Buckingham, three-time USA member, three-time US junior champion, the youngest in history. And she's currently ranked, her highest world ranking is 69, and she beat Leila Sedki 3-2 in the match in the quarterfinals yesterday to secure her place here in this final. She's used to setting records, as we know, both at home and internationally. And she became the youngest player at age 13 to win the under-19 national title. So a world-class player in her own right. Talk a little bit about her game and her style of play, Richard. 
So Marina's movement is a tremendous asset. And I also believe that she is uh, something of a Time. volcano ready to explode. And I'm not sure if it's going to be here, but soon she's going to explode. Up until this point against the other top women's pros in the world, she hasn't taken command in the way that I believe that she one day will. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for volleys from her. I'm looking for her to stay in rallies for a long, long time. If that happens, then we could have an upset. Well, she's certainly going to need to do that if she has hopes of taking down the number one seed here this weekend, Olivia Blatchford Klein. And what an extraordinary player in her own right as well. She won this a couple of years ago, so she's looking to regain that title and take that back home. She has had the highest world ranking of number 12 just short of that top 10 and we're certainly hoping to see her back in there she's currently ranked 19th in the world so we're competing now at sort of opposite ends really of, of the world rankings olivia blatchard klein has now played on the pro tour for a number of years and has worked her way up marina stefanoni just having won her seconds. psa tight first psa title two two or three weeks ago in bermuda so you have a veteran against this really young up-and-coming junior and yet i say veteran but olivia blatchard klein is only 26 years old and you're right she herself is up and coming in a different echelon of the game and what I've been really excited about with Olivia Blatchford Klein recently is the evolution of her game this against the, the top players in the world she US always used to do really well until she got to the top Marina uh, five Stefanoni players to serve but more recently Olivia I've seen Blatchford her play some Klein rallies uh, at crucial best times of five where she games, hasn't caved off. in and where she's been giving these top players a really hard time well, we're getting started here. I'm excited for these matches coming up. And here we are at the start of our first semi-final between Olivia Blackford Klein and Marina Stefanoni. One love. So again, just going to want to see that confidence factor building, especially for Stefanoni. Well, Richard, we have said that Stephanie only needs to take the ball earlier, and she's come out now firing at those volleys. So exciting to see. She's already hit three volleys yeah. that I don't normally expect to see her play, and that's a great indicator of a, a change in attitude. Well, good Handout first one rally, off. just uh, working through the points, right, playing the ball, finding the height on that front wall. But it will be a tough task even sh if she plays her very best because the training that Olivia Blatchard Klein has put herself through Not would up. be tough on any human being. She really she works won. hard. I love the way she plays too. She's fierce, she's accurate. And she's just gone from strength to strength each year. It's been, it's been fun to watch her on the pro circuit. And not only is she very, very fit, out to but all. her stroke execution and her tightness, meaning when the ball is glued to the side wall, is quite exceptional. Down. I'll just forcing Three, the two. ball short. Again, the importance of the return of serve, just getting yourself into play. Well, obviously, these are the opening exchanges, and, you know, uh, Marina came out quite aggressively with those volleys which was mm -hmm. exciting to see but I expect the players to settle down a little bit and uh, try and find a game plan and work that game plan down we're seeing this the exchange of height right for two Olivia hitting below the service line Marina Stefanoni trying to get the ball a little bit higher on the front wall taking the pace off and that's what I think she does incredibly well it's she's able to manage the pace yeah I'd, I'd like to see her use those higher balls as a prelude to moving up and volleying the next ball hand um, out three four when she does that she's very very aggressive and attacking minded but when she uses the height and then doesn't follow up with a volley it can become a little sort of stayed and, and negative yes let three four just getting a racket on the ball let being awarded 
like to see her play a little wider on those cross courts. But I think she's doing a really good job of following up the shots that she plays short. Oh, good hold. Excellent retrieval from Blatchard Klein. Got up. Good rally there, but I will say that Hand you and out, I have five, commentated three. on Marina Stefanoni uh, a number of times. And I'm quite encouraged by how far up the court she's standing. She seems to be taking a more aggressive uh, front position on the court, and that's enabling her to get to more balls at the front of the court. And she needs to do that if she's going to challenge a world-class player like Olivia Blatchford-Klein. 6-3. But daylight here for Olivia, 6-3 up. And it's a pretty crucial time. If Marina's going to do something in this game, she has to put the brakes on, Klein, and establish herself. Thank you. Hand it's out a beautiful four, little trickle boast there. As you rightly say, she controls that pace very well, and she's really taken the pace off that ball, so there was nothing left to hit for Blatchford Klein. Oh, that's really nice stuff. And Blatchard Klein is quite happy being busy. She loves to be busy. Absolutely. And she's very aggressive. And so I don't think that's the pace that Marina will want to play. I think she'll want to float it a little bit and then occasionally suddenly sting her opponent. Hand out, 7-4. I love four. how deliberately... Blatchard Klein plays the ball and she's so deliberate with her racket preparation, her follow through, it's it's really great squash to watch and to learn from, from anyone watching. You see there, she gets her feet set up exactly perpendicular to where she wants to Eight hit it. Four. And, you know, fundamentals in squash, and by that I mean the basic techniques of both movement and racket work, are so important. You can see Olivia Blatchard Klein has really worked hard to perfect those. Down. Oh, just forcing Nine, the ball four. short. Too soon for my liking in this first game. Stefanoni was working in the beginning because it was catching Blatchard Klein off guard. She just needs to stay a little bit more patient in the back of the court. She has a beautiful short game. Delay that. Lovely little change up there from Blatchard Klein with her wrist. Oh, that's Not tight. such good technique that time from Blatchford oh, Klein. That's so smart. And you saw the loose Hand ball out, gave way five, to nine. a nice volley attack from Marina Stefanoni. I, I have detected when Blatchford Klein plays deep to Stefanoni's backhand, that Stefanoni is sometimes a little upright, and that makes it very difficult to get ball. under the ball and lift it. And we've seen a couple of occasions now where she's played that short ball from the back of the court where she maybe should have played long. I don't know if that's going to be a trend. Does that really well, Richard? Hand out six, Plays that ten. ball where it just Game dies ball. into the side wall first before touching the front wall. That seems to be a good game plan for Marina Stefanoni. Mm -hmm. When she manages to get Blatchford Klein to play a half length, that little weighted boast is wrong footing Blatchford Klein and bringing some success. Seven, so ten, only game ball. Still in it here. Still in it. Lovely tight ball on the side wall. And she managed to get that one long, even though it was Down. tucked underneath her. Eight, ten, game ball. Oh, she's keeping herself in this first game. What a Good great height. way. Very nice oh, rally excellent. here. Very nice rally. Oh, working the ball 11, all over. 
game Making to Blatchford Klein. Blatchford Klein leads but one game good to love. retrieval from both players in that first, and it's Olivia Blatchford Klein who manages to come up on top 11 8. As much as one can be encouraged by losing a game, I think Stefanoni should be encouraged Absolutely. there because that last rally demonstrated that she's prepared to go the extra mile. Um, she didn't win it, but she made Blatchford, Blatchford Klein really work. Well, we saw the superb short game being executed by Marina Stefanoni as well as Olivia Blatchford Klein. I would like to see Stefanoni just play it a little bit later in the rallies, extend those rallies, place the ball in the back of the court when you have the opening, one more time into the back, and then that front court becomes so much more effective. But I thought Olivia Blatchford Klein found her angles, found her corners, and when she was in charge, right, she made full use of those opportunities. Very important second game for both players. If Blatchford Klein can dominate uh, and get on top of Stefanoni, I think it'll be a three love to Blatchford 60 Klein. 60 seconds but if to play. can lay down the law and perhaps play the long game and really stretch Blatchford Klein out, then doubts may be sown in Blatchford Klein's mind. And I would love to see her win that second game, elongate the match. Um, I don't know what you think, but I think there's a chance for Stefanoni to make a breakthrough if the second game goes her way. Absolutely, and what an important first game that was to work out some of those kinks and figure out exactly where it is she needs to place the ball on that front wall to move Blatchford Klein into uncomfortable Blatchford situations. Klein so leads I think one the positivity that she needs to come out with all. in the second game is really important for her to take a good, solid approach moving forward. So I'm really excited to see Stefanoni is moving up with quite an assertive you know, body, piece of body language there. Two or three times she really charged forward to try and take the front position. And that suggests somebody that's on the warpath. Oh, just picks it up. Did not think that she even was gonna get a racket on that. Oh, that's just a great rally, Richard. Totally counted her Hand out in that rally. I thought Blatchard Klein had the right approach of hitting that straight, and Stefanoni, quick work getting to that. But again, you see a little bounce in the step when she moved forwards. This is not something that we've seen a lot of from her in the past, and it's very encouraging. Always remembering that she's playing one of the women that is at the top of the world's game here, so it's a tough ask. Hand out 2 1. Fundamental flaw there, not quite getting herself in position, ready to play that ball. The importance of bending your legs, Richard. Absolutely. Bending Mobility and dynamic movement, so important, and you cannot move Hand and flow with straight legs. Wow, oh, you can see that <laughs> out serve. Hate to see it. That's two balls in a row. Very good length there. Three balls in a row. Yep. Really, uh, Blashford Klein two. putting Stefanoni on the rack there. Those balls have to be half volleyed at the very least, if not volleyed. And if you let them run, then your options right in the back corner are very limited. Hard play by Stefanoni. A little bit guilty, Olivia Blatchford Klein there, of separating from the ball and getting beaten by the deception because she was not connected. Lost the thought was wrong shot selection, right? Put the ball in straight. Blatchford Klein going short way too early there. You can't do that against an athlete of the quality of Rena Stefanoni. So, you know, the, uh, the other danger for Blashford Klein, of course, is that she's expected to win this. Yeah, and it's absolutely. much easier to step up to beat people that are ranked above you than to stave off the willing attacks of people that are hungry to beat you from below. Hand out for all. You can see Blashford Klein talking to herself there, uh, not altogether happy with the way she's playing, so making demands on herself.
And again, Stefanoni early on to that volley. So exciting to see. She does use the boast a lot. And the problem with that, on, with this particular player, is that Blatchford Klein's setup on her backhand drop is gorgeous. Oh, that's a great shot. And out, five all. It's right there for her to take. She steps up, but looks to follow it up. So no plain sailing here for Blatchford Klein. And Stefanoni really putting her foot down and trying to stake a claim in this match. Down. A little closed racket Six face five. there from Blashford Klein, sending the ball into the tin. You saw her open up as she hit that shot. Uh, I think she's having a little bit of a sort of bout of nerves and conversation Stroke with herself to here. I don't think she. I don't think Seven she five. needs to go short that early. Uh, she's. It's almost as if she's going short desperately, and she certainly doesn't have yes, to. Her length and her straight game is solid enough to rely on. But, you know, the nerves of a big occasion can get through to even the best players in the world. Beautiful height there from Stefanoni. Completely took the volley away from Blatchford Klein. And great court coverage. Great She's still oh. moving well. But this is a great put away Hand from Blatchford six, Klein. Seven. Really got the width correct. Stefanoni still in the lead in this second game. A little bit too much use of the defensive boast from Stefanoni is getting her into trouble. I'm sure she's got the wrist skill to get the Seven ball high all. and straight from those situations. But she played the boast early in the rally and she was always on the defensive after that. 7-7. Seven, seven. Oh, good hold. Great deception. 8-7. So there again, the boast played at the wrong time by Stefanoni, setting Blatchford Klein up. I'd just like to see her stick with a straight ball for longer. Nice height. Very tight. Liking the patience from Stefanoni. It's just a poor quality shot put away by nine again, seven. The, in the previous rallies, we saw Blatchard left side short off something like that. There, she just worked it into the back once more. And successful game plan. Yeah, and you know the technique that Stefanoni had used up until that last shot was good, but then she opened up and dropped her wrist a little bit, and then we saw the pop out. There's a pop out there from Blatchard Klein. <laughs> Quality, Richard. 10 7 you can't game ball. Go wow. to that front back and corner with Blatchford Klein. Right that side. Frequently and expect to get dividends. She is beautiful with her touch and her setup. Well, game ball now for Olivia Blatchford Klein. Eleven oh, seven game to Blatchford Klein in the front of the court. Blatchford and Klein manages leads to two come games back to love. from being two or three points down to winning that eleven seven. Olivia Blatchford Klein now leads two games to love. So Stefanoni, for a moment, had established a little um, platform for herself, and uh, I think showed what there is to come in the future, but. I think, Chanel, I don't know if you agree, she's overusing that boast from three quarters of the way back, and Blatchford Klein is just too sharp onto the ball at the front of the court to continuously put her to the front of the court. Absolutely. I'd like to see Stefanoni challenge Blatchford Klein in the back of the court a little bit more than she has. And as you mentioned, Klein, at any point when that ball goes short, she is deadly. And it's been so beautiful to watch and see the rewards pay off. But again, another really positive game from Marina Stefanoni. And, and I'm not counting her out just yet. She might be seconds love two to down. Play. She's certainly not out of this match in my book. Well, at this point in time, it's a lot about the psychology of the two players 
if Marina Stefanoni can believe and again establish a bridgehead and if Olivia Blatchford Klein became a little nervous and played short then I could see room for growth for Stefanoni but if Blatchford Klein really dominates at the beginning and we see more of those boasts then I think it's going to be plain sailing. Well, we're about to start the third game here between Blatchard Klein and Stefanoni. Solid squash from Blatchard Klein. Really looking to see what Stefanoni can produce in this third game. I'd like to see her use the back corners. And then that deadly short game from Olivia Blatchard Klein. I think if she has more opportunities like that, she'll secure the three love victory. Blatchard Klein leads two love games to, see to love. Love to Stefanoni just boldly step up an extra yard up the court and say, I'm taking charge. I don't know if she can do it, but that's what I'd love to see her do. That's a great little and volley there. Love. This is what we need to see, but there's the pop out from Blatchford Klein, and you don't often see her open up and lose her technique, and that's what she did there. Of course, this glass court is very unforgiving if you don't get Shut good up. technique. Mm -hmm. Hand out. But again, one she's all. played a little boast from the back of the court and made to pay the penalty. Well, Klein sets up so well, too. Right? Every shot gets played from a similar position, so it's difficult to read and anticipate where she's going to hit the ball. That was more aggressive movement up the court that time. I'd just like to see her follow up a little bit oh, more. Oh, that is quality squash. Great volleys. Wow. Well, taking the ball so early, leaping across to take it in the air. That's the squash that we're seeing from Stefanoni. And she's 16 years old, Richard. And she's in on the volley early again, which is great. Maybe shouldn't have gone short on that ball. You know, sometimes when you Hand get out, the early volley, it will do more damage to take it to the back of the court and take the lungs out of your opponent. And with Blatchford Klein, if you go short too early, it turns into a counter-attack opportunity. Still, I love the fact that she's volleying. This is a big step forwards. Oh, just getting a racket on it. Brilliant width and length. Look at this ball slide down the wall. 3-2. That's a great shot. There is no substitute for excellent fundamentals. No. And there we saw it. 3-2. I have 3-2. This is the time to fish or cut bait. Stefanoni needs to move up and hunt the second and third intercept Four ball. Two. She's doing one intercept, but then she's kind of not getting onto the next ball enough to put pressure on a player of Blatchford Klein's class. Stroke to Stefanoni. And there we saw Hand a rare out. look, open-shouldered pull into the middle of the court from Blatchford Klein. Didn't quite do her brilliant fundamentals. And another beautiful top spin lob matched by Stefanoni. Well, the and there's the pop out. To Blatchford Klein, pop out, out watch the shoulders three. open up and that's why that ball has come out into the middle of the court. Well, to play tight from tight, as we've mentioned, a difficult task, and that's what separates the best from the good, so. There's nothing wrong with letting the shoulders rotate on a loose ball that you're playing in the middle of the court. Hand that was out, much better four, from Stephanie. She played really good length and then followed it up with a good quality short shot, not quite floating it into the court, but punching it into the front. Yep. A beautiful Hand drop volley you saw six, here. Four. Blatchford Klein maintaining her 90 degree angle right through the contact with the ball, not opening up. Oh, oh 
That's a great rally. <laughs> great rally. Seven Difficult four. position there for Stefanoni to volley Left. in. Balls down the middle of the court. Great wow, volley boast there, so and that's so quick on yeah. Stefanoni. This just shows us seven. the difference with Stefanoni when she hunts hungrily for those volleys, and she can really stretch people. And she's already a world-class player in her own right without that volley. Imagine what she'll be like when she starts aggressively hunting those volleys and taking the ball early. Oh, Blanchford Klein going Six, for a short seven. ball when Stefanoni was already short. A risky policy. I would have loved to have seen her play deep from that ball. 6 7. But again, Stefanoni's gone short. Good ability to get that straight. Just one too many quality shots from Hand out, eight, six. And it all started from Stefanoni volunteering a short ball on the backhand, which gave Blatchford Kine the opportunity to play the lob to Stefanoni's forehand, and then we saw the defensive boast. That's always trouble. Beautiful shot. Lovely touch. She gets Nine, her feet six. round this ball. And you can see her shoulders turn nicely to get the 90 degrees. Well, Blatchford Klein is happy to play any shot into the front of the court. Again, Ten look at this match touch ball. in the front of the court. Very difficult to deal with that. Oh, uh, that gives Blatchard Klein four match balls opportunity here to secure her place in the final of this national championship. Let's see if she can do it first time. She's done it. Game and the number one seed Klein. is safely Blatchford through Klein to the final tomorrow by just playing 11, eight, such 11, quality seven, squash, 11, Richard. Six. Simple game, working the back of the court, using those opportunities right in the middle. We're going to move Let over you know, to Bill Buckingham you know, and hear what Olivia has to say.
Well, Richard, we heard it there. A great athlete, great person, has done so much for the sport in the US, but also in the rest of the world. And quality squash here from both players. I thought Olivia came out firing right from the get-go. She worked the front of the court exceptionally well. And then some really positive squash from R Marina Stefanoni that we haven't really seen her ability to take that ball early, hunt down the volley, and I'm so impressed. Absolutely. You know, what's uh, the lasting memory for me is that volley boast that Marina Stefanoni stepped up the court and wrenched Olivia Blatchford Klein's body to the front right hand corner. For me, that was a little glimpse of Nirvana, and I think there's more of that to come. Um, overall, I was really encouraged by Stefanoni's volleying and just the little spring in her step as she was following up some of her straight shots. I would like to see her get rid of the desire to play the short drop from the back of the court from behind mm -hmm. um, Olivia Blatchford Klein. Uh, and also the frequency that she boasts when she could use her wrist to get straight. If she can cut those two out, uh, I think uh, exciting times right around the corner. And the other thing I wanted to just say is I'm really appreciative of Olivia Blatchford Klein's efforts to climb the mountain of world squash. And what I'm seeing when she's playing against these uh, top Egyptian players is she's now getting to fourth and fifth games and she's really on the cusp of making breaks through. Uh, instead of folding at crisis moments, she's beginning to break through. So she's, you know, finding her own nirvana at the moment. And I don't think we should think of her as a constant. She's still on the way up. Absolutely, and has a very exciting future ahead of her on the pro circuit. Both players do. The future of squash is so bright, and I'm so excited that we're able to witness that here. Well, that concludes the first semi-final of tonight. It's Olivia Blatchard Klein now secures her place in that final tomorrow, and she's patiently waiting to see who she'll meet. It's either Reham Sadki or Sabrina Sobi, but we'll have to wait until we find out who that finalist will be. So the next match starts at six o'clock between Todd Harrity and Chris Gordon, so don't go too far.
evening, ladies and gentlemen, and we are ready for our first men's semifinal here at the 2019 SL Green U.S. Men's Squash Championships. Our first semifinal features a battle of two former U.S. champions. Please welcome to the court from New York City, Chris Gordon. His opponent is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Please give a warm welcome to Todd Parody. and welcome to the 2019 SL Green US Men's Championships here at Squash on Fire. We're just outside the court. I'm Chanel Rasmus with me, Richard Melman. What an exciting match it's been between Marina Stefanoni and Olivia Blatchett Klein. Both players, just clinical squash, great, great effort by both players and Olivia Blatchett Klein securing her place in that final. Today we have two former US champions. It's Chris Gordon and Todd Harrity. Richard, what can we expect to see from a matchup like this today? Well, this is a very interesting match that we've got coming up. Um, Todd Harrity, former top collegiate player who made the jump from the collegiate game uh, into the professional game. I've really watched his career with the interest. I, I watched him play in a US Open against Olivia Blatchford Klein's husband, Alan Klein, a few years ago. He had an outstanding first game, all kinds of shots. And then in the second game, he was taken to task. And by the third game, he could hardly move. <laughs> he has changed so much in so many ways since that day. He always had incredible talent. But now he has the maturity and tenacity of a real hardened touring pro. And just lately, he's been taking even the best players in the world to task with games taken off players in the world's top 10. His shot making is as it always was, but now his uh, tenacity and his ability to deal with long, severe rallies is quite extraordinary. And his mental focus is one of his great assets. On the other hand, we've got Chris Gordon, who is a testament to his own patience, hard work, and that of his two main coaches, the great Half David time. Pearson um, from England, friend of mine, former coach of Nick Matthew, and here in the United States, his great coach and friend, Richard Chin. And for many, many years now, Chris has been one of the world's great players it's just a wonderful matchup. Well, it's certainly going to be an exciting matchup between these two players. Christopher Gordon is the most decorated Team US player, making his first appearance on the men's team in 2005, where he was just 16 years of age. So he's represented the red, white, and blue 10 times. He's had a highest world ranking of 44, and he's currently ranked 89th in the world. And talk about two world-class players, right? We have Todd Harrity, of course, who's had a highest world ranking and is currently ranked 44th. So as you've mentioned, he's gone up. And we, I saw him play at the Tournament of Champions in January where he had a superb first round victory on home soil and the crowd was eating it up. It was wonderful to see. So here we have two decorated players, not only in the US, but also in the rest of the world. So uh, Chris Gordon, we see there in the white shorts and the navy jacket. He played against Atticus Kelly yesterday and won that fairly comfortably, three love. So he'll be have fresh legs today moving on into this semi-final. And then Todd Harrity played against Harrison Gill and beat him three love. So both players had fairly comfortable uh, matches leading into the semi-final. Ha you have to think that that plays a role here. I do. Um, I think 
the contrasting styles we're going to see. Um, Chris Gordon um, tends to play a very athletic, um, dour, patient game. Uh, he has got shots. You know, he can take that drop volley in straight, and he chops in a nice straight drop shot from time to time. Um, but time. he is more about the physical side of the game. Um, his opponent, Todd Harity, really has an extraordinary ability to take the ball in short. His deception has improved a great deal. His pace variation has improved a great deal. So as much as I would hope that it would be a, a very close match, I do feel that the way Todd Harity has been playing lately, the advantage must be given to him. Absolutely, and what an exciting career he's had too. He played at Princeton, an Ivy League school, and then going from there into the pro circuit. And we've seen a number of players coming through the college circuit, right? Working their way through that seconds. top level squash. And after this match, we see two college level Ivy League players battling it out again. So a testament to US squash growing at all these various levels. Play will start yep. in 15 no, very seconds. Exciting. Um, and I would look for quite a tough first few rallies. Um, I may be wrong, but I, I would expect to see at least one rally in the SL 30 Green to 50 US shot range uh, in this Pro first semifinal. few minutes. Well, we're about Todd to Harry kick off serve. our second semi-final, first one receive. in the men's, and we're waiting to Best see which player names. will secure their place in this final. Love all. It's Todd Harrity to serve. He's up against Chris Gordon in the all-white to receive. Down. Not quite 50 shots, Richard, One but he's definitely on heading towards that direction of just staying consistent, playing straight down the line. Yeah, the uh, the back wall nick put paid to the 30 <laughs> to 50 shots, but I think the intent was there. I think we all saw that both of these players are ready to set out their stool, and it's not going to be a cheap win at any price. Down. A beautiful, tight, soft, death one drop off, there from off. Chris Gordon right on the side wall. Shows the importance of tightness. Stroke to Harity. Great view there, Hand Chanel, out. of that Two setup one. from Todd Harity. And it really exacted a punishment from Chris Gordon who was stretched oh that's a beautiful touch that's hand out wait against the wall there Absolutely. how much you can do with that quite interesting over the last few years as the game of squash has evolved at the top level We've seen the incidents of right-handed players Hello. using the left foot to reach for the ball on the backhand side. And out, three, and you see two. Todd Harity is a very good exponent of this. Uh, a lot of players prefer to use the right foot, but uh, Harity has become very poised and balanced with that skill. Well, players not quite using the height on the front wall. Balls are landing short. Right there by the service box. That's not the quality you can play at this high level without getting into a lot of trouble. But the retrieving skills of these players are quite extraordinary. You saw Gordon getting a ball back that most of the crowd mm -hmm. thought was ungettable. And look at the touch on this. Wow. Oh, well, look at the body Four position two. as well, right? It's <laughs> looks rather uncomfortable playing a shot from that angle.
Again, what I admired from Olivia Blatchard Klein that we saw earlier was her deliberate racket preparation and uh, and shot execution. And I'm seeing similar traits in Todd oh. Harity as well here in just the first game. Right box, 5-2. Yeah. Already Harity is beginning to move Chris Gordon in severe wrenching fashion to all parts of the court and uh, this is the mark of a world-class pro who's very quick onto the ball his deception is painful to the opponent without actually taking risks himself it's important to remember of course that you know Chris Gordon has been up into the top 50 in the world so He's not going to be a walkover by any stretch of the imagination. Absolutely not. Not counting any of these players out. Well, here we're seeing those extended rallies that you were mentioning earlier, Richard. It's just which player can maintain quality for longer. And at this point in time, a lot of what's going on is they're asking each other the question, have you got the heart for mm -hmm. this? Have you got what it takes to stay with me and come on the journey yes, that I'm prepared to go on myself? Right box, 5-2. Well, that first game is such a great opportunity for players to suss each other out. And here in this instance, these two players have met numbers of times, right? So there's, they know each other's games. What can they do differently that they haven't quite expected or seen yet? So Gordon is definitely more of the uh, absorption uh, type of squash player. He'll retrieve, and even when the opponent opponent's thinks that prevented. he's won the point, he'll Six, get in there and poke the ball back a few more times, whereas Harity is more all-out warfare. He's got this incredible attacking armament, and uh, he can do stuff to the front of the court that will really hurt his opponent. Oh, just Down. having to work so hard. Hand out. You see there, Three, six. you know, uh, reasonably you might have thought that Gordon was beaten, but he stuck out a leg and poked in that little soft <laughs> boast, and he ends up winning that point. And that's one of the difficult things with absorption-style players is that you don't yes, think let. that they're doing much to you but Three, they're just six. taking the ball back one more time and eventually you become frustrated. Well, I would like to see Gordon play through that ball. I think he would have caught Harity off guard if he played it straight down the line instead of asking for the let. Out. And there we see Gordon fully extended, just not able Hand to out. control the ball sufficiently, Seven, and just pushing it out. But Todd Harity is really becoming an incredible exponent of this take no prisoners type of squash. It's all out warfare. Any little opening, he's after that attack. Down. Slightly overstretched Hand here. Hand out. Four and seven. Uh, can't quite stabilize to transfer his weight into the shot. Well, that's what we've often spoken about that you've addressed a lot, Richard, is is playing a ball to work your opponent into an uncomfortable position, not to play the winner or to win the point outright. So uh, there was a little element of that. Yeah, I think sometimes people get confused when we say not to play the winner outright. You know, the expectation, especially with athletes like this on a small restricted surface, is that they are going to get every ball back. Mm -hmm. So when you take the ball in, you certainly attack, but with the expectation that the ball is coming back. When somebody thinks that they're going to try and play a winner, they're making an assumption about the opponent's inability to get the ball back that actually is going to put them in a bad position because if you don't expect the ball to come back, you don't move to cover and defend the next shot. So 
yes, Todd Harity is a real attacker of the ball, but we don't want him to try and play winners because oh. winners make assumptions about the opponent's ability to stay in the game. Absolutely, and we saw some variation and in out. pace there, just Eight getting himself four. back into the rallies and working Chris Gordon into all corners of the court, setting that up beautifully for himself. I'm really impressed, though, by the coverage, court coverage of Chris Gordon. You're absolutely right. He is this almost, you know, spider of the court. He, you know, or daddy long legs of the court. And I don't <laughs> wish to be rude, but it's yeah. very difficult to extend him to a yeah. point where he can't get to that ball. And he then absorbs Hand the out. pressure and then Five, by absorbing eight. the pressure, the opponent gets frustrated. And you see there, Harity makes the error. Harity was in charge. Gordon wins the point. Again, Harity very early on to these tight drops yes, and uh, creating situations which five. are almost impossible to defend. 5-8. Right box. Well, that ball awarded that, Richard. What's your thought? Well, I feel as though Chris Gordon played a loose ball and he's been rewarded for a loose ball, which is the wrong way around. It may have been a bit of a, a reach, but if Harity had hit it, I think he could have hit Gordon on the way to the front wall. So this is a pretty crucial point in the match. Oh, that's just inches above the 10. And again, Harity absolutely on fire attacking some of those volleys. And Gordon, very composed, just pushing that ball back time after time. If he has to really extend, he does. But in the end, it's just too much. Look at the quality of this setup, the slice on the side of the ball, Hand out. bringing the ball into Nine the side. Five. Well, it was a good idea by Christopher Gordon, right? Use height in a defensive situation, and that's also such an important thing for, for players to learn is attack versus defense, right? Using height to your advantage is a really important aspect of the game, and yes, definitely the right intentions there from Gordon, Nine just not five. enough height. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I would maybe say under extreme pressure, try not to play high and cross court. Um, you know, different schools of thought, but... I just don't like to see the player play cross-court under pressure. I'd mm -hmm. like him to play straight under pressure. If you're there early, yes, you can play the cross-court because you're not under pressure. But under pressure, that straight ball makes the opponent move from the control center of the court. Down. Uh, once again, look at the quality of the width here. You see the little bit of action. Harity put on the side of the ball that's kept the ball clinging to the side wall. Almost impossible to play. So, a game ball here for Todd Harity. Down. So there Hand where out. Harity was required Six, to ten, extend and put, put it pick the ball up like Daddy Longlegs didn't quite have the reach that Gordon has. I think we're starting a new nickname here for Chris Gordon. I'm not sure he'd be very impressed with Daddy Longlegs, but uh, it's uh, meant in the greatest possible complimentary manner. Look at that backhand topspin down well, the wall. Well, there's the height, right? That's Beautiful. offensive down the line. And again, Harity playing a Tremendous shot there. Not sure if that was a carry or not by Gordon. But Gordon returning with interest. His Everything. own Everything. Wow. That oh. oh. <laughs> Dramatic shot. I think Go uh, I'll, I'll Harity may good. be questioning whether that was a double pick up. 7-10. Game ball. Um, the referee is gone with Christopher Gordon on this one. Again, so that court coverage, Richard, gets to 
everything yeah. just when you're about to count him out and get a racket on it. Yes, let. 7 10, game ball. Well, the strength that that requires to, to be able to recover off that shot. We saw earlier, we were watching some of the Masters play, right? And that just the strength and the ability to get out of your shot is so important as well. And we see both players playing off the left leg when they take the ball early on the backhand. Not up. Wow. It's finding the nick in that front right corner. 8 10, going 10 for game it. ball. So right now, Christoph Gordon has quietened Todd Harity down a little bit. It's the first time in the match he hasn't been quite so much of a take no prisoners kind of player. And he's having to earn everything he's Stroke getting Gordon. now. Ooh, not sure if Christopher Gordon went for the Nine, ball ten, or the player game here. ball. Oh, I think I agree with that call, Richard. I think it's a looser ball than Harity was anticipating to hit. Chris Gordon really coming back into this game extremely well. Wow, he's making uh, Harity have to work so hard. And the difference here Ten too all, is he's a being player must win by two points. In the first half of this first game, we saw Harity the one that was pushing Gordon to the front of the court with quality. And this time, it's Gordon managing to tie it up now 10 all in this first play it's win by two that's often the way absorption players play they suck up the strength of the opponent Down. and then when they sense a weakness they ferociously turn the table and out attack. 11 10 I remember Jan game was like that and i can remember one famous match chris robertson now coaching in hong kong and formerly with england and wales out jansha jansha doing exactly that <laughs> But the advantage is swung back to Harity. But again, those long legs of Chris Gordon retrieving a seemingly irretrievable ball. not getting enough width on that ball and he gets a racket on it oh Thank you. Thank you. Richard <laughs> tremendous, play. tremendous play tremendous play so game to what Herity. a great first Herity game one game to live that um, was quality Richard pure quality and we wouldn't expect anything less from two world-class players and we saw there Harity in that first half of this first game he was in full control he was taking the ball early he was moving Gordon all around the court playing really tight squash and then towards the second half the momentum shifted and we saw Gordon as you mentioned the absorbing factor but now also that attacking factor and the quality increased yeah so I so agree you know Harity at the beginning was like some you know Genghis Khan type of Mongol attacker just all out attack all mm -hmm. the time never giving any ground away but you saw and I, and I don't want to sound disparaging but you saw the daddy long legs um, which I believe is a kind of spider weave a little yep. web and almost entangle the Mongol invader into his own type of game slowed him down but in the end of course Harity's avenging attack came through and you saw that incredible touch and control and the backhand drop volleys which even Chris Gordon couldn't pick up absolutely and I'd like to see Chris Gordon step into this second game with the momentum he gained towards the second half of that first game I think if he can come out firing and increasing the quality right from the get-go he has an opportunity to win this second game and do some real damage here in this matchup I agree but I think what would have to happen for that to happen is he needs to put together a gut-ripping rally of 50 to 100 shots to take the sting out of this incredible attacking play from Harity. Unless he actually deadens the blows, I think he's going to find it difficult to progress against this world-class player. Harity. 
Parity leads one game to love. Well, here we are at the start of the second. Todd Hardy currently leads love one game to love and a very close first game battle, 12-10. Down. Well, it's hand out. He's attacking One love. very soon, and that is a risky factor. You saw when he hit that attacking drop volley, he didn't actually move off the ball. He was static, and if you don't use your legs, you tend to lose your balance, and it's easy to put the ball into the tin. That one, he moved off the ball as he hit it. But Christopher Gordon can't afford to be playing loose and short nope. against a warrior like this. No, Hand not out, with someone with, that has hands like Todd Hardy. Puts the ball into the front of the court so sharply. So there's the use of height from Gordon and from Harity. It's a little bit of patience there. I'm not sure that Hardy really wants to let those rallies descend into those slower, methodical ball, up and down the wall type of rallies. That's not in his interest. He wants the fast cut and thrust that he plays so well. Beautiful lob. No racket prep there from Christopher Gordon. He ended up poking that ball back. Haven't seen much racket prep from him though, Richard. I, I want to comment a little bit on his swing. It's a shortened swing. It is. If he's got time, he does well. But when he's under pressure, he tends to have less shot choices. But he's got oh, parity uh, on the run here. Well, that might be the run chain rally that you were talking about, right? Working parity all over the court Hand and out, then punishing him two, in the one. front. I wouldn't be surprised if the game plan that Richard Chin and Christopher Gordon are putting together here has a lot to do with trying to win Todd Harity, because that's the only way that you're going to stop him from playing these amazing attacking shots, especially the volleys. And that is not going Hand to take the wind out of Todd Harity. All. That's a guess and a wrong guess at that. Out. Hand out. 3-2. But uh, I, I don't think even one long rally is going to be enough to damage Todd Harity. He has matured into one of the very best players in the world. And there isn't much that he hasn't seen so far. So much so, in a similar way to Olivia Leblatch with yes, Klein, he's beginning to knock on the Three, door of two. his world's top 20 players and understand what's required at those crucial moments in those matches. Ah, oh, just reaching over and punishing that Hand to the front out. of the court. Three all. Loves to go short and does it so well. I have a feeling that uh, the volley police are gonna be out of luck <laughs> finding a criminal in this match because these boys love to volley. And there's not many boy, balls that they don't volley that they possibly can. Well, that's also, to me, Richard, just an indication that they are world-class players, right? You don't get to that level on the professional circuit without being good or taking the ball early. You'll get punished for it. The only balls that they're not volleying at the moment are the balls that are so tight that it would be a risk. Well, Left lucky box, bounce. Four, or three. Just actually going for the front wall, Nick. Well, I'm not sure if that was an Australian boast, boast or a lucky shot, but it worked well. <laughs> Aussie boast, for those people that aren't sure what I'm talking about, is a hard boast Down. driven into the side wall, ricocheting very, very fast Hand around out the front wall. For all. Similar to a trickle boast, but played with real pace. So even Stephen here at four all. Yes, let. That's so tight. Would like to see him make more effort to get to the ball. Yeah, I understand Four Chris off. Gordon's concern, though, because Harity did watch his own shot for a long time and was a little late coming off it. So, you know, the combination of 
Gordon not going directly to the ball and Harity being late led to a little ball. traffic ball. issue. Ball is good. Beautiful touch. Hand out, 5-4. Thank you. Great sportsmanship. Yes, let. Absolutely, not. yeah. Love seeing that. For such all. great athletes and doing such, I mean, I'm so, I, I love, love seeing that. Down. Not my favorite style here, but he's Five, taken the four. ball early and he's pushed the ball really tight and low. You mean you don't like seeing someone facing the front wall and hitting a volley drop? Strangely not. <laughs> but it was effective on this occasion. Down. Hand here out. we see him Five not off. quite able to stabilize before he hit the shot. He's making contact with the ball as he's arriving and so there's confusion in the message down. and the ball went down. Hand out. 6-5. So a little nervousness on both players' part at the beginning of this second game. Understandable too though, Richard. Lots at stake here. Both players hungry for another national title. Oh, just beautiful touch Shot. here. That ball a little short from Gordon. Just Hand feeding out. the yeah. flames Six of all. the out and out attack from Todd Harity. So I have a feeling this is a pretty crucial time. I think Gordon needs to extend a rally and get the ball no, to no. the back oh, of the court. Thank you. And I think if he starts playing too much short, that he's going to get into six. trouble. He's not in a position to trade front court shots for a long time with Harity. He needs to extend those rallies more. Yes, let. Yeah, a little traffic issue. Harity staying there for quite a long time after he's seven hit it, six, watching his own shot rather than getting in position for the next shot. But Chanel, it seems Eight, that six. Todd right Harity box. owns the front of the court mm -hmm. and uh, it's not somewhere that is advisable for Chris Gordon to take the game to. Well, I haven't seen any of them control the back of the court. And I'd like to see what happens if Chris Gordon takes charge of the back. You, know, you can see it's pretty ugly when it goes to the front of the court. You're right, you're right in the swing. Setup is just Left box, beautifully gilded. Nine six, classic style, and he just has such beautiful touch. So I feel this slipping away from Christopher Gordon a little bit here. I'd really like to see him have put a 10, 60, six, 70 short rally ball. in somewhere, right and he's really played into Harity's hands by taking the ball to the front of the court. Absolutely, and that gives Todd Harity the game ball to go up two love Down. now. And 11 he only needs to one of those. Harity leads to two take games the to love. game to two love. That's a great lead and mental advantage for him now as he moves on into the third, hoping to secure his place in the final tomorrow. And I was really hoping that Christopher Gordon was going to come out in the second game taking control and attacking first but attacking smart and we saw Todd Harity do the, that exact game plan right he's so strong in the front of the court and Gordon played right into his hands on those occasions yeah um, it seems to me like this second game was a, a bit of a momentum shift uh, I know that Harity won the first game but it was pretty even there and I was looking for Gordon to really extend the rallies and dominate by attacking to the back of the court and move up the court and volley and keep his opponent behind him. But he's offered him the front of the court and really that is ha ter Harity's territory. Um, he's just got such a wonderful range of attacking shots and he just really does take no prisoners at the front of the court. 
Well, this is such a dangerous position for Gordon to be in as well because he certainly knows that at any point in time when the ball lands short, it's going to be attacked into the front of the court. So there's no room for error right now. Absolutely not. And the other thing is, if you don't play the ball on the sidewall, Todd Harity's volley drop, volley attack, volley change of direction, they are gut-wrenching shots and nobody can withstand that for long. So mm -hmm. you've got to get Harity to the back of the court or it's going to be see you later. Exactly. So I would really like to see Christopher Gordon step out into this third game ready for those extended rallies to just play good quality squash down the line seconds. into the back of the court and see if he can do any damage to Todd Harity's game from back there. I agree. I think he also has to get up the court and volley to keep Harity back. Whoever starts taking control with the volley is going to be in charge of this game. Harity leads two games to love. Well, Christopher Gordon certainly has a mountain to climb and love all. Todd Harity is certainly seeing a glimmer of what's to come for his final tomorrow. So interesting to see how both those players handle different kinds of pressure right now. I feel as though Harity has learned over the last couple of years how to nail the coffin lid shut. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he Hand out, makes this one a love. very, very tough game for Gordon. Having said that, Gordon has a reputation for grim determination, and so maybe he can cheat death. Mm -hmm. Stroke to Harity. Again, Again, one uh, loose hand ball, out, right? one loose one ball, all. ball gets placed into the front of the court, deadly. Yeah. Yes, let. Well, Richard, that's one better all. quality in the back of the court. That's the, we have. We didn't see one shot be put placed short, which might be the strategy here. For I Gordon. agree. I think he's got to keep it long, <coughs> and he's got to keep it long for quite a long time until he sees evidence that Todd Harity is prepared to make an error and lose patience. But you know, even there, it's hard to see where he's going to manage to win because Harity has learned how to stay in those kinds of rallies in a different way to the player that he was a few years ago. But there again, we see that immediate drop volley from it's Harity. Like right box, one all. Loose ball from Harity. First time I've seen him play under pressure cross court. Um, as I said earlier, playing cross court under pressure, never a good move. You're not ready to cover whatever the attack the opponent produces from that. Nice height. Out. Oh, right idea. We're seeing Two, a change one. here from Gordon, using the height, slowing down. But I really feel that Harity smells blood here, and his volleying from the halfway line is like a swordsman's, swordsman's rapier into your belly. He just rips your guts open. <laughs> Quite, a, quite an image to place in our heads, Richard. Well, if you can imagine that beautiful white yes, linen like. shirt of the opponent in a sword fight box, suddenly two flaming one. with red blood, that's what I feel as though his volleys do to us. Down. Well, there's the height that you talked about a few minutes ago. Hand out. Paying dividends all. because instead of the swordsman's rapier going into the belly, he's fallen over and lost his balance and lost control of the ball. Oh, oh. that's punishing. Hand out. Three, two. Oh. And panache that he delivered that with. Perfect setup and feel with the fingers just caressing that ball into the front corner. Oh. Yeah. 
A little bit of a rugby match. Yes, sir. But actually, that was well played by Gordon. I'm sorry that Harity fell over, but yeah. I love the early volley. That was a really good counter punch from Gordon. He's hanging on here at the beginning of this game. You know, Harity would have loved to have seen him roll over and die, but he's not doing it. He's hanging on. Thank you. 3 2. Well, there we see you just clipping the foot of Gordon. Yeah, we've definitely seen a change in tactics from Gordon. Mm -hmm. He's not going out. short so early. And there he gets the mistake, as I Hand said out. earlier. Three That's all. what he wants to see. He wants to keep probing to the back of the court until he sees the error from Todd Harity. But we haven't seen many errors, though, Richard. That's the thing. It, it, it's you're waiting for an error from someone that's been clinical this entire match. He got out of trouble there. You almost got into trouble again because he's given Harity the chance to attack with that amazing clinical, as you call it, volley. Now he's under pressure here. Wow. So even the long legs couldn't rescue him from that situation. Hand out, 4-3. So just sensing a little um, movement deficiency in Gordon. Maybe the wrenching that he's been subjected to from Harity is beginning to pay a price. Again, there it is. Wow, it's that immediately when a, a, a shot pops out, Five, three. Harity is on that and punishes it. Sticking a dagger through Gordon's stomach, as you'd Absolutely. like to say. But the only, the only difference is I, I feel as though that uh, Harity in the days of swordsmanship would have the most fine, precise rapier that he would wield with panache and skill. The dagger is a little too much of a crude weapon <laughs> for this clinician. Wow, what that's a nice <laughs> little bow. So nice. Hand out, four five. Wow, I'm still trying to figure out how he got got his body around to play a shot like that. Nice use of the wrist. Of course, we have to remember that sometimes human beings are at their most dangerous when they're on the brink of death. And I, that's why I think Harity has become Hand such out, a great professional. Six, because I four. think in the old days, he may have been susceptible in situations to a comeback. But I feel as though he can really nail the coffin shot these days. And that's a level of maturity and fitness and polish and practice it's very rare. Well, the quality that he's able to produce time and time again is pure practice. And that consistency just comes from hours on court. What is called in other sports the hard yards of squash. Those hours and hours and hours on court. Oh, good height. Beautiful Down. shot. Wow, he's making Gordon work so hard back and forth. And Seven, the variation four. in pace, I am loving. Yeah, absolutely. Twisting and turning and ripping and hurting. 
Yes, Let. Well, that's a little, that's a possible Didn't stroke. Didn't quite have a line yeah. to the ball. He hasn't moved off that ball. Left he box, stayed there quite a long time. You see that? No, oh, they've given a let. I'm quite surprised about that because Gordon was there. But I feel as though it may be slipping away here for Christopher Gordon. And no surprise, you know, even though he's a world-class player, 89 in the world, you're looking at somebody who's coming to the very peak of their career at 44, who is moving up from 44, yes, I like. suspect. Absolutely. Well, same, same situation. Shot, he getting did getting not quite trouble. have a direct line to the ball. He would have made. That he would have arrived. A little tighter. I think maybe Seven, we four. could have expected Christopher Gordon to go and get that one, but I think he's gotten away with a let. And our own Richard Wade, he's doing a director great of job. national programs and certifications, coming on to uh, clean up the court for the boys. Seven four. Well, seven four now Left for box. Todd Harrity. It's getting a few steps closer to that final. And it's Christopher Gordon who's just hanging on right now. Down. Again, the quality is just not consistent from Christopher Gordon. Look and at it's that being fade from eight yeah, four. Sorry, beg your pardon. You're yeah. absolutely right. And the fade from uh, Todd Harity just gliding into the sidewall exactly at the point that Christopher Gordon's trying to hit. Incredible skill. Yeah, <laughs> one too many shots. Kill me now. 9-4. Done. Oh, I just tried to squeeze that off the side wall. Hand out. Five, nine. Again, there's a good fade from Christopher Gordon this time. Such a useful skill, the ability to fade the ball requires a great knowledge of where your opponent is and exactly what angle to play that ball at. Oh my goodness. Again, it's a loose ball. Oh. Well. Oh, Christopher Goodwin, I think, may have a little cramp. I'm not sure. Either cramp or a little muscle tweak. Well, certainly hope it's nothing too serious. I think it looks like it a, little like a little cramp, didn't it? Yeah, I don't think they make contact there, Richard, from no. that replay. It doesn't look like ball. it. Well, here we are at match ball. And I think the cramp yeah, is really cramping hurting. and he's hurting. Oh, he's doing everything he can to stay five, in that rally. Worked left. hard, worked really hard against Todd Harrity. 12, and 10, 11, 6, have to 11, give five. credit to Todd Harrity as well as his opponent, Christopher Gordon. But we're going to hand over to Bill Buckingham now, who's going to have an interview Ladies with Todd Harrity. Ladies and gentlemen, your first men's finalist, Todd Harrity.
Congratulations, Todd. You know Chris very well, your national team teammates. What does it take to play somebody whose game you know so well and he knows your game so well to come through, win in three games, and move on? Uh, yeah, it's a, little, it's a little hard because, yeah, obviously we've known each other for years, played practice, played matches and stuff, so it's, and it can be mentally a challenge to play a friend, kind of. But, um, you know, obviously on court, you just kind of have to put that all aside and just watch the ball and nothing else. And um, that's what I tried to do tonight. You beat Chris in the 2015 final to win your first U.S. championship. You won again in 2016. The last two years, you've been stopped in the semifinals, and now you are back for the first time since 16, back in the U.S. men's final. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. It feels good to, you know, be in the final again. It's been, you know, yeah, two years or th yeah, since I've been here. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was ages ago. Last time I played Gordo in, in the final, I was kind of so young, and it was so exciting. I remember it um, in, uh, at UVA when, when we played. So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a good match tomorrow, whichever way it goes. And just, just want to try and enjoy it and play well and just whatever happens, happens. So let's talk about tomorrow night's match moment for a moment. Andrew Douglas, who stopped you the last two years, two years ago in a 96-minute marathon match, or Christopher Hansen. Let's forecast that match for us. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, who, uh, you know, I, anything can happen, and I think it's going to be, uh, you know, a great match. They're both um, really good. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, Andrew Douglas, I've uh, struggled against and um yeah and actually yeah chris hansen beat me last time he played as well so uh, so yeah i guess either way i'm gonna have some work to do tomorrow right. but uh, yeah congratulations we look forward to seeing you here tomorrow night in the finals ladies and gentlemen a big round of applause for todd harity i meant i meant to forecast your match against them tomorrow not that match i wouldn't ask you to call that okay. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for the second women's semifinal here at the 2019 U.S. Women's Squash Championship. Please welcome to the court from Seacliff, New York, Sabrina Sobe. Her opponent is from Seattle, Washington. A warm welcome for Reham Setki. Here we have our second last semi-final of the 2019 US Women's Championships here at Squash on Fire. It's been an excellent display of squash so far with one more player hoping to secure their place in the final tomorrow where they'll meet Olivia Blatchford Klein who already secured her place by beating Marina Stefanoni three games to love. I'm Chanel Rasmus with me, Richard Millman. If you've been with us the entire weekend and of course this evening, thank you, I guess is what we should be saying. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Richard, we now have two, you've been talking about world-class squash this entire day. We now have two top world-class players competing against each other, Sabrina Sobi and Reham Setki. So Sabrina Sobi, younger sister of Amanda Sobi, um, we're getting photobombed here. <laughs> oh, um, <well. laughs> 
But uh, in my mind, one of the most elegant, flowing young squash players that we have here in the United States. Full range of shots. Um, plays the classic game. Uh, her father, Khaled Sobi, beautiful player himself, has obviously helped teach her. Um, and I have often said to you that I'm a great believer in controlling pace and making sure you give yourself enough time to get into position. That's what Sabrina Sobi does. Oh, her yeah. opponent, Claire on Cunha. the other hand, does not. Riem Se Setki brutalizes the ball. Absolutely. And she does it in such a fearsome manner that I wonder that the ball doesn't actually break in half more often. I'm surprised there's not a dent in the front wall of this court by the end of a match that Reham Sedki plays. And yet she controls it so well and the ball lands. And I've seen her play now a number of years. We overlapped for one year in college. She plays at UPenn. And so I've seen her come through the years and really just generate so much pace, but it's also surprisingly very accurate in her style. Yes, if it wasn't, she'd really be in trouble. Um, so I'm looking for a match where Sabrina tries to feed off of Riem's pace and twists and turns her around the court using height, deception, and her own beautiful flowing movement. Riem does have a very unusual stroke style and it creates problems for her if somebody is accurate to the back corners. She finds it difficult to get the ball out straight. But unless it's precise, that never becomes a problem for her. And Sabrina herself, you know, she's a developing world class squash player. So green you know, I'd like to see her racket preparation up much Sabrina earlier. Serve, um, sometimes Sedki she leaves the racket on the floor games. almost until the ball, ball bounces. And that's going to limit her ability to place the ball. Well, I'm definitely excited for this matchup. These two players have played against each other a number of times. They were in the same junior class, that same now in college. They were both seniors. They play each other all throughout their four years. And now we have them here competing in the semifinals. Sabrina Sobi, there we see in the USA up against Reham Sedki yeah. in the green shirt and white skirt. No, Just a little bit about Reham Sedki. She's from Seattle, a four-time team USA member, US college champion, and three-time college All-American. American. She went to the University of Pennsylvania, which is currently a senior. She's had a highest world ranking of 54 and currently ranked 57th in the world. So that's the world class she that's loves. coming out there. And as we mentioned earlier, Sabrina Sobi, really part of this legendary family coming through the world of squash has had a highest world ranking of 47 dropped a little bit down to 85 just by lack of playing in in tournaments and, and being in college and she actually was the youngest person to ever win the u.s nationals back in 2014 and she's at harvard where she's helped her team win four consecutive national titles and they in my books go down as the greatest women's team in the history and out uh, one sports. two so incredible resumes these two players an exciting future ahead for them there we see the brutal power of and out, three, one. that backhand down the wall but we've also already seen some beautiful delicate volley drops from sabrina sobi so it's a, it's a wonderful contrast in styles you know the floating shot maker and the brutal power of sedki these two players didn't play too long ago. They played in the final of a PSA tournament. I think it was two weeks ago, and Reham Sedki came out Thank on you. top. So uh, Sabrina Sobi is going to be hungry for Four blood one. today on court. But it's a little bit of a shock factor when you first step. No matter how many times they've played each other, you have to think there's a shock factor to the pace that Sedki generates. Well, there was a nice piece of subtle work from Sedki there, playing a trickle post. Uh, really surprised Sabrina Sobi because she expected Five, the bullet to the back of the court. I do sometimes worry with Sabrina that because of the late racket prep, she... Uh, refuses some volleys on the return of serve that I'd like to see her take. And once she gets behind in the court against Sedki, it can be really problematic. 
Beautiful oh, handling great. there. Stop! I'm not sure. Oh, oh glass glasses. is lost. And so the rule there. But they didn't come off in a collision, so too the fast. Glasses came off. Riem Sedki has lost the point. The only piece of equipment or anything that can fall from you in a game of squash and still continue the point is the racket. 3-5. Oh, so great serve. It's going to need to increase the quality and trap Sedki into the back of the court. Don't allow her to be able to just step and load with the legs. You see Sedki on the forehand side uses the muscles of the arm to generate force. And this does cause a problem for her because it makes her stay still for a Four long five. time when she executes the shot. Whereas if she was using the legs, she could be flowing into position. A little casual there by Sedgi when she played that forehand drop and she's oh, lost that's the rally. Beautiful movement of the ball by Sobi. Five Back all. and forth, forcing and twisting Sedki. So back to parity. Down. Oh, you saw there that she was and not quite balanced as she's hit this boast and she's fallen over, closed the racket face, and that's why she's hit the top of the tin. Stability so important when you're executing close control shots like that. There again, the brutal raw power of Riem Sedki. Just, especially on this backhand side, merciless. Well, you also have to be Seven, so five. careful because of her swing, right? You have to get yourself almost out of position, really, because she takes up so much space. Yeah, I would expect the referees in certain occasions to penalize her for that big forearm swing in particular. Stroke to Sedki. There you saw Eight, five. Sabrina Sobi trying to play at the same rate as Sedki. Not a wise move. Well, some of my observations with Nine, Sobi has, over the years has been that she's a fairly slow starter, right? Doesn't get comfortable up until about the second or, or third game, right? So she gets herself into into the match a little bit late. I'm afraid that against someone of Sedki's Sed standard, that's going to take too long. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt her. Yeah, and Sedki has this ability to put up this constant barrage of power and Sobi in order to stop that needs to twist her and turn her and move her around the court deftly varying paces using deception if she gets caught into the barrage herself then there's only one outcome well that's a missed volley opportunity from Sedki there the Chanel Erasmus <laughs> volley brace are out on force five again gimbal. Oh, game ball now for Reham Sedki in this first 10-5. And I've actually been impressed with Sedki's variation Down. on a number five. of occasions where game we've expected Sedki. the Sedki bullet leads to the one game to love. She's done something a bit different, which shows us that she's really maturing in the game. Well, Sovi is definitely catching Sedki off guard with that trickle boost. It's just not hitting the side wall high enough to make its way to the front wall. So has, she's made a number of unforced errors now heading into the front of the court. A little bit of that desperation coming through as well, just forcing it short instead of working the ball into the front of the court. So. I'd like to see the variation in pace from Sobi as well. As we mentioned earlier in the game, she was controlling the back and forth movement of Sedki, but couldn't contain and, and maintain really that consistency. Right, yeah, in the recap volley that we just saw there, beautiful poised balance, and instead of power, she used just simple weight transference to move the ball to the back of the court and twist Sedki. That needs to happen more often. And at the moment, she's trying to fight fire with fire. And I'm afraid very few people in the world have the firepower 
of Rium We will resume. Well, as in 60 I mentioned, seconds. Sabrina Sobi, a little bit of a slower starter when it comes to match play. She finds her stride heading into that second game. And so I'm just hoping that she can find it really early in this second game and not get herself down and out and lock her down moving on into this match. Really would love to see the volleying skills of Sobi being used to vary the direction and pace and twist and turn her, as her opponent. I feel as though if Sedki gets in on top in this second game, that it's a, a, a heck of a long way back. Sedki leads, one game to love. Love all. So here we go. Good variation there from Sobi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's expecting that ball cross court, doing a nice job. And there again we see that yeah. lovely little trickle bow from Riam Sedki. And you know, I I she lulls you into that belief that it's gonna be bullet after bullet, yeah. and then almost has you falling backwards when she does that change up. Well, because there's no indication that she's going to make that change up, right? The body position is all the same. Rhythm, such an important part of our sport. The expectation of the opponent to see the same shot over yes, and over and over can be love. used against them. I'd like to see more players use change up serves. And what I mean by that is use a certain pattern and rhythm and serve to set oh. the expectation in the mind and then change that up later in the match. Oh, that landed and right up. in the neck. Well, well you can see the strategy here too from Sobi just trying to keep it on Sedki's backhand. No lead. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah, if no, I would necessarily keep was over it to on the right. Sedki's backhand. I, I feel as though the w biggest weakness Two, is a dying ball to her forehand deep because of the technical fault in her swing. Um, I also think that although Sobi needs to take the ball short and long, she has to really earn the opportunity to go short not just go yeah. short because she wants to go short. And out, you know, all. when she does that, Sedki is so fast to counter attack. Two all, yeah. Very impressed with how single-mindedly Sedki is approaching this task. Um, nothing seems to distract her or phase her. She has a game plan, and she's delivering it. I have to say, though, and give her credit, I've always seen her like that. Oh, that's a bit it's of a like shoulder charge. That was perhaps not necessary. Yeah. Sobi had created her own problem by playing a loose ball and put Sedki into that situation. Don't like to see that. Well, you see the, the ball from Sobi was not good enough length to penalize the set. Now there was a better ball and you saw Sobi mm -hmm. was forced into playing a boast. That would be a good game plan. 
Well, she's doing the best she can to slow it down. You can see that. Yeah, no, that Sedki didn't really move off this ball. She's no, blocked it for the quite a long time. Went through but it was so tight. Was tight. I don't think the referee it, so will give a let. Yeah, I, did, I had a different view. Three, two. No, indeed, no let was given. Late volley there ended up being popped out. There again, we see mm -hmm. Sobi going short too early there. She hadn't earned it. It was the first opening short. I'd like to have seen her go long from there and create more of an opening. Ah, oh, that's better. Landing just short enough. Worked it down that forehand side, no, which we all. hadn't seen much in this game and then punished it cross court. Down. Yeah, good game, good sportsmanship four, there three. from Serena Sobi. Well, from that replay, it looked like she just got a racket on it. Well, she, she gave it away, which is great to see amongst these players of high caliber. There's another pop out, and you saw again, he, she opened up as she hit that shot. And again, Sobi taking the ball in short when she hadn't really worked an opening. Very unwise. That well, was that better because she yeah, no, got I know. the you loose gotta, ball she from didn't do anything wrong. That's a, a short ball played to hurt, not to win. For all. Volley missed there, Chanel. Where's the police now? <laughs> They're in shock. And she's just, Sabrina Sobi, not quite finding the dying length of the forehand. And no, definitely not. It's landing, it's down. landing either too short or it's being overplayed. And so the, it, Sedgi has time Five, to sort of wind up for that cracking right. shot. And that's such a dangerous position to be in. You don't want to fight that. And ball just landing by the service box, not doing damage. It's more length, yeah. and she actually made her back Six off a little four. bit. This is the first time we've really seen Sedki have to back off, and because of that big, uh, uh, unconventional swing, she finds it difficult to play from that situation. Yes, sled. 6-4. Her ball came back, right back to yeah. her. Now that boast was taken quite early, which I think was more permissible, but she's then played the defensive boast, which has really gotten her oh. into trouble. She's still there. She's so quick around the court. Yeah. Moves like floats around, and really. Out. Five, I mean, six. I think that's one of her great strengths, is that she's a, an effort, effortless kind of glider around the court, mm -hmm. easy for me to say. Um, but she's not getting to use that beautiful movement because she's playing up. too much of the battle axe kind of game that Sedki loves. Seven, five. I do think that I'd like to see her transfer a little bit of those shots down the left wall onto the right wall and see if she can test the only thing in my mind that I think is going on in her head is that she knows if it's not good enough, it's dead, right? And so there's a little bit more pressure on that forehand side. Let. But that was a that was a very nice yeah, rally she there. Could have Beautiful that. tight she ball by Sedki on at the end. But on a number of occasions, uh, any time that Sedki had to stretch on her forehand, Seven, five, right box. she would get the ball, but she'd still be in the same place that she hit it from later on, leaving openings in the rest of the court. So I think you're right, Chanel. She's got to yes, let, seven, expose five. Sedki on that side if she's got a, any chance of coming back into this match. Right up, thank you. Beautiful straight drop. See how low she gets here. Yeah. Eight five. And that's 
She was on that so quickly too. Very early and it's a great lesson for all improving players. If you can get below the level of the ball when you play a drop shot, you can turn the drop into a mini lob and it dies see. very quickly. Soby, sorry. It's going to be a stroke any time of day, Thanks. really. 9-5. So, a bit of a turnaround yeah. here. Um, and she's certainly varying her choice of shot, moving the ball around the court. And uh, sh she's got Sedki twisting and turning a little bit. And as we said earlier, this is the key if you're playing against Sedki. Down, Instead of just down. playing the single barrage style to actually Ten twist five. and turn. Game ball. And make it more about variation. She's being a lot more aggressive, a lot more ferocious out there in this second game. And has really taken the game to Sedki instead of just waiting for it to come to her. It's a dangerous that shot. Got, no, that that close to a stroke would, there, even yeah, though her shot was that tight. One, Look at how long she stayed on that. 6-10, game ball. No let given. Very surprised about that decision. Down. Oh, and yeah, the very good lane. And one look game at all. the Sedki straight arm there. Almost impossible to get it out unless you've got good wrist skills. Well, it was the length that was missing in the first and the first half of the second game from Sabrina Sobi. She just wasn't quite able to find the back of the court. Most shots were landing short. She's going short too soon for my liking as well and was sort of penalized for it at the beginning of the second game. But then started developing and started being really, really ferocious out there, attacking, looking for the volley and controlling the pace better than she had in the first game. As you say, uh, she initially was going short for the wrong reasons, but in this game, she started to earn openings and take her opponent around the court, short and long, but for the reason of building pressure and creating openings, and it paid off nicely. I have to ask, Richard, what can we expect to see from Sabrina Sobi and Reham Sedki moving on into this really crucial third game? Well, I think a lot will depend on the opening rallies. Can Sedki reset the barrage of consistent, brutal length? Or can Sab Sabrina Sobi continue this beautiful variation of height, width, length? And of course, not to be underestimated, her deception, which is some of the best deception in the women's game. So really, their cards are on the table now. Who can make their version of the game pay? Absolutely. Well, we're heading into the third game, a crucial game here for both players. Currently tied at one all. Not much between these two players. It was Reham Sedki in the first, absolutely dominating. And then a little shift in that second, but not quite enough for me to have full faith in saying that Sabrina Sovi is the dominant player out here today. One game all, so be deserved. Love well, all. Here we are at the start of the third game. Really crucial first points to be played by both players to find the good length in the back of the court. Look to take the ball early. Down. And out. And a little off. impatience there from Sobi trying to take the ball in short. Maybe a little too soon. I'd like to have seen the cross court volley float lob. Trying, and there it is. As soon as I said it, she's played it. But that brutal power, just too much. Mm -hmm. To love. Ah, just rips that cross court. And I have to say that with that power, it is really, folks, a case of don't try this at home. Because Sedki has practiced this and practiced this to the point where she's one of the very few people that can play this way in the United States. Well, you we also just have to think of how fit she is, Richard, to be able to play at such pace. It's exhausting. Oh. There's the forehand tightness. And, uh, and there one, may be a little bit of the technical issues that uh, we were talking about earlier with the Sedki forehand.
Sabrina Sovi moving Sedki around the court very effectively. Struck to Sedki. But unfortunately giving away with a poor shot selection there. 3-1. That ball needed to play, be played deep to the back of the court. So Sedki establishing a little bit of a bridgehead in this third game. Not Beautiful up. half volley drop shot there. Look and at out. that, played right on the two, short two, hop three. with fantastic touch. That's a tremendous skill. Oh, up. Beautiful, jumps on that so quickly. Three all. It's excellent, uh, the ability, Richard, and if you're a squash player, you understand how difficult this is for anyone tuning in. The ability to take pace off a ball that is being shot Short at you, like hundreds of miles per hour Four, three. is really difficult. It's a tremendous mechanical skill, and it really starts from stabilizing your feet and transferring your whole body weight subtly through the racket into the ball. Fantastic balance required. Oh, look at the way that Sobi gets out of the shot. Oh, that's punishing. You heard Sedki hit the back wall glass there with her swing as she hit that shot. Big round swing. Tremendous yeah, movement no, no again leg. we saw here from Sabrina Sobi. A lot of players wouldn't have made it to that ball. She not only made it to it, but she delivered something with interest. Fourth, for all. But she wasn't given the let there. I was quite surprised. Asked to play the shot. Better height and width. And you can see how much Setki enjoys those exchanges mm -hmm. straight down the wall. Again, she hit the glass because the length was good. Oh, I had the opportunity to go straight down the line there, Richard. Went short too early. That's oh, smart. very nice. That's smart Set, see, as Setki Five, played four. that previous forehand, she fell over and was late recovering and therefore easy to send the wrong way. That's what happens when you don't use your legs to hit a squash shot when you use your arms no for leg. strength. That's nice touch, beautiful. Just Six millimeters four. above the 10, really. And the Boxing way she, her out. Yeah, she, she worked her hand right around that ball, inside out, beautiful skill. So Stroke again, Sophie. there's a little mistake on that. Seven, Sedki four, forehand, right. and this is what we said, that if uh, Sobi could find that forehand deep, she might bear fruit with that, and it seems to be happening to a degree here. She gets a 7-4 lead. That's tight. Better quality than what we've seen. Bali coming into play once she's being tested in the back right corner. So an important rally here. Both players down. Oh. oh. Hand out that five hurts. seven. You have to make your opponent earn it. You can't give it to them. Again, we saw the defensive law. Uh, sorry. All my shots have mixed together. You saw the defensive boast come into play after Seki was tested in the in the back right corner. There it is again. Five, again, seven. the yep. forehand technique just slightly getting into trouble, and that's a possible stroke. I'm quite surprised at that. She's played a poor shot into the middle of the court, stopped her opponent from hitting the ball. Right up. Shot. <laughs> but there we see the delicate Mendo. finesse of Sabrina Sobi. So, Chanel, if you were Sedki at this moment in time, what, what would you be trying to do? I want to get Sabrina Sobi behind me because she's so deadly in the front of the court and tries to go short a lot. So Stroke that Sedki. If I, I mean, no. I know, a ball Sedki just plays, came out and she was right She's deadly when she has time on the ball and is able to crush it cross court. And she only gets those opportunities Six, from eight. the back of the court once she's pinned Sobi in there. So the mentality here is to take charge of the front and the back. 
Yeah, earlier in the match, I was very impressed with Sedki. As you had said, she was very accurate with her driven hard length. And then she was getting to the front of the court and playing that little boast, which was really catching Sabrina Sobi out. Um, I feel as though she maybe Seven, has eight. regressed a little bit into just trying to play power and not enough variation. I would also like to see her just improve her clearing off the ball, right? And you mentioned that too. She plays and stands and exp so someone expects the winner instead of actually just getting ready for what's to come next. Yeah, and again, I think that's tied up with the technique she uses on the forehand side. You see on the backhand side, she moves off the ball where she stands on the forehand side. And that's because she doesn't use the legs to generate force on the forehand. She uses the arm. But crucial. she's got back to parity here. Yep, crucial point right now. Eight all. Little lapse in concentration, I feel, from Sobi there. She really had had the thing in the palm of her hand. It's led. Getting Eight a little all. scrappy here, both of them. We see going short too soon. Nine eight. Yeah, exactly. As I said before, you must not give it to your opponent. You must make them earn it. It's a big point here. And once again, we see the game being played on the backhand side, which, in my view, favors Sedki. No length to that forehand drive. Sedki's playing very well here. She's really taking the game to Sobi. You can see when she's off the ball, she's quite on her toes, sprightly. Yeah, there's that. She set herself up to do that punch in cross court. Game ball. Right? That's something that she does so incredibly well. So here she is with a game ball, having looked as though she was on the wrong yeah, end of this game. Absolutely. Not up, not up. Little loose ball here from Sedki. Not sure Hand what out, the decision's going to be. 9 10, game ball. When Sobi's going to the Sedki forehand, she just isn't getting sufficient length to make the big difference. Well, that was a perfect Ten setup in my mind. It was that two good length into the front, into the back right corner, forced the defensive burst, and then played it short. The problem now, Richard, is that Sedki is expecting the ball to drop short. Great change of direction there by Sobi. Again, going short. Again, she's twisted her. Oh, oh it's a great nick. <laughs> that is absolute class on the squash 11, 10. Court. Down and game out. Ball. Wow. Now Sobi with the game ball. Again, short very early. It's let 11 10, game ball. I feel as though Sedki was going a little bit too much for the player there. Mm -hmm. Sobi hunting the volley there, that was good to see. It's let. And again, Sedki not yeah, really moving off that through, ball. Though, right? See, after she hit it, she was 10. in the same place as before she started the swing. Good use of the tip of the racket there by Sobi to get the ball tight. Nine, 
Not up, oh, thank you. That is a punishing Extraordinary kill. shot. And out, 11 all. So back to all square. I'm more surprised that she doesn't break more strings, Richard. Although she does hit with a fairly flat racket face. Down. Yeah. And so slicing obviously soars the strings game across ball. a little bit more. Another game ball now for Sabrina Sobi. Looking to take the 2 1 advantage. She's fighting so I really away. feel as though the whole match is teetering on the brink here. Mm -hmm. I felt as though if Sedki won this game, that she would be in the clear. But now that Sobi's here, I think it really opens all kinds of possibilities. Yes, led. 12 11, game ball. Balance is swinging backwards and forwards. The momentum with both of these players. Nobody seems to have any clear advantage at the moment. Very good forehand length. Beautiful drop volley. And again, a good attacking drop volley. Played for the yeah, right reason. Smart. Still. That's excellent retrieval Not from Sedki, but lands 13, right 11. in the nick there by Sabrina Sobi. Sobi. I was Sobi really impressed by the one. movement and the coverage of Rehem Sedki, able to pick those balls up, but just one too many drop shots into the front of the court. And I feel as though towards the last couple of rallies, Sobi was really controlling the rally for the right reasons and was working her opponent not to try and win points, but to extend and twist and turn until finally it was a bridge too far for Sedki. Well, th there wasn't much between these two players and it looked as if Sobi was in control and then shifted towards Rehem and then Sobi coming right back to win that 13-11. Unforced errors coming into play in this third game, but there we see just that punishing, crushing shot down the line from Sedki. Would like to see her get off the ball a little bit quicker to set herself up for what's coming next. And as you mentioned, Richard, need to see Sobi just work the back of the court a little bit longer than she has. And I'd also like to see if she's able to do something different after the defensive boast from Reham Sedki. Yeah. Well set up, I think, for this fourth game. I could not, hand on heart, tell you which one I think is going to win. Um, I, I think the momentum shift is going to depend really on whether Sabrina Sobi can play this all-court, varied, deceptive game where she is building the re gradual rally and looking to work her opponent, or is it Sedki that can get back into this barrage of power and take Sobi to task so she doesn't have the balance and control mm -hmm. to settle into that all-court game. Well, she needs to force Sobi to go short too soon, right? And that's where she's in control because then she can punish that ball. I mean, every time she seconds. hits the ball on this right wall, the whole wall shakes, right? And she loves the ability to just crush it cross-court and gets those opportunities when she forces Sobi to go short too soon. So I'm not counting either player as the... the Time. <laughs> The secure winner for this Sobe matchup. Leads. I think we're in Two for a real one. battle here. Sobe My, to as serve. a coach, I would be yeah, saying, miss. "Time to serve. Really Thank start you. well. Make sure the Love first all. three, four rallies are your best, because I think whoever gets their nose in front really has a big advantage." Love all. Love that cross-court volley float that she's mm -hmm. playing there, Sobi. It's a working shot. And Sedki staying on the ball a long time there, but and unfortunately, Sobi not setting up before she executed. She tried to do both together, and that never works out well. Well, 
And that's a very cheap attempt at a return of serve there. I don't think Gillette. that bodes well for Sobey's mental state. Yeah, I know, but the ball was going this way, and you took the path. Yeah, I know. I saw exactly what it was. Yeah. Two love. And she's given a no let there. I'm quite surprised. So Setsky seeming to settle the first in this fourth game. Oh, there's the big swing. You okay? Now, to be fair yeah. to Setsky, it's a lead. It's a, it's was a big exact, swing, no, that, but Sobey put the ball in the middle of the court and needed to give her plenty of mm -hmm. clearance room. Two love. Nice half volley from Setki cross court there. She's not accurate enough on that forehand side by force jutting out, and Free that's love. where Setki becomes deadly. She likes time on the ball, she loves opportunities like that. Haven't seen her play well tight off tight, right? Exactly right. Setki's weakest area is the back right-hand corner behind the service box. Unfortunately for Sobi, that's also yeah. her weakest area yeah. for targeting. Yes, She's that not good at getting the We're ball. Play a lead. I wasn't 100% sure, so yes, let. If we could see a scatter pattern of where the balls are landing on the court, mm -hmm. not enough of them would be landing in that back right corner. I'm sure Steve, our technical guy, will come up with a scatter pattern graphic very, very soon. Technical guy is rather paltry expression of our director and technical guru here. A man of many traits. There we see the loose ball on the Four forehand love. again. Um, you know, she, I think she understands that the forehand is where to go, but the quality isn't good enough at this well, point. Well, there's, there's pressure associated with it, Richard, because you know that if you don't move your, if it's not accurate, you don't move yeah. yourself out of the way quick enough, you're going to get Five smacked love. in the head, right? Because right. it's, so it's, it's the right shot, but you have to be so accurate. So a little mental fragility here from Sabrina Sobi at the beginning of the fourth game. She was in the driving seat, but now she's five love down and tried for a cross-court volley, Nick, return a serve. She's not indicative Six of somebody five. who's in control of a game plan. Wow, six love now. So even at six love down, I'd love to see Sobi try and reconstitute her game plan Not and up. start building Not. something even if it and doesn't one, succeed six. in this game for the for the fifth game. Sedki on the other hand really credit to her for re-establishing her power based game plan and she's really taking oh, the game wow. to Sobi right wow. now. And out seven That's one. a great shot down the line forcing the short ball, forcing a weak short ball and just punishing it. You can see that attempt at a backhand win was all about finishing the rally, not continuing her opponent's anguish. So it's a short-term mentality at the moment, I'm afraid, for Sobi. And she has to have the long game in mind. Great pickup. Oh, that's oh. going to be a stroke. Sobe. Excellent pickup. But again, Two there in that previous Two rally, seven. we saw as soon as that boast comes in, she plays the straight drop. She's now done that four or five times in a row. It's predictable. Yeah, there's got to be some variation there and some deception. 
And we know she's got the deception, but Three I seven. think she's a little bit out of ideas at the front, as you pointed out earlier. So a little late attempt at a comeback here from Sovi. Wow, look at the size of that sword. But again, Sobi has the oh, opportunity. Very nice. And too many of these forehand Four balls seven. from Sobi are going into the service box, not behind the service box. Sedki still bouncing around, full of vim and vigor. Oh, that looked out. Looked out to me. Now that's the number of times that Sobi's played that forehand drop into the backhand corner. That's trouble. That's just going to yep. set you up stroke for a stroke Sobe. or interference. It's it's it, it's loose. You're right in the way. The five seven. I do think that shot was out, Richard. I'm not sure if the referee. I think the referee acknowledged that as well. Five seven now. So, Sobi not quite ready to lie down and die in this fourth game. She's dug herself a hole, but she seems to be willing to try and fight her way out of it. Down. Oh, oh and first indication there Six, of Sebi trying to play a shot to win immediately instead of working the opponent. Back to 6-7. I'm quite surprised after that 6-love deficit. Yeah. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Stroke to Did she catch her with the swing? I don't know if she did. So he's, I think, claiming that uh, she, she caught... Setki on the backswing, okay, but I, so I don't feel no, so that that's fair. I thought I it was the one after, Sobe. so we're playing a lead on the contact with the backswing. Six, seven. <laughs> well, as soon as she made contact with the ball, she immediately put her hand up, so... She must have felt she contacted her. It didn't look like it to me, but... Short too early, but the error from wow. Sedki. Wow, I un haven't seen her make any errors from the front corners. But you saw their beautiful example of how that round arm forehand technique closes the racket face and dragged it down into the tin. Yeah, no, that. Yeah. It's getting a little no, scrappy no, I know. here. Because the ball was passed, you would have had to go through. all the way around to get it. That's why it's not a let. Yeah, I didn't see you getting it before then. That's why Referee I was really getting left. involved more yeah. than we'd like. I, I gave you a description. 8 7. So a little bit of a reprieve for Sedki there, who was on the wrong end of that comeback from Sobi. Sobi taking a while to just gather her thoughts. of her own medicine there, just punishing it through the wall. I knew she could generate a case, but not that much. Well, I was pleased with that from the point of view of a squash player's mind, because I, I felt as though it wasn't just played to win. I felt as though it was played to hurt. It did win, which is a beautiful bonus, but I don't think that was the main reason she hit little cross-court float she plays. I love that shot. She's getting up that court very nicely. She's early on that ball. And she's keeping the pressure on, said Ki here. Oh, oh, wow. Wow, what a great rally between these two players. Crowd definitely you know, likes eight. what they're seeing on court here. It's All quality. credit to Sedki. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful, straightened ball. Yeah, 
big moment I now. Love the way that Sobi gets round. Nine out, nine her all. technique was superb in that. Boxed her opponent out because she got her fundamental set up right. So often we see players just stand and try and hit flat foot facing forward that shot. Ooh. It's let nine all. So really well poised this match. Nine all, two one to Sobi. It's let. No, it's she was trying to get out where the path was coming yeah. in. Nine all. Both players taking a lot of risk when they hit those half length balls and blocked. Yeah, no, no. Good you, shot yeah, by I saw the contact. Yeah, that's good quality. From her no, the and ball, the ball was, was further back. by Sobi to the middle of the court. So, uh, listen, she didn't. She's just trying to get to the ball, Miss Sedke. I don't feel as though it should be. 10-9, game ball. I thought the quality of shot was way too good for and anything fact, to come Sedke's out of that. Got point, and it's game ball. Sobi. It's a poor it's shot a here from Sedki. It's come out Ten of the all. court, and I feel as though Sobi should be given the opportunity to hit that ball, and indeed that's how it's turned out. Ten all. Win by two oh, points. Oh, great reach. Was a win. Yeah. Excellent reach. Watch her balance here. She no, gets no. the foot down before it's she makes contact shot. with the ball. So important to stabilize to match transfer ball. weight into the ball. Oh, match ball now for Sabrina Sobi. Mind plays tricks in these situations. Can so be not up, not up. The rally to win? No, balls down and Nick rolled a dead. It's a dead. Yeah, it's a dead Nick. Oh dear. Seems like match to Sobi. Seems like we've got a, a decision. Match to Sobi. Three games to one. I think Sedki felt as though she got the ball up, and it was called not up, and so she's very disappointed. But. Uh, a tremendous victory for Sabrina Sobi. Here comes the last point. Let's see what happened. Well, we're handed over to Bill Buckingham now as he goes on for an interview with Sabrina Sobi. And your second women's finalist, Sabrina Sobi. Sabrina, you played her two weeks ago at Queen City. The result was quite different. What changes did you make in your game to turn the results around? Um, we've obviously played each other many times throughout. Um, starting since we were probably like 13 or something, and it's always been such a battle between us, um, which I thank her for because uh, it's good to have competition every time. Um, but I think the difference in this game that helped me a lot was having like my whole family here with me and a lot of my friends and cousins and aunts and that just makes it a whole another aspect to why I'm out here and what's motivating me behind the, all the training that I've done so that's been really a huge factor in having me like keep pushing and play point by point. So. You're the youngest person ever to win this championship. Now you're back in the final with a chance to take home your second crown. Olivia Blatchford on deck. Talk about tomorrow night's match. Um, yeah, like I'm absolutely ecstatic to be in the finals tomorrow. Um, to be honest, I didn't anticipate it. It's always been a dream to be back in the finals after five years ago, whenever I made it. Um, and it's good to play Olivia again. Like We haven't played each other in a while, which will be good. Um, she's always also been a big competitor and she's been doing fabulous on the, the pro circuit so it'll be really fun to play against such a highly ranked uh, player. Congratulations, you put on a great show for our crowd tonight. We look forward to seeing you here again in the finals. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Sabrina Sobi.
Well, Richard, that was an excellent match and win for Sabrina Sobi. Huge victory for her, having just lost a couple of weeks ago to Reham Sedki in the professional squash tournament and now meeting her here in the semifinal. As we heard there, hasn't been in this final in five years, right? So a big moment for her. Yeah, interesting how the match uh, momentum swung backwards and forwards with both players having an opportunity at various times to be the controller of the match. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of credit, I think, to Sabrina Sobi for managing to get back on track with her game plan and using her deft touch and feel to move her opponent around the court and build openings and situations. Earlier on in the match, she was trying to force things short too early and getting into trouble. Um, and to ride the wave of this incredible barrage of power from, from Riem Sekki, who we know is just a, a wonderful player, uh, was a, a tremendous accolade, I think. Absolutely, and the prediction here was that this was going to be a top-notch, world-class display of squash, and that's exactly what it was. And uh, interesting you say that shift in momentum, because there were times where Riem Sepke looked like she was in full control of the match and was going to close this out fairly comfortably. And then just when you're about to count out Sabrina Sobi, she's right back in it. And there we saw there were two games there that went to 10 all after Sobi was down one or two points to come back in those pressured situations situations that's not something you can teach very easily no and I think it, it, it you know reflects her growing strength as a professional or as a top level player mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of incidences where she had some mental lapses we saw an attempt at game ball down I think it was or very late in the game at a cross court volley Nick return to serve not the sort of thing that you really want to see in a top pro but then, conversely, we saw some periods where she was under stress and she maintained the game plan and came out winning some brilliant long rallies where she'd worked Sedki around the court until she got an opening that she didn't really need to play a fantastic shot because she'd created so much pressure. Exactly, and, and she definitely can't afford to have those laps and concentrations when she takes on Olivia Blackford Klein tomorrow in the final of this championship. A top world-class player who's 19th in the world at the moment, and you can't afford to do any sort of anything that allows Olivia to step out in front and we saw how how powerful Sobi is in the front of the court now I think Olivia Blatcher Klein is that much better in the front of the court I agree with you particularly on her backhand her setup and her deft touch is almost nothing to hit in those situations yep. but I will say that I think that Sabrina Sobi's style matches up better with Olivia Blatchford Klein's style than it does against Riem um, Sekki's. The only thing is that I think that Olivia Blatchford Klein is doing that at a top 20 in the world level. And that might be a problem. Please welcome to the court from Brooklyn, New York, Andrew Douglas. From Greenwich, Connecticut, please welcome Chris Hansen. This is our last semi-final of the day. We've now seen two players secure their place in the final. Olivia Blatchard Klein will be taking on Sabrina Sobi tomorrow evening. And well, Todd Harrod, he is patiently waiting to see who he'll meet in the final tomorrow between Andrew Douglas right now and Chris Hansen. What can we expect to see from these two players? Chris Hansen, two-time 
champion, defending champion. Uh, extraordinary court coverage. Um, lefty style. Um, it tends to strike the ball fairly flat. Uh, doesn't cut or slice the ball as much as some other players do. But very athletic. Incredible patience. Uh, loves to play the straight game. Uh, Andrew Douglas, uh, more of an all-court player. Um, he's got a tremendous variety of shots. Uh, I feel he stands on the ball a little bit on the forehand side, which can create some traffic problems. But I think he's also developing as a professional very rapidly. Um, a little bit reminiscent, I suppose, in some respects, of Todd Harity's uh, growth as a professional from a junior player through the college ranks. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Andrew Douglas uh, win this one, uh, although my heart is with Chris Hansen, who after recovering from his car crash has just been a magnificent champion of this country, He's such a wonderful human being, and uh, I think it would be wonderful for him to get through to the final and have a chance of a third victory. Well, Andrew Douglas in, on the right side in the all blue turned from a distinguished junior squash player achieving the top junior ranks and then propelled himself into the top adult U.S. rankings defeating Todd Harity, the number one U.S. player two times at the U.S. Nationals. So that's uh, certainly we saw Todd Harity play earlier. That's difficult to imagine anyone taking him down and Andrew Douglas has done it twice. He also plays on the professional world circuit where he's currently ranked 127. He played the U.S. Open just last year. It's, uh, I believe he's a sophomore from at UPenn, another world-class top education and squash program there as well. And his opponent, Chris Hansen, in the all gray, played at Dartmouth and is now currently ranked 66th in the world. He's had a highest world ranking of 60th, a full-time USA member, two-time defending US champion and beat Faraz Khan 3-love in the quarterfinal to secure his place here in the semi-final. So both players, incredible accolades to their names, and I'm excited to see what happens here as this is our last semi-final of the day. A little bit of a shout-out um, to Chris's coach, Rod Martin. The two of them have had a fantastic relationship over the years. Uh, I don't think there are many... Uh, coach uh, player relationships that have stood the test of time like Chris and Rod and uh, I know Chris gives Rod a great deal of credit they've really been a, a great partnership over the years and for me as a coach and I'm sure for you it's wonderful when you see not only the, the relationship blossom like that but Chris really values to this day everything that Rod uh, and his family have done for him so much much blessings and much credit to Rod Martin for the work that he's done here. Chris Servin. Play will start in 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds. Two thousand nineteen SO Green Men's Squash Championship semi final match. Chris Hansen to serve, Andrew Douglas to receive. Best of five games. Love all.
Down. One love. Well, here we are at the start of this last semi-final of the day. Andrew Douglas in the All Navy, Christopher Hansen in the All Grey, battling it out here for a place in the final tomorrow evening, where they'll meet Todd Harity. Richard, you mentioned earlier that you wouldn't be surprised if Andrew Douglas came out on top here. What's Guess your what? What's your actual prediction left. for this match? That it's going to be a very good squash match. <laughs> Um, ah, that's the easy way out. So I would say that the nut for Douglas to crack is Hansen's remarkable consistency and athleticism. Um, and Douglas has a wonderful variation of stroke, has good deception, very quick hands. And so he can actually twist and turn people around. But Hansen's athleticism, and I can tell you, he has worked unbelievably hard on becoming a serious yeah. physical professional, mm -hmm. is a no difficult wall. nut to crack. The other thing I would say is that if Hansen is not making errors, his chances are very, very high. But occasionally he goes through these periods where maybe the racket face closes a little bit on his forehand side and he hits a couple of tins here and there. So I, I really think it's a very close call. Uh, I'd have to sort of favor Hansen on experience. One all, uh, left although side. Douglas is coming up very, very quickly. Is that hedging my bets? No, that's not giving me an answer. <laughs> Score prediction, Richard. Uh, Hansen in the ninth game. Stroke two. <laughs> Douglas. Two one. Uh, smart play, but he's had the right idea to go straight there. Catching Douglas off guard, just quality of shot, not good enough. And you saw his setup. He didn't get 90 degrees. He was open chested, which, as we've already said today, we're not big fans of. I love his racket prep. Oh, it's beautiful. It is. He's taken a note out of Richard Millman's book. Well, Richard Millman's book, one thing, but I think anybody can remember seeing Rod Martin play at the top of his game. No. His racket prep was Sorry. gorgeous. 3-1. No let. Uh, left. A little scrappy you, from you both weren't players anywhere real near that, Chris. first couple of exchanges. No, he was cleared fine. Well, I think you know both of them are trying to soften each other up with a bit of power at the beginning, and that's resulting in the few balls bouncing half court. Although this rally is already but there's a half court. When you get the half court play and trying to buy for dominance physically at the court, you get some traffic. But actually, I'm watching where the balls are bouncing, and I've got to say, the majority of them are getting behind that service box. Little skid boast there. Very difficult to skid boast on these glass courts, mm -hmm. Chanel. The ball is sticky on the sidewall, and so you change the angle. And if you're not sure what I mean by a skid boast, folks, that's a ball that's hit against the sidewall very high towards the front wall, so it skids long across the court. Taking his time, taking his space. retrieval from the back of the court to be able to whip that over difficult skill yeah. down now you watch here Hanson turns Four as he one. hits this which closes his racket face and that's what brings the ball into the tin very good length though from Douglas
Both players being quite patient towards the beginning of this match. And as we said in the earlier semi-final, the early opening rallies are often a little longer as the players kind of search each other out and see whether one another are prepared to go the distance. Oh, Richard, that ball definitely looked like it clipped out. These have been some brutal exchanges. Extended rallies, working each other. This is where in top professional squash, the conversation really isn't about winning points. These boys are asking the question of whether one another are ready to go the distance to win the match. Points are minor details. It's really about who's got what it takes for the big picture. I like the change in pace from Hansen. He's, both of them really have the ability to just float it up. Having watched Andrew Douglas for a few years now, I'm pretty impressed with the change in his upper body strength here. And he, he looks a lot more physically strong when he's waiting for the next shot. Stroke two. No, yes, yes. And that's his a loose ball from ball Chris Hansen. Hansen. He really right should be punished you. for that, I think. Yeah, I definitely think that's no, a stroke. No, he stayed in. No room for Just Douglas to line. play that ball. 5-1. I think Chris Hansen may be yes. asking about that earlier ball that may have touched the line. But a very good start for Andrew Douglas. Look Absolutely. at this. He's come out to a storming, storming start. And already we're beginning to see the variety of shots that he's capable of producing, twisting and turning and mixing, so his opponent is never able to set him. Down. So kind of surprising, Hansen Six the one, one making the errors here. You know, trying to force it from the back of the court. Force it when he's not in a position to play it either. Stroke to Hansen. Yeah, I, f I and feel now to six. You know, well, he's got the stroke, but I feel as though I'd like to have seen him try and play that ball, just to work Douglas a bit more. I feel as though the flat pace that Hansen is trying to impart is actually serving Douglas better oh. than it is Hansen. Um, <laughs> Lucky Douglas seems to be feeding off the flat pace quite effectively. And out. And I have seen Chris Hansen Seven, play two. some very effective lob drop games, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if we, in the second game, didn't see Hansen start throwing the ball up way high in the air. His mobility is a real strength, and when he creates time with the high ball, he can do a lot of damage with the time that it produces. Oh, he moves, yeah, he moves around the court effortlessly. But uh, Douglas looking very focused here, really poised really seems to know what he's about here, game plan wise. The quality much higher from Douglas than it is from Hansen. At this point in time, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, Douglas from the left, 7-2. Probably noticed Chanel that Hansen holds 
his racket pretty tightly. Now, Kevin variety Knuckles of start turning right. white. Um, so he, he he has a little less sort of finger and, and wrist touch than some players. But for all that, he does manage to create great accuracy and feel. But I sometimes feel as though at the back of the front of the court, when he's stretched, that he doesn't have as much reach because of that tight wrist that he uses. Down. Tight equality and down out. at the back of the line, staying patient, not doing too much with the ball though. Three Richie. seven. Now he, you could see that he recognized the opening and he just hit a good measured weighted fade. And that's often what I've seen him do in the past is he's gradually worked the opening until the opponent just can't get out of the hole that they've dug for themselves. So, so smart. That's great deception here. Look at the way he turns around now inside eight, out. Three. Well, the cross court would have been the obvious shot, right? At least in my book, it's the easiest shot to play from there. And uh, he's also used his body to hide the ball with there, which is a great piece of artistry that I really appreciate. So Chris Hansen saying that it, he didn't get the ball up there and giving the point to Andrew Douglas. There, there's a little technical issue there. Hansen not getting into a good position and I think that's where I see problems with that stiff wrist. He finds it difficult to keep the control on a very tight ball. I'm just so amazed by Douglas and his ability to clear out of that corner very well and give his opponent the space he needs to play yeah. the ball without putting himself under pressure. He used to stand on his forehand drives deep on the forehand side, but I'm not seeing that at no, all. I think he's learned not. to move off the ball as he hits it, so that's exciting. Well, I think he's gotten into trouble for it in the past and has had to make that adjustment. And I was at the College Nationals just a few few weeks ago and players were being punished and penalized for going short but not clearing out of the way stroke after stroke so you have to make that adjustment um, and there we saw just great squash from Andrew Douglas right from the get-go he means business as soon as he stepped on court worked the back of the corner as well and then opened up those opportunities to beautifully place the ball short I'm liking what I'm seeing from Andrew Douglas yeah I agree with you his demeanor when he's off the ball He's very relaxed, but hungry, and he doesn't seem worried. He oh, seems he's not to be by anything. right. Yeah, so exciting times for him. Yeah, he's definitely, definitely not phased by anything heading into this this match he means business he's ready to do whatever it takes and he's staying patient right he's working the points into the back of the court and then playing really tight shots into the front and clearing them out of the way and setting up for what's coming next my feeling is that Chris Hansen may now start throwing the lob up but not only throwing the lob up but really pushing up the court maybe a yard in front of the short line and volleying very early because he's going to break up Douglas's game if he's going to have any effect because Douglas is so comfortable maneuvering his opponent around the court you've got to make him uncomfortable if you're going to be able to take that away from him well the way that Douglas is playing at the moment if he can continue with the quality and the pace that he's able to play at he's so comfortable his relaxed demeanor on court I think he can win this in three I th tend to think you're right on the evidence of the first game. Yeah. So 
can't Douglas judge leads one game to love. that first game. A lot love of all. times it's just used to get yourself into this match and suss out where your opponent's strengths and weaknesses lie. And of course, Chris Hansen is a world-class pro. He's won PSA tournaments against world-class opposition. So he knows what it takes to come back from these kind of dire straits. Another beautiful angled volley here. Look at that beautiful fade out to the side wall. Well, not only that, he's tight. so balanced go in yeah, you, going you know into that go shot. That. Steps into it. It was tight to the wall. Go get it. One love. So one love, Andrew Douglas. little Ooh. miss hit boast <laughs> there two love he's had a couple of those lucky bounces on this court but no not seeing evidence yet of a change in game plan here from Chris Hansen I'm quite surprised Down. And out. that cross One court two. is a weak ball well racket follow through and down very difficult to hit a shot up from that position. Stroke two. Yeah, it's close to a stroke. Close to a stroke. He's on that ball Loose a long shot. time after he's hit it. Pass to the Richard, ball. we talk so much. Again. And I'm going to ask you a technical question now. We talk so much about the racket preparation. We haven't spent much time just talking about the importance of the follow through and projecting the boards where you want it to go through the use of the follow through. Yeah, I, I'm a great believer that it's footwork first. Now, two, three. That ball's right there. Well, we've lost the ball here in the commentary box and our co-commentator is working hard to manoeuvre his way behind all the wires on the desks the to get this ball out. Thank you. Well, Richard, a man of many talents having to climb through little spaces to get balls. Fortunately, I am a little person, so I could get through <laughs> a little space. But yeah, no, and at this now, point in time, two, uh, three. I just feel as though uh, two, three. Chris Hansen is and a now. little bit short on ideas, and Andrew Douglas is playing extremely well. However, one or two really well-extended rallies can change all of that. There's the lob I was talking about before. He does have a great lob on him when he starts using it as a working shot to hurt his opponent. And again, so we're beginning to see the mm -hmm. variation between the flatter ball and the thrown up high ball. And that gives Hansen so much more time. Three all. Probably going to be a stroke. Yeah, that's good. He's reaching over, taking the ball in earlier, punishing into the front of the court. Better aggression from Hansen in the second game. Yeah, but uh, the variation, I think, is what's creating the change in rhythm and not allowing um, Douglas to just feed off the same pace of ball all the time. Douglas, and out. Very tight, straight drop Four shot all. there. Eliciting a loose ball 
and a stroke. The attempt of the cross court Nick, a little cheap. It's getting into Thumpsville. There's some height, a little over hit. Yes, oh, the loose ball there from Andrew Douglas. What Douglas happens to his shoulders? Yes, off. he opens up the shoulders as he hits the shot. On, Chris. You hear me talk yeah, about that all the, time. The, all the time. No, 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 when no, the ball no. is tight, if you want to play tight off tight, you have to keep your shoulders facing the impact Four point off. until after contact. If you turn through the contact with the ball, chances are you'll open up your racket face and catch the side wall. And it's easily done, and that's why we see the ball pop out so often in those situations when players turn through the contact with the ball. You see Chris Hansen there keeping absolutely parallel to the side wall as he strikes the ball, and that's why he's keeping that ball so tight. But yes, there right. again, the pop out, and We're it's all. a real problem. Good use of height again by Hansen. Well, steps over and takes Down. that ball so early. Likes the ability to volley and take take the ball early, and, and it's just five does four. Hansen give him those opportunities, or is he trying to take that shot away from him? Now that's the first time I've seen a technical error from Andrew Douglas that came from slightly weary footwork. So, you know, I think it's important to remember that although this is a fantastic squash player, he's a guy who's in full-time education, who is, you know, really having to split his focus between his squash and studying at one of the most powerful institutions. And to be able to maintain that level of, of play, Six discipline, and fitness side. against a world-class player really is asking a lot. Absolutely, and much better momentum shift here now for Christopher Hansen. As you mentioned earlier, Richard, he's ta now taking control of the pace for the first time. Very different to what we saw in the first game. Yeah, and he's varying between the powerful shots yeah. and the lofted shots. Um, out. But Andrew Douglas still Five, right six. in there because of his great variety of shot. Mm -hmm. He's able to, you know, snipe against the shots that Hansen plays down the lines. Top spin cross court there. Again, balls jutting out from the side wall, not landing deep enough. There's the that's use of the height, height again. Yeah, that's good. Uh, this is a pretty important rally, I think. Now, for a leading pro, it wouldn't surprise me if this had another two or three crisis yeah. points. But well, there you go. There's a crisis point, and the and college player, not to be seven critical, five. has has made the error. I fully expect Andrew Douglas, if he continues as a pro, to reset rallies in those situations and build several more peaks and troughs within the rally. Douglas, but 
not generating that good quality length he had in the first game. Ball coming too far off the back wall. I feel That's as better. though the longer rallies like this continue, the balance of power switches to Hansen. Hmm. He's trained now to expect to have to go through many peaks and troughs in each rally and not worry too much about whether he's in the ascendancy or not, just knowing that good work will bring its own rewards. Well, you can't lose if your opponent makes errors. So this is a long rally now. And, you know, I almost feel as though Hansen won't worry too much whether he wins it or loses it, because he's exacting a price. Stroke two, Hansen. Two, Hansen. Oh, that's a brutal rally, Richard. Stroke Left side. To Chris Hansen. I feel as though Eight, five. that was almost worth more than a point, that yep. rally. That was money. change in direction but would like to see him follow that next shot up with something aggressive right jump on that ball and here we see Chris Hansen offering Andrew Douglas more of the same and I'm not sure if Andrew Douglas is a willing buyer in this circumstance Although that was a nice choice of pace there by Douglas. Well, just trying to buy himself some time. Physical strain that this takes. What a brutal chess match this sport is when played by two great players, evenly balanced, who aren't willing to just give in. Stroke to Hansen. Yeah, it's physical chess, right? That's what it is. You're moving the pieces. Right side. Which is your opponent all around the court. Calculating it precisely Nine, where you need to place it to set yourself up for what's to come next. And Christopher Hansen seems to be doing that much better now in the second game. And I don't feel as though Andrew Douglas has anything to be ashamed of. You know, I don't feel as though he suddenly started playing worse. No, absolutely not. The big change here is Hansen's readiness to just wait and wait and wait and wait. Left side. And his mobility and court coverage Ten five, is game a ball. thing of beauty. If you watch his flow around the court. Yes, let. Back swing. Little contact there. So a game ball to Chris Hansen. Yes, sir. Andrew, you want to put your foot on that mark there, t t please, so you don't slip. Not yet, not yet, but in between games. Thank, thank you. So Left I side, wonder if ten, the five, payment ball. that Chris Hansen has exacted from Andrew Douglas here is just one game's worth of payment, or maybe part of the next game as well. Game, no let. Game to Hansen, 11 5. It, Chris Hansen One game saying all. that's a stroke. Oh, apparently not. Oh, interesting. Not no, entirely no, sure what happened there. I thought Chris Hansen said the ball was down. down, or at least signaled that he was not willing to continue, but apparently judged to have been two bounces but anyway Chanel um, what a great piece of absorption from Chris Hansen taking the very talented play of Douglas and saying very good but what else have you got mm -hmm. what else have you got give me some more 
Well, I um, think he finally took charge in that second game, right? In, instead of just sitting back and accepting what Douglas was was presenting him with, he now said, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now take charge and I'm going to control the pace. I'm going to move you all around the court. And that's exactly what he did. And then he brought in that beautiful deception as well, which we saw a couple of times from the front of the court, that little hold and flick cross court. So he's he's added these elements into this second game which was completely lacking after the first i agree and it's that sort of rolling rhythm varying between the really able use of the float which i always distinguish between a float and a lob a lob goes up and comes down mm -hmm. a float is always traveling along it beckons to you you can't re quite reach it for a volley but if you let it drop it's dead in the back of the court so he's varying that between the float and a few sudden attacking stings and patience down the wall. And Andrew Douglas attacked him a few times and he just went back and got it. Really, I love that rolling rhythm and it, it's sapping, strength oh, sapping. Nice. Absolutely. And the extension of the rallies, I think, uh, uh, really hurt Douglas. And he's a fit guy we know man. that the stamina is there it's just one the, game all the continued execution Madison of quality deteriorates as soon as you go into those extended rallies Love all. and again i i, I don't want to beat him up for being a college player but they are doing an awful lot of other stuff apart from playing squash and how does that marry up against a full-time professional who's out on the tour you know playing hard matches week after week but we know that Andrew Douglas has beaten yes, Todd Harity the last okay. couple of times so we know he's got it in his wheelhouse Absolutely. although I've got to say that I feel Todd Harity has really hit his stride as yeah. a professional this last year and Chris Hansen also has been winning PSA events oh well, there's the deception coming into play does a really nice job of the hold. Makes me sort One of question love. where he's going. But I feel as though he's beginning to pace his shots with his own position in mind more than in the first game where I felt as though too much of his shot making power was about just trying to hurt his opponent and he was leaving himself open because of that. Look at that measured length and by the time the ball gets to where it's going, he's waiting for Andrew to hit the next shot. This is a big change in his control strategically of the court. Very intelligent use of that variation of pace. And now one all. Oh, that's really tight. Good quality squash. And Douglas coming back with a very nice straight drop volley. You know, that was one of the few occasions that Hansen played the ball faster than his own ability to get up the court into position. Measured drop volley there from Hansen. Yes, Ooh, yes, let. Played it a little too fast. Surprise, yeah. It was for safety. If it had hit that, he may have hit you. Didn't move off that Left shot side. when he hit it, and therefore presented a blockage to the front wall. Although it looks as though they didn't give the stroke there. First time I've seen Hansen using that floated ball in this game. Oh, 
Douglas. There it is. Yep. And it just gives him time to get wow. up the court in position and then be able to sting the next ball. Very intelligent use of that pace one. variation. Well, we're also seeing Douglas make a little bit of those adjustments with his shoulders, not opening up too soon, realizing that that got himself into a lot of trouble when the rallies became extended. So trying to improve that quality that he had in the first game. Great use of the wrist there by oh. Douglas, but ably defended. Wow, that was just one shot after the other that landed perfectly. First, the beautiful boost into the front court, a shot that we don't Three, like one. very much, but it was played the right time well, and for the right it was intention. Offensively mm -hmm. instead of defensively, so it just shows you the difference in the same shot played at a different moment. moment. Yep. though Douglas is right to play the boast to the handsome forehand at the front but he's not quite quick enough to capitalize on it. 4-1. Ball was still in the air very close to a stroke maybe it was a stroke. to see again Hansen flowing around the court really seeming fully in possession of his balance and poise pretty comfortable with what's going on measured weighted length there out yeah he's he's finally moving Douglas into these uncomfortable situations and squeezing the errors Five because one. of the lack of, of quality from Douglas. Yeah, I feel as though when Douglas has to really stretch, mm -hmm. his balance is a little bit suspect, both deep on the forehand and short on the backhand. And we've seen a couple of errors in those situations and losses of balance. Wow, that's a really good shot. And now into the front of the court. 2-5. So I think if Douglas is going to come back into this, he really has to improve the quality of his width and length so that he can get some loose ball from Hansen. Unless he really gets Hansen under pressure with the tight ball, he's going to find it difficult to move Chris enough to hurt him. Yes, let. 2-5 left. It's a nicely faded ball. First time I've seen Hansen open up on the backhand and catch the sidewall. Very well played. Oh, Very there's well the, played. the well calculated that you were talking about, and Richard. Out. It's perfectly weighted. And then he brings the ball into the front of the court really well. It's tight, it's good quality. I feel as though Hansen is beginning to Down. feel quite comfortable in this game and uh, sort of and playing three, six. on uh, sort of 85%, 90% rather than at the very edge mm -hmm. of his capacity. And that's very dangerous for Douglas, knowing that Hansen is playing within himself. But we know momentum shifts happen all the time in this sport. So uh, what can Douglas do now to regain 
control of this match. Oh, I'd like to see him give Hansen a little taste of his own man two. medicine Hansen. by varying the pace more, throwing in a few of and those lobs, floating, seven, and floating the ball into the back of the court. Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. I think. Force Hansen to go short, yep, right? Yep. And the, the change up has worked for Hansen, and I suspect it would work quite well for Douglas mm -hmm. if he could start using the lob as part of his attacking weaponry. It's a little bit a nice fortunate. Shot. He's off balance here. You can see I said earlier he has trouble when he's and stretching to that forehand side. Four but seven. He managed to get the ball up. And out. Beautiful return by Hansen. A little bit of loss of concentration there by Douglas. You saw he separated from the ball Eight for four. a moment, resting on the tee. Let so many people make that mistake. Beautiful wit. Nice rolling rhythm rally again. Use of the lob, as we said. Yeah. And it got him out of trouble and gave him an opportunity. Ooh. That was a glorious <laughs> cross court, Nick. <laughs> Slotted. Well, we saw the good use of height from Douglas, Nine, but he four. didn't do anything with the ball after that, right? He didn't follow it up. And I feel as though that height was defensive instead of offensive. You, we've seen, of course, we've seen, of course, Chris Hansen using the lob and the float offensively to strategically create scenarios, not just defensively to get out of scenarios. Beautiful shots. There's a rapid attack, rare, but very effective. Now I feel as though these boys are beginning to run on fumes a little bit here, Sean. Oh. <laughs> yes, let. Who's tight? Oh, Ooh. is that going to be a stroke or is though. that going to be a, it's a let? Yes, let. Yes, sir. I feel as though some of the earlier work, Chanel, is beginning to really we have a quick clean. bring dividends. Well, it's hard work on a squash court, Richard, and it's uh, these young men have had to work really hard in this match, and we're only in the third game. They've had extended rallies, and it, it's interesting to see how we were transitioning from the earlier match with Todd Harrity and Chris Gordon where you were saying what needs to happen is it needs to be 30 50 shot Thank rallies you, and it wasn't right now we're Left seeing side. that being presented here in this Nine match four. between these two players Do it, guys. Do it. so it was a little momentum shift um, earlier and I wonder if that little break will provide a change here it's good height. Mm -hmm. And it's straight. That's what you were. Yeah, yeah cross court under side. pressure, I'm not a big fan of. And the ability to float the ball tight and straight under pressure, so useful. So, battle being rejoined, but a loose ball from Hansen giving a very easy opportunity here to Five Douglas. Nine. A very rare loose ball there from Hansen. Yes, let. Now there's an example of what Bit I said at the beginning of the match. Yep. Andrew Douglas used Five to be nine. very guilty of. He, he would hit and stand, and that can cause real traffic problems. There's the defensive height, but there from 
Hansen was the offensive man. Very quick by Very Douglas. Nice. Beautiful in there. It's not easy to do that when you know the person's right on your right back. Six, nine. Yep, breathing down your neck. And you saw that his foot was on the floor before contact was made with the ball, so there was stability and weight transference. The mistake a lot of players make is they hit the ball before the foot hits the floor, and they lose the balance. Well, it's a great attacking nice, cross-court yeah. attempt. Really well defended by Douglas who's kind of back in here at 7-9 well we're seeing that variation seven that we nine. were talking about earlier Richard and it's just do something different right if your original plan is not working like great baseball pitchers <laughs> they use a change up they use a curveball keep the man guessing yes, well and i know the hardest the thing to do in squash is to make that adjustment him. in the game a lot of players wait until the game's over because they can't quite figure it out and then they rely on their coach to tell them that by that time so it's too late sometimes it's a little nervy no stuff bad. here Chris Hansen not getting the tightness yeah, that he was getting before. And really. I think he's feeling yeah. the pressure from okay. Andrew Douglas making this little comeback charge. Eight, nine. Oh, big moment now for Andrew Douglas. It's a big point right here. Oh. And then oh. that's not what top pros do. 10 8, at that game ball. In the game. Very surprised that he went for that forcing shot at that point in time. The momentum was all with Douglas at that moment. He needed to really play the rally out to its natural conclusion. Oh, it's trouble. Great cat. Fantastic, fantastic oh. court coverage. Down. We said earlier about Chris Hansen's court coverage. Game what an Hansen. amazing example of his Hansen athleticism. Two games to one. Well, the crowd's behind him, that's for sure. A huge moment there for him. Andrew Douglas was fighting his way back into that, that game, and it did not seem that he was going to take charge at all in the third because it was all Chris Hansen. It was, but at that moment, that he had two comeback points in a row, and he seemed to be in charge, and then he hit in the second shot of the rally, the top of the tin. In fact, I think he was below the top of the tin. That was a lost opportunity, I think, Chanel. You know, the momentum shift was there. Chris Hansen had played a couple of loose-ish balls. Uh, I, I think uh, when Andrew Douglas looks back on that, he will really regret hitting mm -hmm. that forced tin. Well, absolute credit to both these players. At the moment, Andrew Douglas not dropping his standard at all, and Christopher Hansen having to work really hard to come out 2 1 and lead in this really crucial match for a place in the final tomorrow. So, handling that pressure and maintaining the quality when you know your opponent is not going to drop it. So, yes, those last couple of points certainly did not give him, Douglas, the rewards that he was hoping for. You know, it seems hard for me, having known Chris Hansen for such a long time, uh, to call him a seasoned pro, <laughs> but he really is a seasoned yeah. pro. And the lessons learned years ago on court as a little boy with Rod Martin, the many, many tournaments played, the, the um, successes and failures, the, the heartbreak of the car accident and the comeback and the joy of winning two national championships and more recently his PSA wins this is all what goes into the makeup of this incredibly tough tenacious professional that we're seeing here tonight absolutely well he currently leads two games to one it's an interesting matchup between these two players so I do feel Hansen like you can't leads. count Andrew Douglas two games out to yet one. we've seen the quality that he's able pr to Hansen produce to serve. yeah if his only chance, I would say, at this point in time, is if Chris Hansen um, sees the winning post too early and tries to, you know, foreshorten the match. If he sticks to the rolling rhythm game plan that he's been using, I feel it's too much momentum against Andrew Douglas. 
That's going to need to be that really positive start from Chris Hansen. And Douglas is going to need to cut that off immediately if he hopes to take this to five. And the then that variation I, of pace, right. right? The only thing I wouldn't want to see Hansen do if he's going to win it is just go back into a banging rhythm because Douglas was so good at feeding off of that banging rhythm. It was that rolling variation which made no let. Hansen so good. I know you're making every effort. The ball was much deeper than where you were going. I don't Douglas, think that's going to be a lot. No, and I think well, thought it was a beautifully executed shot by Douglas. He really does One all. poise himself so well to hit that forehand drop volley. Out. So out there's another one. unforced error from Douglas immediately hitting the ball out. So that's uh, a little mental weakness, mental error there. Very surprising. Down. Well, he's... 3-1. He's forcing it short. He feels the need to hit a perfectly executed shot on the front wall. And it's because of the pressure that he's being put under by Hansen. And, and of course, it's also, as you rightly say, the pressure, but also those earlier really tough extended rallies. He really doesn't want any more of those. And so one. he's trying to foreshorten the yeah, rally artificially. Well, so here's safety Rich Wade first. again. Safety first, just cleaning up the court. Don't want players slipping around and falling. So I feel, Chanel, as though that 4-1 lead is a little bit um, of a lie. Four only one. insofar as Chris Hansen didn't earn it. He, mm -hmm. It was given to him in large part. Stroke two. Five one. And that's another one given away. And out. It's quite a surprising lost loss five. of balance there. Yeah. Maybe unsighted, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think he lost sight of the ball. Didn't yeah. quite know where it went. There's a poor length there. You can see how beautifully Chris Hansen strikes the ball in the sweet spot by his racket strings starting to feather right in the middle of the racket. Down. And again, I'm and afraid out. Andrew Douglas guilty of trying to six force two. the issue instead of building the issue. And now we have a 6-2 lead for Chris Hansen, 2-1 up. pop out there from Andrew Douglas whose body language there is pretty disenchanted disheartened tough tough spot for Andrew Douglas here yes let feel as though Chris Seven Hansen maybe should have played side. that ball. I think he was expecting it to come out more towards Douglas than it yeah, originally yeah, had, yeah. which is the only reason why I think you played the, the let. He does play that and forehand, either drop volley or drop shot extremely well. You Three see the seven. space he takes for mm -hmm. himself to get the angle. It's really a great demonstration of that art. Oh, lovely That's little tricky. death. <laughs> Almost a badminton <laughs> shot there. See that little wrist drop, but with control using his fingers. Hansen can just 
just a little cheap there, trying to get a sneaky, quick victory. First time I'd seen Chris Hansen trying to play a shot that he hadn't earned the no, opening he, for. He can hit the ball there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, also a little bit of encouragement, I think, for Andrew Five Douglas seven. at this point. He's pretty good at the comeback. Likes to be in those situations. Sometimes he's gone himself too far behind. And now Chris Hansen playing the short ball a little too early. Sort of departed from his rolling rhythm building of rallies. Oh, it's trouble, oh, it's he trouble. He could, Here we he go. Again, he's taking he Douglas on in that ball. front forehand corner. Way. And Douglas yeah. owns that corner in this match. 6 7. So here we are, suddenly Andrew Douglas back in the match. Oh, oh dear, gosh, watch it in. Douglas standing upright, not really poised, ready to defend. Eight, six. Just that mental lapse for a moment was enough to leave a hole. Great change in direction by Look Douglas. The stability Seven, of the left wow. leg on the floor allowed him to make that sudden violent wrist change. Very, very good flick. So he's not going out with a whimper. And another great attacking shot here. No. Nine seven. He's <laughs> managed to get himself now three match balls here, Chris Hansen, taking the Ten ball seven, early. Match ball. Exciting That's times for the Hansen family there in the crowd you saw on the right hand side. the rolling rhythm rally that's done so much good for him in this match. Yes, let. 10-7, left side, match ball. That one is a let, at least. Oh, Andrew Douglas still alive in this fourth game. Beautiful little change up there from Andrew Douglas. I feel as though if Chris Hansen keeps it away from the forehand short openings, and he has every chance of winning and this. But there's a lovely wit and from Andrew Douglas. Match ball. So everything's still to play for here at 8-10. Suddenly, at match ball down, Andrew Douglas is bringing a game plan to the four. Quite an effective oh. one. Oh. Uh, no. Wow. Extraordinary, unexpected cross court. Oh, great moment. Well, we're handing it over to Bill Buckingham 
We'll hold an interview with Christopher Hansen after his victory here against Andrew Douglas. And your winner, advancing to his third straight final, Christopher Hansen. Third straight year you played Andrew. Third straight four game match. You guys are starting quite a rivalry here. Oh man, I, he's usually the giant killer at home, and he usually does it in the semis. So he brought everything tonight, and Jesus, he shocked me in the first game. Um, I think everybody was wondering if I was still asleep. Um, but he just played outrageous, and I knew I would have to just stick in um, and do what I do best, which is uh, grind it out, um, which I was happy to do. Let's look forward to tomorrow night. You're a two-time defending champion. You've never played Todd Harrity in one of these championship runs. He's a two-time champion. Talk about tomorrow night's match and what it would mean for you to win your third straight national title. I mean, it would mean, it would be pretty much everything in my career at the moment to win that title, uh, especially against Todd. But well, we've been going at it since we were about six years old. And I mean, tomorrow is just a classic example of two two great friends who are just going to battle it out um, and leave everything out there. So I'm just I'm just happy. I'm happy to be there. Well, congratulations. I know we're all looking forward to tomorrow night's final. <laughs> Tremendous match. You showed why you are a two-time champion. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Hansen. Hansen, who played excellent squash in the, the second half of this match, really changed the pace, took control of the middle of the court, dominated the back and the front. Yet yeah, neither of us would have been surprised after the first game if we'd seen more of the same if Andrew Douglas had taken this because he seemed to be fully in charge. But as we saw, Chris Hansen then changed up the pace, and after the first game, we said. If Chris could use the floated ball and the height, which he's very adept at doing, he could create enough time to take charge of the rhythm of the rally. And by God, did we see him do that. Absolutely. Great display of squash. We have to give credit to Andrew Douglas, who did not drop his quality of play in the second, third, or fourth game. It was Chris Hansen that upped the level of play. And I feel as though that when Chris produced that beautiful rolling rhythm, varying, you know, weighted firm shots with floated balls and changes of direction and extended the rallies, and I think we had a couple of rallies there, maybe close to 60 or 70 shots, that that was enough to just take the edge off Andrew Douglas's shot making. And in the latter stages of the match, we saw him making some uncharacteristic errors, maybe because the tank was a little empty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, it's been quality throughout the day, starting with our Masters and then heading into the professional draw here on the glass court number one at Squash on Fire. Richard, this concludes now the semi-finals of the pro event. We'll head on into the finals tomorrow between Olivia Blatchford Klein at 5.45 p.m. She plays against Sabrina Sobey and then following that, it's Todd Harrity against Chris Hansen. So we'll see you back tomorrow. Great stuff.